Recording in All right, Steve, I think we're ready to start. Go ahead, Marty. Well, I seem to have lost it now. Hold on. There we are. Okay. Thank you. All right. Good morning, everyone, and welcome uh, back to the continuation of our hearings on EP 711 sub one. Uh, I'm just going to, for the sake of folks who may not have been on yesterday, uh, just repeat the uh, sort of initial instructions and we will get started. Uh, everyone, please silence your cell phones, turn off your cameras and mute yourselves in Zoom. When your panel is up, please turn your camera on and keep it on for the duration of the panel. When you're presenting, a timer will appear counting down your allotted time. When that timer reaches zero, your time will have expired and we ask you to conclude your remarks. If the board members have questions while you're presenting, be aware they may ask those questions before your presentation is over. Panelists, you have access to the chat function in Zoom, but please only use this for technical questions. If you become disconnected from the hearing, and are not able to reconnect on Zoom, there's a phone number you may use to call in included in the hearing information you were provided. If you do need to call in via phone, please email us at hearings at stb.gov with the phone number you're calling from so we can identify you and let you speak when it's your turn. You can also refer to the frequently asked questions on the board's website for any further, further troubleshooting or contact information. The hearing is also being streamed on YouTube and the link is available on the board's website. The transcript of the entire hearing will be placed on the board's website after the close of the hearing and a recording will be available as well. For the benefit of our court reporters, please speak clearly into your microphone and minimize background noise. They are welcome to interject if they can't hear. As noted in the decisions we issued two weeks ago, uh, we will hear from panels uh, four through the end of the speakers list today. Uh, we will uh, take a 30 minute break for lunch. We aim to do that around uh, 1230 Eastern, but uh, will not necessarily be exactly at that time. And uh, of course, there will be time for several short breaks during the day. Uh, with that, uh, we will turn to our first panel for uh, today's session, panel four. I'm going to read off uh, everyone and then um, let's make sure everybody's here. Uh, the Private Rail Car Food and Beverage Association, Herman Hackstein, and one of my esteemed predecessors, Daniel Elliott. Uh, U.S. Wheat Associates, Dalton Henry. Glass Packaging Institute, Scott DeFife. The Industrial Minerals Association, Chris Greising. And the Institute of Scrap Re Recycling Industries, Bobby Treesh and Karen Booth. So um, are they all, uh, everybody here? Yes, sir. Yes, okay. good morning. Yes, sir. All righty, very good. Herman, you're up. Well, actually, Dan's up. Okay. <laughs> well, here's some Dan. Thank you. Oh, there you are, <laughs> good morning. Good morning. Nice to be here. Uh, may it please the board. Uh, my name is Daniel Elliott and uh, I'm here testifying on behalf of the Private Rail Car Food and Beverage Association, also known as PERFPA. Uh, you've already addressed the elephant in the room that I am Dan Elliott, the prior chairman of the STB. I have not spoken at a hearing since I left the agency, but thought this proceeding was so important that I wanted to testify here today. I am accompanied by 
uh, as you just mentioned, Herman Haxtein, who is the president of PERPA and who also has a vast amount of experience in rail logistics. PERPA thanks the board, first of all, for holding this pivotal hearing on such an important subject to its member companies. Its member companies have never brought a reciprocal switching case to the board because the present standard to obtain this relief is unachievable. They all believe the time has come to make this relief available through these proposed rules. PERPA is comprised of 18 global food and beverage companies and manufacturers headquartered in North America. These members include PepsiCo, Molson Coors, Kraft Heinz, General Mills, McCain Foods, Cisco, Bondwell America, Boardman Foods, G3 Enterprises, J.D. Irving Cavendish Farms, the Martin Brower Corporation, Univar Solutions, Derigold, Kellogg, Land O'Lakes, National Sugar, and Loprino Foods. They are all major rail shippers that rely on the railroads to produce and distribute their food and beverage products that are vital to the health and welfare of our nation. Without adequate rail service, their food and beverages will not be on store shelves in the US. Because this, is so, this issue is so important to PERFA, uh, these member companies are all here with me today, virtually listening to our testimony to show their support for these proposed rules. The board has asked for additional views on the need for the proposed regulations in the light of the significant operational changes in and affecting the freight rail industry in the time since the issuance of the NPRM herein. PERFA strongly believes the operational changes to the freight rail industry in the form of precision schedule railroading, essentially across the entire US rail network over the last five years makes the need for the proposed regu regulations more compelling now than ever. This rail operating model has resulted in massive job cuts across the US rail system, eliminating large parts of the railroad's institutional knowledge and experience needed to run one of these complex networks. They also left the railroads woefully unprepared for upticks in traffic and other changes to the market. These PSR changes and the resulting service problems have caused concern by the board, as has been expressed in numerous letters to the railroads and informal proceedings since the NPRM. PERFPA does not want to rehash what the board already knows, but would like to share several personal examples of how PSR has recently impacted its member companies and how these new reciprocal switching rules could have helped. For example, Kraft Heinz has a facility in North Florida that is single served by a class one railroad. The railroad was unable to serve this facility adequately, causing it to shut down production on at least one occasion for an entire week. To add insult to injury, the rail car that could have kept this plant operating sat, sat idle for a full week in eyesight of the Kraft Heinz facility. Despite numerous pleas to the railroad, nothing was done to remedy the situation despite these dire consequences. If reciprocal switching had been a possibility, it likely would have been able to prevent, to prevent the Kraft Heinz plant from being shut down by using another nearby class one railroad. Moreover, Molson Coors has recently been given a proposal by its class one railroad to increase one of its rates by 8%. This increase would have re resulted in an RVC ratio of 640% for this captive location. When asked what the reason for the rate increase was, this railroad told Molson Coors that it was because a competing railroad had won Molson Coors rail business for certain unrelated competitive traffic in a bidding contest with this railroad. This tactic is obviously unreasonable and has no basis in the actual cost of doing business for the railroad. If these proposed rules were in place, Molson Coors might be able to defend itself from these unfair tactics. Another PERFA member has a plant in Ohio that is served by a class one railroad and another plant in Georgia served by another class one railroad. 100% of their rail service is inbound ingredients amounting to approximately 2,700 cars per year in total. The plants have capacity for eight to nine and 16 rail cars respectively. The plants operate 24 seven. Missed and erratic switches at these plants have become more prevalent in comparison to the public switch schedule at the plants. The railroads have stated that this poor performance has occurred because of crew shortages. This unreliable switching service has led to production interruptions at both plants. 
This company calculates that it loses at least $200,000 per day conservatively at each plant when it cannot operate due to the railroad's failure, failures to deliver its rail cars. To resolve these problems, this company has demanded that the railroads meet with it on a weekly or monthly basis. Service usually improves for a short time before reverting to a state where this company is not getting the cars it requested on scheduled switch days. This company believes that PSR has created this problem because of all the railroads layoffs resulting in these crew shortages. As is evident from these various examples, PSR has resulted in poor service and unfair rate, crease, rate increases by PSR railroads. The use of reciprocal switching through the proposed rules could help to avoid these unnecessary plant shutdowns and unreasonable pricing tactics by introducing competition. Competition inherently creates the incentive for an incumbent railroad to provide better service than the competing railroad. It also checks the railroad from behaving in such an unreasonable manner when negotiating rates. PURPA also has serious concerns about the further consolidation of the rail industry from seven class one railroads to six, which is a possibility over the next year. This additional co consolidation will only make the situation worse by lessening overall competition in this already overly consolidated industry. While PSR and further consolidation of the rail industry demonstrate there is even more need for reciprocal switching now than in 2016, there's another reason why reciprocal switching should be encouraged by all involved. That is the opportunity for growth of the rail industry. Reciprocal switching can provide some rail shippers with the better service and competitive rates they may require to move their transportation business from truck to rail. The rail industry has lost large amounts of revenue because of the decrease in the use of coal. The increased use of reciprocal switching will be able to bring back some of that revenue through new car load traffic. I will now turn uh, the mic over to PERPA President Herman Hagstein, who has a few remarks that he would like to make regarding this matter before I conclude. Thanks, Dan. Thanks to the board. Uh, uh, Mr. Overman, nice to see you again. Uh, Mr. Fuchs, I've seen you a few times. Uh, apologize to the new board members. I haven't had a chance, uh, thanks to COVID and all the regulations, to get down there and spend a little time face to face and getting to know you. Um, I just wanted to take a little bit of a different approach today. And, and um, I wanted to talk, well, first of all, I want to talk a little bit about the hearing last week, subcommittee. Uh, some folks kind of hijacked that meeting and turned it into a reciprocal switch uh, hearing. And uh, I just wanted to make sure, I hope that uh, the important part of that hearing got done. Uh, that was our support, the shippers community support for the STB and, and to uh, hope that you'll be around and in a healthy state funded well to uh, continue to do your good work and speaking on behalf of the shippers community with the railroads. So um, I also, uh, today obviously is the day for reciprocal switching and um, <laughs> we thank the board very much for moving forward on this subject. It's only been kicking around for 11 years. So uh, maybe it's time to, uh, to get it across the finish line. Um, um, we all know that the Staggers Act um, asked the STB to ensure financial health of the railroad and to manage a competitive environment. Apparently, however, the Staggers Act fell a little short. Perhaps it should have defined what competition was because my friends at the AR and some of the railroads just don't quite understand the concept, I don't think. So, so uh, last week, um, I believe it was the AAR made a reference between uh, Coke bottling at a Pepsi plant. And uh, last night, one of the railroads suggested that uh, Burger King was going to start cooking on McDonald's grills. Um, I think that might be a little dramatic, but um, you know, I appreciate that they're sort of looking at um, what competition might actually look like. You know, uh, it's difficult to compare railroading today with say Pepsi and Coke. We go to a grocery store, we pull out our left hand, we can get a Pepsi, our right hand, we can get a Coke. Same product, same look, similar price. Um, but the difference is, is that Pepsi and Coke are there to earn our business and they're not, we are not as a consumer legislated uh, as to what choice we might wanna make. So we're not suggesting that the railroads need to go that far, but we are certainly suggesting that the railroads need to understand that that's what competition looks like. So let's talk about customers. 
Um, so the AAR last night in their testimony and uh, at last week's hearing, um, they listed all of the people that were opposed to reciprocal switching. Interesting enough, uh, and I listened to the tape a couple of times, there's no shipper groups there. There's no shippers. So, and again, apparently they don't grasp the concept. Uh, it's the people that provide revenue. Those are the people that you need to reach out and work with. So all of those people that are opposing reciprocal switching don't provide the railroad with revenue. So um, <laughs> it's difficult to understand why we should put too much weight in all of the opposition that they've provided, considering it's not from the actual users. So I think um, I'm just gonna I, I'm run low on time and I wanna make sure that I can hand the mic back to Dan. So I just wanna go back to simple facts. You guys are getting bombarded with all kinds of testimony. Last night's AAR presented more reports. My head was spinning by the time that, that presentation was over and I appreciate all the hard work they did. Bottom line, as Mr. Elliott referred to, and as many other folks have referred to, railroad volume is down. It's hemorrhaging. And if you compare 2017, and I picked 2017 versus 2021, because that was the start of PSR, carloads are down 11% and uh, total volume, total tonnage is down 5%. Fact, all other modes of transport are up. We hear about it every day. There's not enough capacity in our supply chains Trucks up, uh, I mean, air freight's up double digits, but the railroad car loads are down double digits. There has to be a logic behind that, but I'll let the, the <laughs> I'll let others make that conclusion. Um, customers are, are, are stating in a recent survey, a Morgan Stanley survey, that they're moving rail volume to trucks. So um, if we take the numbers, uh, that are presented by the American Trucking Association and the AAR, it would suggest that there's about four and a half million truckloads a year additionally between 2017 and 2021 because of the amount of business that's left rail and gone to truck. And just to put that in perspective again, that's 12,000 truckloads a day. More trucks on the highway, more congestion, more wear and tear in the infrastructure, more greenhouse gases, more inflation, for the point of the railroads making more money. Last night, um, the AAR presented a study, and many of them, and I do appreciate Mr. Overman, you caught onto this very quickly, but I, I think the thought, it kind of shot over their head. Um, the single served uh, rail facilities, uh, their volume was actually down, and that was the AAR saying, see competition and mergers haven't hurt at all. Wake up. The volume's gone because the customer left you. Single serve captive shippers, their study even said that their dual serve locations were up and their single serve locations were down. Customers are making a choice. Anyway, um, I, I just, I want to conclude by saying railroad volumes are down. We need railroad volumes to be up. Our supply chains need to be diverse, not less diverse. We need the choice of rail and we need it to be healthy. So I'm asking the STB today, please, please help save our railroad network. We really need it. Provide guidance and good rulemaking to help the railroads understand. And to the railroad industry, I'll just simply say, stop looking for ways to force customers to do railroad business with you. Invest in your infrastructure, invest in your people, invest in your processes and earn our customers' business because that's how competition really works. I'll hand it back to Dan. I'd just like to make one last point before I conclude. Representative Tom Malinowski asked the AIR in the recent rail subcommittee hearing regarding the STB last week about the large employment cuts by the railroads prior to the pandemic. The AIR responded that railroads are hiring across all crafts over the last 12 months while admitting employee numbers were down going into the pandemic. I looked at the most recent STB Form C numbers for, for CSX, NS, and Union Pacific, the three most recent large railroads to convert to PSR. CSX numbers for train and engine service went from 6,795 in December of 2021 to 6,739 in January 2022, and from 7,250 
to 7,158 total employees during this same time period. NS went from 7,521 to 7,372 train and engine service employees, and from 18,011 to 17,572 total employees during this period. UP went from 14,079 to 13,460 train and engine service employees, and from 32,000 494 to 31,800 total employees during this time frame. In other words, from December to January of this year, all of them went down in those crucial numbers. These numbers do not demonstrate an industry that is concerned about hiring and making sure it is properly staffed to provide adequate service to its customers. It does demonstrate that the railroads are not taking seriously the concerns it has heard from the STB shippers and labor about their massive job cuts and their impact on service and safety. In other words, without more competition in the rail industry, it does not appear that railroads will change their ways as these numbers demonstrate. The only thing that will change their ways is the market. In conclusion, the need for these proposed rules has only become more necessary over the past five years. PSR has left rail shippers with poorer service and higher rates which can only be remedied by competition. The introduction of more competition into the, into the rail industry was one of the main purposes of staggers. However, competition has only decreased since that time. Now is the time to bring this purpose to, to fruition, for rail shippers will continue to endure poor service and higher rates as these stories from PERFPA member companies demonstrate so clearly. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you both. Uh, Dan, uh, I think I should say at the outset that I might want to bring you in as a consultant expert on the issue of the railroads not taking the board seriously enough. <laughs> I think we share some of that history now. Uh, but no, I do think, um, you know, when you were chairman, and I think uh, as we move ahead, uh, they will take us seriously if we act uh, efficiently and responsibly, and I think we have been and will continue to do so. I, I have a quest, couple of questions, uh, Herman. You were reciting the move from uh, rail to truck and you had some statistics. I'm not sure if you said, or if you did, I didn't catch it, where you those numbers came from. Um, yes, there, there was a uh, Morgan Stanley report that was published uh, in January. Uh, see if I can find the exact uh, reference for you, sir. Well, you don't have to do it now. I, we we you. Yeah, it, we can get that to you. I'd, I'd like to see that because I think I, I missed it. And there's little doubt in my mind that uh, from what I, we can observe anecdotally and from some reports I've seen, that traffic is moving to truck. Uh, the railroads themselves tell us, but I'd like any uh, data on that would be helpful. So. Uh, the, the specific data was, depending on which quarter you looked at last year, it was between 30 to 40 percent of shippers surveyed were moving some or a significant portion of their freight. Yeah. All right. Yeah. If you would send us that report. That I will get great. that. Thank you, sir. The other question I had, Herman, are there any of your members or your own company that you know of who actually have a reciprocal switching availability at any of their locations? So we, we do have. Uh, several members that are either served by a short line um, at some of their locations or they have dual service at a location. Yes, sir. Well, when you say dual service, is it through reciprocal switching? The reason I ask is that I wondered if you have any concrete experience on the issue of what's involved from the shipper's point of view when they take advantage of a reciprocal switch. We heard a lot of testimony yesterday about either how complicated or how not complicated it is in the switching yard for the, from the shipper's point of view, there was a contention that uh, it added a great deal of delay and that it wasn't good for shippers. <clears throat> and I just wondered if you have any concrete experience, there are other shippers coming on today that I could ask this question of uh, who could enlighten us on the way they see it when they actually use it. And, how well or how not well it's working. 
Yeah, I didn't. I thank you for the question. I, we didn't come prepared today to talk about any kind, but we'll dig into it and talk to some of our members and see if there's some. Uh, I'd like to give you actual facts rather than make up some words on the on the call today. So uh, we'll, we'll get back to you on that, sir. Uh, you know, there, there's going to be an opportunity for ex parte meetings, not that we need more, <laughs> but I think that this would be enlightening from people. You know, I put a lot more weight on people who are actually out there doing this work. And, you know, the question was raised, I think it was by UP, that if you are a shipper who has a reciprocal switch, it adds between 24 and 98 hours to your travel time. And I don't know if, if that's true of a, from the shipper's point of view. And I don't know uh, how the shippers feel about it. Maybe they think it's worth the extra time because they're ultimately getting better service or maybe it doesn't take that much time. I, I, it'd be great to get some concrete um, input from people who actually live with reciprocal switching. And as I have discovered in preparing for this hearing, uh, each of at least the four major US railroads have hundreds of locations across the country where they have existing reciprocal switching tariffs. So there are many shippers who they are willing to provide reciprocal switching to. So it'd be good to know how it works. So uh, uh, just a little more homework for you, Herman. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> uh, Karen uh, Hedlund has a question. Uh, thank you, um, Mr. Hackstein and uh, former Chairman Elliott. It's very good to see you uh, today. Um, I want to go back to something uh, that Dan Elliott said that I hope is not lost. Uh, one could ask, why would a shipper want to switch to another class one railroad uh, if the first class one railroad is providing poor service and the other class one railroad is also known to be providing poor service? Uh, the service issues obviously are not um, exclusive to any one railroad. And I think what you said was that if reciprocal switching is enabled, that it will encourage uh, the railroads to compete on service. They will have an incentive to increase their service. Could you talk about that a little bit more? Yeah, that was, uh, thank you very much for the question. That was exactly my point um, that and I'm, I admit I'm not a PhD economist, but I did get to meet quite a few when I was at the STB <laughs> and they did describe the effects of competition. And one of the effects uh, obviously would be creating the competition to better serve customers. And, and I, I think if you do talk to the shippers on this panel, that when there is competition, um, generally speaking, and, and obviously there's blips uh, and service that are not necessarily controlled just by competition. There's other factors involved, but generally speaking, uh, the railroads will work harder to get your business and as a result, provide better service when they know that they don't have you captive and there's really nothing, no one to answer to in the end. Thank you. And I wanna thank you for the specific examples. I think the board needs to hear more of that. <laughs> Uh, Patrick. It's a, a, a great segue. Um, Herman, in your experience, um, thinking about PERFPA members, um, uh, are facilities that are dual served or potentially served by short line that connects to multiple railroads, do those facilities get markedly better service than those that are single served? That's a loaded question, sir. So um, I, would, I would like to be absolutely 100% clear, unlike some of the other folks that come before you and say, in my opinion, mm -hmm. that is correct. I believe that uh, rates are better, uh, certainly origin, if it's an origin serve, dual serve facility, then origin service is better. Um, so yes, sir, my, my opinion, I do not have any facts to support that from a backup perspective today, sir. Well, I, that's sort of what I wanna move towards is, if the board were to want to substantiate, and I, in your opinion, I hear from shippers a lot, you know, it, it, um, that the, the dynamic that, that you're describing. But if we want to move to 
acquire facts, how would you recommend that we verify that service is better for dual serve or single serve? And I, I think I think about it uh, in particular about what it means for a shipper to come in here and say, hey, listen, if I had dual service, I would actually, you know, my service problems that are identified here would improve. So how, how what, what facts do you think we should be collecting to substantiate that point? So, so thank you for this segue, sir, because I, I'm not sure if you're setting me up, but uh, thank you very much if you did. First mile, last mile data, sir. I would say that if we could collect first mile and last mile data, and as you know, we've talked to the board about this before, um, we could compare first and last mile data on dual serve locations versus single serve locations. It would be data, it would be in your system, it would be readily available. Um, I, I think today, you, I would suggest you could pick up the phone and call some of our members who have, uh, I know a couple off the top of my head that have dual serve locations as well as single serve locations. Um, but I'm not sure how many of them record accurately, you know, um, on time switches at one. I, we have a couple of members who, who go through quite an effort to record first mile, last mile data for their own. But, but I, you know, I hate to say it, but not a lot of them do because when they sit down with the railroads and say, you're 22% on time, the railroads say, yeah, okay. Like, the, well, like there's, there's no effort, there's no reason to do it. Well, it's interesting because, you know, we were talking a lot about yesterday about the practical realities of what, what it means for a shipper to mount the evidence that, you know, some people are saying uh, is necessary. Imagine a world in which, you know, the railroads, you know, they're already collecting some form of first last mile data, but they collected it and they provided it to the shipper. So the shipper had all the first last mile data at their disposal for each of their facilities, dual served and single serve. And that data was available if someone needed to mount a case to show differences in service. Right. Type of framework in your view would start to cut down on the burden of having to show that the railroad is differentially serving people in different circumstances. Absolutely, sir. All right. And uh, one, one last question, and I, I think this might call for your opinion again, but um, when you see service failures, the real, you know, I, uh, let's call them uh, broader service failures that, that when, when the railroad network is, is quite challenged, do, do you notice railroads getting out of the jam differently between single serve and competitive facilities? So a little bit of a different question, very similar, but I'm talking about particularly the times of great challenge, or is it more the steady state? There's always a difference. But when the network's really jammed up, everybody kind of suffers, you know, so is, is there a difference between the steady state differential and then the crisis differential? Or is it or, or are the differences kind of constant no matter what's going on more broadly? I think in 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 my opinion, and thanks for introducing it that way, I think that customers at dual serve facilities are always responded to quicker. And I think um, I, I think they're cared for differently. I think their rates show that. I think their service shows that. I think the, the um, uh, again, though, without having the data to back it up, um, it, it's difficult um, to say. So, but I do want to clarify, you know, a lot of people talk about service and service failures. I, I, I want to go the extra step, though, and talk about service levels, right? We don't talk about that very much, but a lot of our customers have received reduced service levels where they're single serve. By that, I mean, they used to have five days a week switches or six days a week switches. And because of reduced labor um, that, that they're supposedly trying so hard to replace, but they're proud to Wall Street that they haven't, um, uh, that reduced labor force has not allowed them to give that customer five days a week anymore, six days a week. And they've, they've just arbitrarily cut it back to two or three. Well, so what I'm hearing from you, Herman, is that if the board were to start looking at first last mile service indicator of inadequate service, um, we we would be advised not only to look at let's call it switching success percentage, but also switch frequency. Yes, sir. Adjusted for adjusted for business levels, for example, or demand. Right. You well, know, I, what I would I'll go one frequency. step further, Patrick, and say if they used to have a Tuesday and a Thursday switch, and they and they pull that, they get a zero for that day. Because if, if they did it against the customer's desire, like if the customer had the volume and they had the freight 
and the customer therefore had to push volume onto truck, right? They needed that extra switch. Then those days become zero percent on time. Well, that, that that's one way to to think about it. Another way to think about it is again, if you're trying to if you're if you're thinking that the basis for ordering a switch is you know somebody in a worse competitive situation getting treated worse, right? Um, because they're you know trying to trying to tease out the uh, uh, it, it's because they're not in as good a competitive situation. You might also take a look at, well, hey, when the railroad reduced switches, they seem to reduce the switches for people that weren't as competitively served than not. That's another way of approaching the issue from what you are, as opposed to marking it as a zero, because there are, you know, there are legitimate reasons why a railroad would decrease its switch, right? You know, uh, you know, but business volumes could change, operating plan. If you saw a railroad decreasing switches for competitive traffic too, it could be network organization, right? It could be. There's a number of there's a number of legitimate business reasons why that could happen. There might be a there might be a, a way though to capture that idea about switch frequency being differentially applied, you know, based on your. And I, I'm just trying to get at something we hear over and over again, which is single serve customers are treated worse from a service perspective. And I'm trying to move it into the realm of how the board can practically capture that. So I, I, your, your remarks are very valuable. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Nice to see you again. Uh, I have another question, but I wanna see if other, if any other board members have questions. Um, I do. Um, and it Mark, it really, um, just kind of drills down a little bit further in the question that you had asked uh, based upon what we heard from from UP yesterday, which is that switching, you know, could potentially add uh, up up to ninety eight hours of of delay, and so I guess I guess as I would request this follow up information um, fr from your members um, at some point as to you know whether or not uh, in locations where they might currently have the opportunity to switch. Is, is delay actually occurring? And if so, to what extent? Um, and likewise, I guess what I would also like to know is, is if that delay is in fact occurring, how does the pricing structure of, of the shipping rates on rail compare to truck? And what is the, what is the true cost of that delay? I, I guess stated differently would be at what point does the delay so, so frustrate the shipment that your shippers, in fact, then choose to ship ship their goods by truck. And I certainly, of course, don't expect for you to answer that at this time. But I think for me that that information would be incredibly helpful and appreciate both of your test testimony today. Thank you. I, I, I do want to add one other piece, though, to that. Sure. So our members might be different. Than, than some of the other shippers you pull. So the difference between the PERFBA, private rail car food, you can't be a member in our organization unless you own your own assets. So if the, all of our members have assets, if their transit time was actually increasing by 96 hours, they would have to seriously consider the cost of their equipment and a fully loaded refrigerated car is about 150 bucks a day. If you have 100 or 200 or 300 of these in your fleet and you're going to get a delay of 96 hours, that's a significant financial burden. So I would suspect that our PERFA members would not make that decision. Just like our PERFA members find a lot of difficulty in switching to truck because they've now invested millions and millions of dollars in these huge lease fleets. It's pretty difficult to go up to the C-level office and say, oh, by the way, I've parked that $12 million where the rail car was bought last year, right? We it's a very, very difficult thing to do. So, so again, because our members have put skin in the game, uh, their decisions are a little bit more, have to be a little bit more, uh, I'll use the AR's word, favorite word, forced, but, um, you know, the, their their hands have been kind of played because they've supported the rest. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Her Herman, let me just follow up on that. Uh, from the shipper's point of view, <clears throat> is the concern about service difficulties as much unpredictability and inconsistency as it is total time of transit? I mean, um, which is more important? It, it, it's absolutely hands down um, uh, uh, consistency, reliability. I mean, that slower transit isn't great because it costs more in inventory and it costs more in your cars. But cost is one factor. Right. The other factor is filling the pipeline. All, all of our 
um, all of our shippers are measured by their major customers. For instance, uh, Walmart has a scorecard. And if you fall below, say, 95%, you know, in delivering, Walmart starts to fine you, right? So, so these guys have to know when their shipments are coming in. They have to have the staff there to unload those cars and get, get that product over to their customers in a timely manner. Otherwise, it's going to hurt that customer relationship. Or in some cases, it's going to cost them financial because they get fined. So, so on-time reliability, sir, hands down. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Even if we discovered that uh, if a reciprocal switch was going to cause a 24-hour delay, if the shipper knew that it was reliably a 24-hour delay, they could plan their pipeline accordingly. Absolutely, sir. Hands down. So that's not, in your particular uh, group's basis, that may still be a factor because of the uh, unusual cost of refrigerated cars, but the re if by getting a switch you've greatly improved your consistency and reliability, that trade-off might be worth it. It sounds like to the ship. Well, and it's a budgetable expense, right? I mean, we know what one car per day costs, right? So it's budgetable. You can either build that into your pricing or whatever. When when it's an unexpected um, uh, it, it, interruption in your service. You're, you're getting people to work overtime, you're, you're scrambling to find a different way to unload that truck, or you're trucking product across the country with double teams. I mean, it, it, the cost of that is, is it's not budgetable and it's unpredictable. So absolutely, sir, anything that can be budgeted and planned around is a shipper's choice. I, I guess I shouldn't have used the word delay in this context. It's just part of the schedule if it takes an extra day. Yes, sir. And, and if you know it, it's not really a delay. It's not a delay. You're right. It's a, it's it. a new service schedule. And when we track first and last mile, we would like to track it based on the railroad's published service schedule. We're, we're, not, we're not asking for it against some fictitious number. We're asking it against their published schedule. Well, you know, we are interested in the first and last mile data issue, and we are trying to grapple with it. It's complex. Uh, but your, your concerns on that issue, as well as others in the industry, have been heard, at least in, a, in terms of our being uh, intent on making a stab at coming up with the right metrics. So uh, point well taken. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Yeah, I got just real quick, Marty. Uh, thank you. Uh, and, and thanks to both of you for uh, appearing this, this, uh, this morning. Um, Dan, I think you touched on something uh, that I've been uh, talking about uh, for some time, and that is the uh, e economic and operational fallout for the customer, for, for the shipper, uh, as a result of, of these service uh, issues that, that I see have, has only exacerbated since TSR has, has taken place. Um, and, and the only, I, I have one, one request and I appreciate the, the examples that you gave. Do you, do you have, is there any sort of data that shows sort of the financial fallout from that? I mean, every time we hear from, from, the, uh, from the railroad side, they talk about, you know, this is how much we can lose in our operational or infrastructure costs, or it's gonna cost, you know, X amount to do this time. And, you know, I, I, I don't wanna seem like it's all one-sided that it's like, okay, well, they're gonna lose. Well, I think, what you're saying is that, you know, your membership uh, within this group is already losing and, and, and you know, you're shutting down facilities, uh, that's labor issues, that's, that's you know, again, operational and, and even, you know, your relationship with your customers. So, you know, have, have you guys sort of put any sort of uh, skin on that or any report on that that sort of, you know, you know quantifies, you know, just, just how much you're losing or, or, or what's at stake? Yeah, I think at least with one of the member companies, the one that was unnamed, um, they did estimate um, their losses per day when there were shutdowns to be around $200,000 per day. Um, I'm not familiar with the impact that Kraft Heinz had. And, and I, I, I think we can find that out for you um, and engage in an ex parte meeting or something of that nature. Um, but, um, you know, I, I with respect to that, it's also uh, worrisome that these shippers um, really don't have any avenue 
to recover those losses um, because generally speaking, um, they can't recover consequential damages um, as a result of rail service. So um, it's a very difficult situation to be put in uh, when you're relying on the rail service and it's crucial uh, to your commodity uh, being produced and then um, you're single served and you're pretty much at the mercy of the railroads. And then all of a sudden your plant shuts down. Um, and I'm sorry to go on here, but you know, I, I was obviously at the board during 2013 and 14. Um, and that was a, you know, a very difficult time uh, as far as the rail network for numerous reasons. Um, and I do not recall the number of plant shutdowns occurring that are occurring now. Um, it just seems like they are uh, quite common now. Um, and I, I only remember maybe one occurring or getting close to occurring and that was resolved and maybe one other uh, utility writing in and that was resolved. But now it doesn't seem like um, they're being resolved. So it seems like the situation has become much more dire I don't have any facts on that, but um, I will talk to uh, the PERPA members and some of the other people that I work with and see uh, what that impact is for you. Harvey, I, I just if I could uh, thank you for that, Dan. You know, uh, the next question is, you know, you talked about the supply chain and you, you want it strengthened, and you know, the supply chain also goes beyond, you know, the railroad. It goes to your to your customers, and so you know. Result in in you know miss switches and 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 the days being cut, you know what impact would you say it has on the ultimate consumer? I mean, is is that is part of that a reason why we're seeing a increase in in food prices and uh, and the like because there's been delays and because of that the the, the uh, service problems within within uh, within the, uh, the the network. Yeah, I, I think there's there's no doubt that there is a connection. Um, I mean, as Herman mentioned, it's sometimes difficult to quantify uh, when the service is unreliable, but over time, you're gonna start doing that. Um, and when your numbers start uh, changing because you have to shut down a plant, um, that's gonna impact the price. But uh, if Herman, if you have any- well, Herman, I mean, I mean, your, your opinion, I mean, it's, it's again, I'll, I'll uh, use uh, use Patrick's terms. Yeah, yeah it's, you're, if you could just, you know, your opinion is not saying the facts we can, we can go back and, and look and see what, what people are saying, but in your opinion. If I can just add to Dan's sure. comments, I mean, you know, the, the, at a macro level, right? So it's really difficult to dig into the kind of numbers and the research, but at a macro level, in 2017, CSX started PCR or PSR, sorry. <laughs> wow. And, and in the second half of 2017, for the first time in a decade, there was a huge spike in truck demand. And truck pricing went through the roof. Now, some people, everybody was chasing around trying to figure out what happened. Where did that truck spike come from? Demand wasn't any different. Volume wasn't any different. So this is way before COVID. This is way before. But there was this huge spike. The railroad has no idea how it does, to your point, sir, impact the other folks' supply chains, right? So, so CSX was in gridlock. People were going to truck at a huge level just to move their goods. And they're taking trucks away from other people that normally use trucks because it became a bidding war for trucks. If you look at what's happening today, after five years of PSR, there's four and a half million more trucks being used on an annual basis. And I can assure you, there hasn't been four and a half million dollars, or sorry, four and a half million new trucks and new drivers added to the road. So, so, so there's a direct correlation, sir, in inflation today and a direct correlation in our truck driver demand a direct correlation to railroads reducing their volume to increase their profits. Okay. Um, just two more questions. Um, how, what percentage of, of your membership is, is single serve? Do you guys have a number on that? We do not, but we can look into that. I, I'm going to say, if I may, though, and then clarify, most of our members have many, many rail locations. So I would suggest that probably none of them are single served across their entire network, but we'll, we'll double check that. Sir. Or, or yeah, if you could find out like the percentage of, of each one of their networks is, is single served, uh, that, sure. that would be helpful. Um, last question is, you know, on that same subject, do you have um, any numbers on, on your membership, how many times they've actually gone to trucking 
as a result of 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 uh, uh, service issues? Well, we can ask the question. I, I do. I am aware of one member that got reduced from five days a week switching to, to three days a week switching, and I know that on a regular basis, 100% of that inbound ingredient came by rail. And today, only 89% of that is coming by rail and the balance is going by truck to, to make up for that extra switch. But um, we'll, we'll look across our entire network and we'll talk to our customers and try to get you some other facts on it. Okay. Thank you. Uh, before I go to, well, Michelle, you had another question. It just uh, one follow-up question. Um, you, you spoke about the um, what I would characterize as an egregious situation with Kraft Heinz. Um, if, if this rule were implemented and uh, Kraft Heinz would have had access to another carrier, would they have been in a, in a position to actually call up a second carrier and have that car scheduled? I guess it depends on how you guys rule on reciprocal switching. <laughs> You know, I, I, in the during the UP testimony last night, they were very, very concerned about whether it was blanket approval or pre-approval, or we had to run to the board every time we needed, you know, a relief that way. Um, it, it what's known is that Kraft Heinz location. There are two Class Ones and the Florida East Coast Railroad, which is a major, all within 50 miles of that location. So. There were certainly lots of engines and lots of capable people from doing it. It depends on how the rulemaking will allow them to pick up the phone and call sometimes. Thank you. Uh, Herman, just to follow up on that, is it the case, as you understand it, where a shipper has a reciprocal switching tariff by whatever means of a merger condition or the railroad just entered into it with them, uh, that's a tariff they can call on to use when they need it. Either, either for establishing a long-term regular service or on an as-needed basis. Is that the way it works? I would agree. Yeah, yes. no, that, that sounds correct. So if we had a rule which had the effect of putting board-ordered reciprocal switching on a par with the reciprocal switching that already is utilized everywhere around the country, then I think the answer to Michelle's question would be that Kraft Heinz could have called on somebody. Yes, sir. Uh, I think you uh, just wanted to make a comment. You uh, added a perspective. Uh, we heard a lot yesterday uh, from the railroad side that if a shipper gets reciprocal switching, the board uh, before proceeding down that path has to be mindful of the downstream effects on the supply chain. Your point is, when a railroad provides bad service, they ought to be mindful of the downstream effects on the supply chain. Yes, sir. Fair enough. Thank you very much, sir. If we if we treated the concern of downstream effects on the supply chain with equal seriousness, would that be fair in your mind? Yes, sir. Okay. All right. Thank you both. Uh, any other questions? Herman, we look forward to getting back together in person. I say that to all the stakeholders, rail and shipper alike. One of these days we will. Thank you, sir. All right. Next up, U.S. Wheat, Dalton Henry. Uh, thank you. And good morning, Chairman Overman and fellow board members. My name is Dalton Henry. I'm Vice President of Policy for U.S. Wheat Associates. And first, I'd, I'd like to also thank you for the leadership time that you've put into this subject already. Uh, and, and secondly, for the opportunity to speak uh, fairly specifically today uh, to the current lack of competition between US railroads and, and those specific impacts on US wheat farmers. So our organization is, is an export market development organization for the US wheat industry. Essentially we work with wheat buyers, millers, uh, bakers, food processors, and government officials around the world. Uh, and we're relatively new to the topic of reciprocal switching compared to many of the groups and, and certainly the previous speakers on this panel. Our work on rail transportation policy really didn't get underway until 2018 when we realized the impact that ever increasing rail rates uh, and decreasing service quality were having really specifically on our, our export competitiveness. You know, previously we had long parroted the message that U.S. agriculture benefits from a world-class transportation infrastructure. 
But one thing that's that has become clear over the last decade is, is that we've repeatedly seen global competitors increasing their competitiveness and frankly, their market share in export markets that geographically and logistically uh, the U.S. should dominate. Uh, at the same time, here in the United States, we've seen other commodities, primarily field crops, uh, that are less export dependent routinely and continuously take acres away from wheat. Uh, and while there are a lot of factors at play in that, uh, you know, certainly a, a piece of the puzzle as to why we have both wheat acres and exports near 50 year lows, uh, the transportation cost has to, has to be considered to be a part of that equation. Wheat is specifically heavily reliant first on exports. On average, we export half of all US production and second on rail transportation to make those, rail, those exports happen. Uh, those two factors have made rail rate increases have a disparate impact on wheat shippers vis-a-vis -vis other bulk U.S. commodities. And the fact that our major growing regions are generally not adjacent to waterways uh, has, has increased our captiveness to railroads. Distances from wheat producing areas are far too great to truck wheat to export facilities. And that makes railroads a crucial and uh, irreplaceable link in the wheat export supply chain. And that really, at the end of the day, increases the importance of policies that are designed to interject competition into those rail markets. As we mentioned in our written submission, the results of this increased dependence on rail for the movement of wheat exports has been clear. Over the last decade, rail rates have increased nearly exponentially, and wheat continues to be charged higher rates than other commodities with similar handling characteristics, even for identical hauls. Uh, and, and that's a, a point that oftentimes folks uh, kind of one, wonder a little bit about, and essentially what, what our transportation working group did back in 2020 is, is that we collected quotes for rail service from grain shippers in uh, several growing regions for major U.S. grain crops. Those price indications were for the same origin and destination pairings and for the same dates of service. Uh, that work documented a premium of between 22% and 39% for wheat movements compared to corn, a uh, commodity with near identical handling characteristics in four major growing regions. That less than favorable treatment of wheat by railroads can also be seen in competition with one of our primary export competitors, Canada. Uh, multiple panelists in this week's hearing have referred to Canadian regulations on inter-switching that are more favorable uh, to shippers. For wheat producers in the US, the Canadian comparison is particularly telling as the two spring wheat and durham wheat growing regions are both positioned in the interior of each country. I actually located essentially directly across the border from each other, uh, across Minnesota, North Dakota, and portions of Montana. They have near identical distance to traverse to export facilities in either the US P&W or Canadian West Coast ports, uh, but work at that same time collected by one of our member states showed similar wheat origin to export point rail moves in Canada routinely cost 30% below U.S. moves at the same time. That incentivizes Canadian wheat exports over those of similar classes from the U.S. This point becomes particularly acute as you all consider uh, other matters before you, but especially the, the creation of the first tri-national railroad where U.S. producers will compete directly head-to-head -head in identical markets on the same rail line. The unchecked market power railroads have over wheat shippers has had serious implications for our competitive position in the world and is why today we're asking you to move forward with the rule on reciprocal switching. Under the current process for switching remedy, wheat shippers do not bring forward cases and are often forced to modify operations or commodity pricing to their and their customers' detriment because no other viable options are present to increase competition or provide service options. This results in negative impacts throughout the supply chain, ultimately impacting not only shippers, but their customers and consumers. The U.S. wheat industry is particularly well positioned to benefit from policies that better enable competitive switching as our largest growing regions uh, have extensive coverage by multiple class one railroads uh, who ship to a relatively limited number of export facilities, uh, just those that are essentially capable of handling bulk grain exports. So we appreciate that the STB has an important oversight role in looking at the impact of freight rail policies on rail shippers. And we're encouraged that 
you all are seeking ways to improve the reciprocal switching remedy in line with the intent of Congress. We urge you to breathe life into this remedy that has essentially been dormant for decades and to provide a method to counter class one railroads unabated market power over wheat shippers. Uh, with that, glad to uh, take questions or uh, wait until after speakers. Uh, thank you much, Dalton. I, I have a sort of a fundamental a question, a logistical question. <clears throat> and, and your understanding of where you're, could you give us a little more uh, concrete description of the logistics of shipping wheat? In other words, the far, uh, farmers are delivering their wheat mostly to a central collection place, an elevator, I assume. And it's the elevator that's served by the class one. It is. So that, that'd be a, be a very accurate description. And what, what you've really seen a, a trend of in, uh, especially in that first link, is as farms have gotten larger and production has gotten larger, uh, the facilities that serve them have gotten larger and fewer. And we've seen a, a big shift, uh, especially over the last two decades, from having many locations out there that only handle loading a few cars at a time to primarily moving wheat exports via shuttle trains now, uh, you know, 110 cars that are, are dedicated to that shipment and can load and unload in, in specified times. And they're, the first movement's by truck, I assume. Yep. The, the, the question arises, where in the vast uh, expanses of where wheat is grown, what, where's the next railroad? You know, it's uh, much easier for us to um, contemplate how a reciprocal switching might function in an urban area. I'm at a loss to understand how it could practically function if you're 300 miles away from the nearest railroad. So what is your notion of how a reciprocal switching rule would have to be framed to actually do anything for the wheat growers? So I, I think you asked an excellent question of uh, Max Fisher with NGFA yesterday uh, in terms of clarifying the number of their facilities, because it would be their members' facilities that our members are shipping wheat through, uh, and the number of their facilities that are within 50 or 100 miles of another rail line. Uh, and, and I know that he had indicated that they had done some survey work that showed a large percentage would be located within 100 miles. So there will certainly be wheat states uh, where reciprocal switching would be more beneficial than others. But when we think about you know, our two largest states, Kansas and North Dakota, are both extensively served by a large number of, of short lines as well as multiple class one railroads. I would expect that, that in the case, 300 miles would be on the extreme end uh, for those and, and that under that 100 mile mark would encompass quite a few shippers. You could see if the board were to have a rule that applied across the board to any shipper within 100 or 300 miles of an interchange, that other than in the vast expanses of Kansas, that this could really cause problems, you know, someplace in the crowded East Coast. So have you given any thought to how we, whether we ought to and whether we legally can have a different approach for a commodity like wheat than from uh, take chemicals or plastics or scrap or some of the other commodities that are closer in areas. You know, we, we certainly are in a different situation uh, than, than many of the, of the other panelists that you've heard from uh, and especially than, than many of the other commodities or products. And that may be one that we have to give a little bit more thought to in terms of exactly what, the, what those impacts on the broader supply chain could be, uh, because we, we are dealing with, with vastly different rail networks uh, in, in those areas. Uh, and, and fortunately for us, in many instances, we are able to avoid you know, the most congested portions of the US rail network. Uh, when we think about shipping from uh, you know, essentially the Great Plains through the central US, straight to the Texas Gulf or into the uh, Portland and Pacific Northwest ports. You know, those are relatively open areas. The, uh, you know, I asked questions yesterday of the railroads about the practicality of limiting the location 
or who was eligible for a switch to play to shippers whose uh, traffic was already taken to a yard where other people are already getting reciprocal switching. If that kind of limitation were applied to wheat growers or you know um, wheat elevators, uh, actually, do they call, are they elevators for wheat? Is it the same? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Um, would that work from your, in other words, if you could only interchange with the competing railroad in a yard where there was already reciprocal switching, have you had a chance to take a look at what that would do? I would expect there would still be situations where that would work, but it would certainly be limiting, uh, would limit the number of instances where it would. Is the, uh, is the need, in your view, for competition at the uh, origin end more than the destination end? Uh, in my view, the need would be more at the origin end, uh, but there would, would also certainly be instances where we could benefit from both. Uh, I, let, me, let me encourage your, you and your association, uh, because you've, you know, I assume you've been watching and uh, we, we really have to take into account uh, the congested parts of the country as well as your parts of the country if we're going to come up with any kind of a workable approach. And uh, as the hearing has unfolded and as my uh, delving into the whole issue has expanded, uh, I've wondered whether examining either the use of the through route statute or the uh, taking a harder look at the bottleneck rule might not be the appropriate way, uh, place to be looking for providing relief, assuming that relief is warranted and we think it should be given in the area of competition to your constituents as compared to other kinds of shippers. And I wonder if different approaches for different parts of the country, because the facts are different, are, are warranted. And I think we could use some education on that area. So let me encourage you to, to ask your folks to, to take a hard look at whether there's a mm -hmm. better approach for your folks uh, than just uh, trying to fit a square peg into the round hole of reciprocal switching or vice versa for wheat, wheat growers. We'll certainly do that and look forward to the opportunity to follow yeah. up. More. Yeah, and I'm not suggesting I've reached a conclusion on it, but it's obvious to anybody who studies the situation that your folks are just in a very different logistical setting than, you know, the chemical coast people or people like, like that. That's all I mean. Um, I think Karen has her hand up. Thank you. Um, you may have mentioned this, but uh, what percentage of U.S. wheat production goes to the export markets? Uh, just right at about 50%. 50%. And so American wheat production, given what has happened to Ukraine and Russia and restrictions that the West is putting on Russia in particular, I, I understand that uh, Russia and Ukraine together, um, is what I've heard on television, account for 30% of uh, world wheat uh, production that the, this puts um, uh, real importance on encouraging wheat production uh, and export of U.S. wheat. Uh, it makes it that much more important to, um, uh, to the whole world and world health. Uh, so um, uh, that's what I wanted to uh, get a better uh, understanding of uh, and uh, for us to think about uh, the importance of wheat exports in the United States uh, over the next couple of years, quite critical. I, I certainly, uh, yeah, I'm probably not in, uh, my, my crystal ball is probably just a little too blurry to really try to estimate impacts from the, the war that it is underway. You are certainly spot on that, that both Russia and Ukraine are large wheat producers. Uh, together, it's 30% of global exports uh, that they make up. Uh, and, and those 
you know, the, the trend that we have seen, you know, it, it was Russian wheat exports flowing into uh, North America, frankly, that triggered us in 2018 to say, how is it that we are so uncompetitive in a transportation sense that, that exports from the Black Sea are, are competitive in our hemisphere wow. uh, on a price basis? And, and that, was, that was the real genesis of, of the creation of our transportation working group and the subsequent work that we've been doing uh, to document rates and, and service issues. And so it, that has been an emerging trend and, and is something that we'll bear watching here in the coming years. Um, I've also heard the yellow in the Ukrainian flag. It's blue and yellow. Blue stands for the blue skies and yellow stands for their rolling fields of wheat. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Patrick. Good, Marty. Thank you so much. You're good. Okay. Any other uh, questions for Dalton? Uh, I, I just real quick, uh, Dalton. Thanks again for uh, taking the time this morning, come before us. Um, I, you know, I, uh, short and sweet, but very enlightening nonetheless. Uh, let me ask you a couple questions. Uh, you, know, you you particularly uh, pointed out uh, 2018 and and uh, the rates. Then, I mean, did, were you ever given an explanation? For, the, for those rays, that, 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 that increase in rates? Not, not one that, uh, that really corresponds to anything uh, else that, we, that we'd seen going on in the world. And the USDA AMS did uh, an interesting report that we could follow up with as well that essentially attempted to explain why wheat rates specifically had increased so much despite other trends in the wheat industry and, and pricing not suggesting that that would make sense. Uh, but really, you, it's a trend that has accelerated quite a bit over the last decade. Uh, and Have the rail rates gone up since 2018? Yes, they, they continue to go up. Uh, you know, posted rates, tariffs are, you know, it's a, a pretty steady increase uh, and has continued to be so since then. Uh, you know, a couple of times a year, we always are, are given the argument that the, you know, very little wheat moves at a posted tariff uh, rate, which, which is uh, interesting to us because it, it always leads us to ask the question of why those posted rates exist. Uh, and, and, and we don't have access to the underlying rate. So what we really rely on is our elevator partners who are willing to share quotes and bids that they're receiving or the work that the group at USDA AMS, uh, who does have access to uh, the STB waybill data to document those. And, but both of those continue to show an increase since 2018. And has, has the uh, service matched the rates? Yeah, I'll probably defer uh, to NGFA's testimony yesterday <laughs> on, uh, on service issues. Uh, and whether or not more money in rates has, has led to better service, but well, I mean, and, and I know it's a loaded question, so I'm uh, I'm sorry. I know it's early. Uh, you know, I, I was also wanted to get to that to the point that you were making in terms of you know comparing uh, you know other commodities. You know, I, I was particularly interested in that that comparison you did with with corn. Uh, you know, and, and the difference, especially when you talk at, uh, you know, origination and destination and, and, and all the other points, um, you know, you know, what do you see, you know, sort of going forward? I mean, you know, is that sustainable for, for, for the wheat growers? Or, you know, is, is, is there going to be a tipping point at some point? You know, it, it uh, so there, there's a number of factors at play uh, in, in that, but there's no question that when we look at, export bids, you know, and, and those are relatively publicly, you know, uh, relatively available uh, that you can look at what bids have been uh, from multiple countries and multiple origination points for all the export destinations. And when we look at that, we say, well, but if we could take our wheat transportation rates or essentially our rail rates down to what corn was, we become dramatically more competitive in a number of markets that today we're simply priced out of. And so to the, to the extent that there's going to be a tipping point, you know, I don't think we're going to quit growing wheat in the U.S., but we certainly grow dramatically less today than we did 
50 years ago or even just 10 or 20 years ago. Um, and I think that, right. that's not a trend that we see reversing. Right. And I don't see necessarily growth, but I also, I guess I was also alluding to market share as well. Uh, and as I've sort of been talking about it to other, other folks uh, during this hearing, you know, the, the, the consequence on the other side uh, of, you know, uh, not having access to, to, uh, to more than one uh, 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 transportation, more than one uh, uh, railroad, you know, what, what that does to ultimately your, your ability to compete. And that, that has been uh, a challenge. And as we've seen other countries become major global exporters, uh, you know, our, our market share in, in several markets has gone down. You know, many of those are in markets that make more geographic and logistical sense, you know, where we have longer ocean going uh, distances uh, compared to Black Sea uh, suppliers. But when we think, and I think what, what really piques our interest is, is when we see that we coming from uh, Black Sea region into the Western hemisphere on a much, much longer ocean voyage, and it's able to arrive landed cheaper than we can rail wheat to certain destinations uh, and direct rail shipments, that that's a real challenge and that, that that does have the potential to cost market share over the long term. Thank you. Uh, Michelle. Thanks, Marty. Um, your written comments discuss how reciprocal switching can be used to address uh, uh, rail labor shortages. Uh, in my meetings with, with other shippers, uh, they've raised the issue of how rail labor shortages impact first mile, uh, last mile issues. I was wondering if you could speak to um, how this proposal could help a shipper in the event of a labor shortage affecting first mile, last mile, when the shippers still will continue to be uh, served by the same class one carrier. That's a good question. Uh, and I think that as we have looked at labor shortages and as we've been in discussions with railroads here over uh, you know the, the previous 12 months or 18 months you know those have tended to occur in yeah, I think you, you have probably two issues at play right a longer term trend towards fewer staff which exacerbates when you have the second issue at play which is is a short term challenge of getting crews into the right places and able to provide service uh, in, in a timely manner. And so I think that's where uh, you know, our, our desire and line of thinking is, is that reciprocal switching would, would put an impetus behind increasing service overall, which a uh, key part of that is the availability of staffing and that that's a long-term solution in our mind, that a railroad knows that they have to compete on a service basis for providing quality service or else elevators will seek uh, alternative options or alternative carriers. So I, I don't know that we see it quite as much in, in the immediate term as maybe you heard the early folks on the panel discuss. Okay, thank you. Uh, um, I, uh, yeah, phrase it another way, if, are, are you basically saying if the carrier thought they were at risk of, of losing the line haul, they'd be less likely to get themselves in the circumstance to begin with? Yep. Um, now, uh, I just want to kind of um, pick up on what, something that Marty said, which is, you know, you saw the question yesterday that the chairman engaged in with respect to tariffs and tariff locations and drawing upon that to uh, potentially uh, limit the scope of what we consider a reciprocal switch, at least at the outset. Um, I would encourage uh, you, and I know you've, you've already committed to that, but to, to either take advantage of the ex parte or supplemental comment period to think about that framework specifically. And as it, as it pertains to ag shippers at origin, but also at destination, you know? So, so it, it may be the case that particular origination point may not benefit, but if there are other, if there are other facilities that may within the ag supply chain, um, that would also be interesting to know. But I, I, I would just, um, you know, request that you, you as you're uh, exploring, um, you know, different differentiating uh, frameworks based on either commodity or geography or what have you um, to do it through the lens of, I think the chairman's questions yesterday would be particularly useful. We'll certainly do that. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. All right. Any uh, further questions for Dalton? Dalton, thank you very much. Very, very helpful.
Uh, glass produce uh, packaging. Scott De DeFife. Thank you, Mr. Chairman um, and members of the commission. Uh, I am Scott DeFife. I'm the president of the Glass Packaging Institute. Uh, very happy to be here today to give you some examples of another uh, industry that is in the similar situation to all of my fellow um, panelists today. If we were sitting in person, I'd be motioning to the left and the right because the glass packaging industry, our trade association represents the glass container manufacturers, uh, but also the raw material suppliers that supply the raw materials into the glass factory, but also the end and then packaging to food and beverage manufacturers because 95 percent or plus of all glass packaging made in the United States is for food and beverage consumption, food and beverage packaging largely. So we sit in the middle of the supply chain that you see from the raw material folks who uh, are friends at the industrial minerals uh, that are going to come next and also the scrap recycling uh, because we use recycled glass to make new glass containers. So I would affiliate myself with all of the comments from from Dan and Herman before, uh, and with some of the other comments that I'm sure are to come from my fellow panelists. Um, the glass industry operates 46 glass container plants in the United States. These plants run 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, they have to be running 24 hours, seven days a week. You cannot shut down a glass furnace uh, for a shortage of supply. Uh, they pay for and rely on rail service Many of these facilities were built decades ago on class one or other rail lines. They are glass uh, manufacturing is, has been and is inherently linked with uh, rail service for decades uh, because of the efficiencies of moving the heavier weight material, uh, both from the raw material suppliers, but also then once the, the glass is produced. 80% um, of our member plants would be uh, defined as captive. Um, and because of the challenges with service uh, and supply chain issues right now, um, our members are, are seeking virtually any and all remedies that they can to increase the flexibility and the nimbleness of the supply chain. Uh, they, uh, during, uh, even before COVID uh, with PSR, there have been challenges to scheduling uh, deliveries, but um, even as the supply chain challenges of the past couple of years have increased, uh, we're seeing even higher costs for both raw materials and for uh, shipping product to our, our members and market customers. Um, the adoption of the proposed rule on reciprocal switching would assist our members in their efforts to increase efficiencies and deliveries to plants and supply chain partners to ensure efficient and reliable operations can be maintained. Um, our support is not based on the premise that shipping costs would be automatically lowered, but that the, the, the ability to secure more than one rail option would naturally make costs more competitive and also drive better service, as has been discussed previously this morning. Um, service issues are important and some competition for service issues is, is critical. Um, GPI also supports extending the reasonable distance consideration uh, from 30 miles up to 300 miles in support of uh, rural captive shippers. Many of our raw material suppliers are gonna fall into this category of getting the material to us. Um, and there are uh, several remedies that we would ask for if that cannot be done. Um, I, I can tell you that um, with my, I only have a short time today. Um, in the three years that I've been here at the Glass Packaging in Institute, we've been, almost all of it has been under uh, COVID uh, supply chain challenges and because the industry wants to use, the demand is very high um, and uh, supply chains have been challenged. And because the industry seeks to use, in fact, is necessarily using, wants to use more recycled glass as well. Um, it has environmental benefits uh, to use more recycled glass. And we have been studying various ways of trying to get really innovative and creative about securing the supply of recycled material and getting that to our plants. Virtually every one of our conversations comes to a grinding halt when you have to end up thinking about putting, you know, something on a class one rail. So the, the challenges from that standpoint um, are impacting 
creativity and innovation as well. Um, the uh, I think I'll wrap up because I've only got I'm under a minute, so I'll, I'll save some time for for questions. But certainly happy to to answer any questions about the glass industry. Uh, thank you, Scott. I um, you know you mentioned that some of your rural suppliers you know would need a much longer distance to benefit from the rule, but I assume you can recognize the issue I raised, you know, with the previous witness about one rule for the whole country that allowed switching within 100 or 300 miles would be, could really have some really bad imp uh, uh, impacts on, on congested areas of the country. You wouldn't know where to go. There'd be 100 yards within 300 miles of, of your site. Um, which I don't think is what reciprocal switching was conceived to deal with, or however it's drafted. Um, I might encourage you, as, as I did Dalton, to think about other concepts in the railroad world, such as bottleneck and through routing and so forth, as a way to, to pinpoint uh, relief, if it's warranted, for, for other kinds of, of shippers. On the other end, though, where where your uh, members are located in, in more urban areas. Do you have any reaction to the inquiry I've been asking people about the idea, at least as a starting point, uh, and an incremental approach to only permit reciprocal switching, uh, only permit shippers eligible for reciprocal switching who are using yards where reciprocal switching is already taking place for other shippers? as a way of, of both limiting the availability, but perhaps ensuring and minimizing uh, logistical difficulties if it's already being done. What, what's your thought about that? Uh, certainly, Mr. Chairman. And I do recognize the, the challenge with some of the more rural versus the other, the other areas. Um, uh, we think that there probably are some, some options and some solutions and would be happy to discuss those going forward. As to the suggestion, um, about any increase in the availability of reciprocal switching, I would say, again, without necessarily going back to, I need to go back to all my members and really get a census of where they think some of the, the key areas are that need to be focused on. But um, as a baseline, I would tell you that almost any help in this area is going to be beneficial. All right. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? I got a quick one, uh, uh, Marty, if you don't mind. Um, just real quick, Scott, thanks again yep. for, for being here. So 80% so of, of your, you said of, of uh, your membership is captive? The plants, the manufacturing plants. Plants, plants yeah. So which is the core of our, our membership or the, or the glass container manufacturing plants. Okay. Um, and I, as, I've, as I've asked other uh, uh, participants before, do you guys measure the economic impact of, of, um, uh, of, of service related issues on, on your plants? So in terms of, have you had, in terms of the, the amount of times that you may have found plants to have shut down or, or slowed production, uh, you know, do you guys keep, keep sort of any, or measurements or, or any records to that? Um, we, we certainly don't at the trade association level. I mean, there's a there's a limit to the kinds of data that we we can have, but we do have many anecdotal examples with our members and specific plants that tend to stay that we could probably, you know, discuss more in the ex parte, you know, dialogue afterwards, uh, where we could assemble some examples for you. Like I said before, um, the our members you know, shutting down a glass plant is catastrophic. Um, if you are short supply on the raw materials, you are scrambling to get them in from any other place. So if you're typically expecting and using 18 to 20 cars or more of sand, it's silica, limestone, soda ash. These are very basic, you know, uh, mineral commodities to make the glass in the first place. Um, and if you're, you're typically using 20 and one week you only get two or five or, or something you know, such as that, you're scrambling to get that material you know, from other places. Um, Rob, I would say that there was a really critical uh, discussion with, with uh, Dan and Herman 
that I think relates to us as well, that a, a delay of 24 hours, if it's known, can be planned around. It's not necessarily a, you know, a delay. It's all about reliability and knowing when that supply is coming in and being able to plan for it. Um, you know, they'll do virtually everything they can to keep from uh, uh, shutting things down. However, I would say it is, I mean, we've definitely, the entire industry, anybody who's, you know, experiencing issues in the supply chain uh, has definitely been experiencing some price increases that are, are definitely related to the issues of uh, constrained supply and transportation right now. I appreciate that. What, and one last question. Have you seen uh, any increase in, in any of your, uh, among your membership in, in moving to, to, uh, to trucks to get more uh, resources to, the, to those plants? Uh, I would say absolutely, and it would probably be by necessity. I think one of the the key points, and that I may have put in our, our written testimony, but I'd I'd like to th glass plants are uh, tailor made for rail service. Um, we should be using more. We want to use more. The efficiencies of rail service, the environmental benefits of rail service to move material over you know hundreds of miles is is considerable over truck traffic, um, the fact that we cannot uh, is, is limiting uh, the um, efficiencies of the rail system uh, and for the supply chain itself. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Scott, one, I had uh, one other question. Have you had members who've actually had to, you say shutting down a glass plant is a disaster. Has it happened because of rail? Uh, rail failure service no, failure? no i mean when i say catastrophic i would mean it would be i mean you're going to have to almost rebuild the think about molten glass not you know getting stuck in the furnace this is not a good situation at all and when i say that i'm under <laughs> i'm dramatically under uh you know i'm really not giving its full implications um so they'll scramble to get the supply from various other sources no no one's been close to having to shut down, you can turn, if you, this has not happened in North America, but during COVID, we do have um, examples from overseas where, you know, people had to turn their, their plants down to, you know, just kind of a, an operational simmer, you know, keep the furnace going, but not necessarily producing. Uh, there's some examples in Europe and South America of that, that did not occur in North America. We have been essential manufacturing parts of the food and beverage supply chain during COVID completely and have been operating um, at capacity the entire time. So it sounds like what you were saying that as I was discussing with others on the panel, the, the key for your folks is predictability and consistency so they can plan around it. Not so, not so much how many actual days stuff takes to get there, but whether it always gets there when it's ordered. Absolutely, Mr. Chairman. Yep. Okay, thank you. Any other uh, questions for Scott? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Scott. Our um, next witness is uh, Chris Greising from the Industrial Minerals Association. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman Oberman and the rest of the board members for holding this uh, very important hearing. My name is Chris Greising. I'm the president of the Industrial Minerals Association North America. The IMA represents a diverse set of companies engaged in the mining and processing of about 20 or so essential minerals to the US economy. Uh, these companies mine these materials at over 300 sites throughout the US uh, with additional facilities in Canada and Mexico. These minerals are the raw material feedstock that are vital for almost all the US's manufacturing ag agricultural needs. The demand for these minerals uh, from manufacturers is global, and the continued pressure our companies are feeling from the railroads in terms of unreliable service and unreasonably high rates is making it more difficult to compete in that global market. The products our companies uh, produce are low margin, high volume products that are shipped in bulk. Many of our companies are also located in rural areas of the country and are typically captive shippers. In the discussions you may have heard around critical minerals, 
The U.S. is becoming increasingly reliant on minerals from other nations. This is only partially due to availability. A large reason for this is instead uh, because the inability to compete in the global market between the regulations and other negative headwinds we're seeing in the U.S. making it uneconomical to operate here. As I mentioned, we are a very low margin industry and the pricing practices we're seeing from the railroads, especially towards our captive shipping members, is truly unconscionable. Here are just two examples, uh, general examples that uh, have been shared with me recently. Um, from our uh, sodium-based minerals uh, in the uh, West, it is cheaper for manufacturers located in parts of the Eastern US to import those minerals from Europe and Turkey via ocean freight that takes considerably longer than it is for the producers who are captive in the West to ship via the rails to the East Coast. And our members are losing out on uh, 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 sales on the East Coast of the US uh, to Europe and Turkey as a result. Even more troubling are the conditions for our clay producers where similar to wheat, it is cheaper for their competitors in Europe via ocean freight to manufacture along the northern parts of the Mississippi River than it is for our members who are captive in the Tennessee, Kentucky region to ship via rail. Uh, again, we are losing customers uh, because of the uh, practices of the rails uh, just hitting us very hard on pricing. Uh, this sh uh, simply should not be the case. Uh, for too long, railroads have put shareholders' interests above those of shippers and the general public by continuously raising rates and providing uh, unreliable service. This past fall, Escalation Consultants presented our conference in Utah in their uh, presentation. They showed how competitive rail revenue was up about 24% in the 15-year period up to 2019. Meanwhile, non-competitive rates skyrocketed by over 230%. This is consistent with the AR's testimony yesterday evening that some shippers pay more than others. Uh, the truth is uh, captive shippers are being hammered both via pricing and in surface because they have nowhere else to turn. They're at the mercy of the railroad. And now that we are in a state of rapid rise inflation, we are seeing rates go up even further and faster than before. On top of that, PSR and supply chain issues are further impacting service. In order to level the playing field among shippers and prevent captive shippers from paying exorbitantly high fees, we are very supportive of the STB moving forward with allowing reciprocal switching in the US. Reciprocal switching provides a common sense solution to the issue of competitive rates. It is needed now more than ever before, given the rate increases we're seeing and the potential merger of CP and KCS, which will only serve to diminish shippers options, both in terms of reasonable rates and reliable service. One statement from yesterday's testimony that particularly struck me was the claim that service had not been raised as an issue until recently. Um, this is not because service has been strong by any means. A common theme in my 16 or 17 years working for this industry has been the unreliability of the rail service. The reason why this hasn't been raised is due to the very real fear of retribution if they were to speak out, especially those that are captive. With the advent of P, uh, PSR, there, are nothing, uh, there was simply nothing left for shippers to lose by becoming more vocal in their extreme frustration with how they've been treated by the railroads. Uh, it's very ironic that the same industry that introduced the concept of PSR is now saying a new policy will negatively impact service as a reason for opposing that policy. Uh, reciprocal switching will allow uh, shippers who are in a captive situation to be on a more even playing field with competitors who have access to more than one option. If uh, the service continues to be uh, subpar, they have the option to go to a different railroad and hopefully uh, at a fairer rate as well. We believe that this would be the first step in the right direction towards leveling the playing field, but it's important that when implementing this, we ensure this provides protections to all shippers and does not increase uh, pressures and force even higher rates on those that are royal captive shippers. Uh, one of the requirements in the proposed rule is that the uh, other class one rail carrier must be within a reasonable distance of the facilities of the party seeking switching. Uh, my members and I are concerned with the ambiguity around the term reasonable distance, as it is unclear how the board may interpret that in future decisions. Uh, we believe that the board must interpret this uh, term liberally. If they do not, the impact of the rule, especially for those in my sector, uh, will be uh, more towards the minimal side, as we do not believe the 30 miles being suggested by some is nearly adequate enough. Um, 
not only will many of our members not be able to participate, but I fear those that are rural captive shippers and not near that uh, 30 mile range would be unduly harmed by the rule as they will only see their non-competitive rates skyrocket as the railroads attempt to offset any lost revenue that results from having to offer fair rates to some. We believe that a min at a minimum, the STB should specify that the reasonable distance is no less than 300 miles and allow for the consideration of longer distances on a case-by-case -case basis. This will allow for real change to occur in the out-of-control rate situation we're currently witnessing for captive shippers. Uh, with inflation, supply chain issues, uh, uh, and continuing impact costs of consumer goods, it is clear that th this would be in the public's interest as well to rein in the railroad's historic practices of overcharging cast, uh, captive customers. The IMA is very supportive of the board's efforts on reciprocal switching. We strongly encourage you to adopt the proposed rules, but do request that you modify the proposal with regards to reasonable uh, distance to allow for a distance of at least 300 miles and ensure that more shippers and the American public are able to uh, benefit from the resulting lower uh, rates and better service. Again, I would like to thank the board for this opportunity to testify and uh, welcome any opportunity to answer any questions you may have. Uh, thank you, uh, Chris. Uh, could you give me a little better idea of where your members are shipping? What, in what kind of geographies are they located? We're located all over uh, the country. Uh, the mining sites are where the minerals are in the ground. Uh, you have folks in uh, rural areas in Wisconsin, some that are closer to major cities uh, in the central part of the U.S., up in the northeast. We have operations in Massachusetts, Vermont. It's probably about 40 of the 50 states altogether. The, uh, you know, I raised the concern with, the, with other witnesses about these long mileage requests in order to encompass uh, rurally uh, located customers who are spread out as opposed to those in congested areas. Uh, do, do you agree if, if we applied a, a countrywide 300 mile range for where you could obtain reciprocal switch that could, could exacerbate or cause congestion problems in the congested parts of the country even you know, might be needed to serve your customer, your members? I certainly understand the uh, the reasoning behind that, and I've appreciated the uh, those comments that have been made throughout the hearing. I will say that there is a significant fear that if uh, it is more limited in scope, that uh, we stand the rare, very very real threat uh, of having uh, those uh, individuals uh, shippers be charged a much higher rate uh, as compared to to others, as we've seen the practice all along. Well, do you have any uh, thoughts about how the board might go about adjusting the rule so it uh, accomplishes both ends, if that's possible? Uh, it, I, I, I can definitely get back to you with uh, some uh, suggestions. Uh, one thought off the top of my head is, you know, uh, limiting the uh, allowable rate increases that uh, a railroad might be able to put on a captive shipper um, uh, over a several year period, uh, just to make sure that uh, they're not getting hit any harder than those that uh, are in a competitive situation. Well, you know, we're, we have under consideration two uh, rate relief uh, proposals, the uh, voluntary arbitration idea the railroads have come up with and the final offer uh, our NPRM, which is still pending, uh, if the board were to enact one or both of those measures, would that not provide the kind of relief you're talking about? Potentially, potentially. Uh, you know, we'll see how you know the final rules play out. Um, so will we, <laughs> right? <laughs> right. So um, you know, I, I'm skeptical about the one, uh, but. Uh, uh, you know, hopeful about the other. Um, and, you know, if we can come up with the sort of protections that our folks need uh, to ship uh, in a fair and reasonable way, I think that would be uh, of significant benefit uh, for, for all because we are the raw material feedstock that goes into making the glass bottles, the paints, the coatings, uh, basically everything you use every day, uh, our minerals are in. 
And as we're paying higher and higher costs, uh, the public is going to then have to pay a higher and higher costs as well uh, for the end product. It, it does sound like the the biggest concern you have from your soul served uh, folks are, uh, are, are are rates more than service. Is that a fair statement? Uh, no, I, service has been terrible. Uh, so I hope to not uh, 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 give off that impression. Uh, our, the servicing issues that our members are facing, uh, especially the captive shippers, is uh, um, not been ideal over over the years. Uh, it's been something that they have constantly complained about in my 16 or 17 years uh, at this association um, and is uh, something that has only been exacerbated over the last uh, uh, four or five years since P uh, PSR has been implemented. It, it is the issue they complain about consistency, lack of predictability? Uh, or is it something else? All the, uh, yeah, all that and communication. There, uh, communication has been horrific. Uh, and there's some of our folks that uh, didn't even know that this uh, switch to PSR was happening until, you know, you know, cars weren't showing up when they were scheduled. And then they had to, you know, call, contact uh, uh, folks within the railroads to try to figure out what that, what in the world was going on, uh, which is not an easy process either. So, um, yeah, communication, reliability, consistency are all the major issues. And uh, you've been hearing that from uh, most of the shippers so far. Oh. Okay, I only have one other question. Are, are you a world wrestling champion? What is that belt on the wall? Oh my, yeah, no, it's a uh, WWE uh, autograph championship belt. Yes, um, <laughs> for charity. <laughs> Got it for charity. <laughs> maybe your members ought to just send you out to the offending rail, rail yard <laughs> you know that that could be the case you know yeah. <laughs> all right are there um, any uh, have, questions for chris i have i have one final question but first morning thank you thank you so much for for raising the belt that was, that was uh, something that was in my mind as well um chris you spoke to communication and uh, between you know your your members and the railroads, and that issue uh, comes up in just about every meeting that I have uh, with with shippers and in other industries. I wondered if you could just take a brief moment to speak, uh, you know, specifically to what in fact would improve communication, and what level of, of communication would would do you think would benefit uh, your members. Well, I think one of the biggest issues that we've heard is, you know, with PSR, with the railroads cutting the number of employees that they cut, um, being able to have those sort of historic uh, long-term relationships with uh, the railroad um, are a bit more difficult. Um, as you just don't know who your primary contact is anymore. Um, you know, I think there has to be an effort made by the railroads to be a little bit more, um, you know, active in their outreach to their customers and to be a little bit more transparent in what they're doing in terms of uh, servicing. And, you know, perhaps that would help the overall uh, um, uh, relationship between shippers and railroads, but we're just not seeing that right now. And a lot of that has to do, we believe, with uh, the downturn in employment on the railroad side. Thank you. No, thank you. Any other uh, uh, questions for Chris? All right, Chris, thank you very much. And do give some some thought along the lines that we've talked about with other witnesses this morning about other, other mechanisms or approaches that could provide the kind of relief that your folks uh, are in need of uh, other than through the re reciprocal switching concept. Seems okay. to me we have to be nimble here and not have one, uh, one size fits all. Certainly understand. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. Uh, our next and final witnesses on this panel are from uh, 
the Institute of Scrap Recycling Industries, an entity near and dear to my family, uh, Bobby Treish and Karen Booth. Good so, morning. Yep, good morning. And Mr. Chairman, I won't be testifying. I'm, I'm here for questions if needed. Uh, but Bobby, Bobby's the star of the show here for ISRI, and I'll come back on uh, after he's finished. You mean you think we've had enough? <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't want to say, but you know, it's possible. <laughs> You're always Marty, You're did always you ever consider popular. that she might have had enough of us? <laughs> That's also possible. But Thank you. Just from, from our end, Karen, you're always welcome. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. As, as I That's would right. say to all of our uh, stakeholders uh, that we've been hearing from. Bobby, you're up. Uh, good morning. My name is Bobby Trish, and I'm uh, Vice President and Regional General Manager of the Georgia region of SA Recycling. SA Recycling is a member of the Institute of Scrap Recycling Industries, uh, commonly known as ISRI, and we are actively involved in the ISRI's Ferris Division. Uh, first of all, we commend the board for holding this hearing and allowing us to explain our concerns with the lack of adequate rail competition and why we support expanding reciprocal switching between the carriers. SA Recycling is a full service Ferris and non-Ferris metal recycler and processor. Our recycling operations include manufacturing scrap, appliance recycling, automobile recycling, demolition scrap, green waste, oil filter recycling, um, and basically any, any many other types of uh, recyclables. Uh, we operate over 120 facilities throughout the Western, Midwest, and Southeast regions of the country. In uh, in those facilities, we have 35 facilities that are rail served. 31 of those are captive to a single railroad. Three are served by a short line and only one is truly dual served. And that's in Chattanooga. Uh, in my role, I oversee the operations of the Georgia region, which has 21 facilities. Uh, 20 of them are in Georgia. One is in Alabama, right on the border with uh, Alabama and Georgia. 10 of my facilities are rail served, seven on the NS, two on the CSX, and one on the short line. Rail transportation is critical for shipments of ferrous and non-ferrous scrap, especially at distances longer than 200 miles. Ferrous scrap is essential to over 70% of U.S. steel production needed to implement the bipartisan infrastructure law. Steel made from recycled steel also saves energy and reduces greenhouse gases. Due to the unique characteristics of bulk scrap metal, including its heavy weight, there are many situations where rail is only feasible uh, for the shipment of this material. The lack of competition at many scrapyards that are served by only one rail provider adversely affect rates and service because the monopoly carrier lacks the incentive to negotiate and or improve its service reliability. Expanding reciprocal switching would allow competition to play a greater role in addressing these challenges. By providing a captive rail customer the opportunity to access a second railroad at nearby interchanges in certain situations. Starting in 2017, the US Class 1 railroads began PSR as their operating model. Although PSR was marketed as a mechanism to improve rail service, the expansive cost cutting in labor and equipment as part of PSR has generally caused less efficient and less reliable service for SA recycling. Our company and many other ISRI members have experienced significant service disruptions, including congestion, miss switches, bunch rail cars, and inadequate rail car supply. Despite these service issues, which have only been exacerbated by recent supply chain challenges, freight rates have continued to increase year over year at our captive locations. In a competitive industry, service providers who are underperformed are not usually able to reward themselves with rate increases from their customers. We have experienced these effects firsthand. We have recently completed our annual contract negotiations with one of the Eastern Railroads that is the only provider of rail services at, the, uh, at our Southeast facilities in Georgia. This past year, the carrier experienced significant service disruptions, which really got horrible in the fall, which greatly impacted our ability to reliably service our steel mill customers. Despite this below par service, our rail service carriers still offered a rate increase for the new year of nearly 10%. Although we were able to reduce that final level of the rate increase in a competitive market, one would expect a poorly performing service provider to keep its rail rates flat or even reduce its rates to ensure that its customers do not switch to another provider. At one location in other regions where SA Recycling has competitive rail access at our facilities, that location does receive better service and rates compared to our captive facilities. Competition works. While, is it expect, while it is expected that some service disruptions will occur in rail service, 
the frequency of problems and willingness of the carrier to resolve the problems differ between captive and non-captive facilities. Reciprocal switching could help to mitigate service disruptions by providing an alternative to shippers when disruption occurs on the bottleneck carrier's network. On the flip side, reciprocal switching could also incentivize bottleneck carriers to work with shippers to resolve service disruptions to avoid losing the traffic to a competing carrier. One example where reciprocal switching could benefit our company is one of our main yards in Atlanta called East Point, where my office is. We are served only by the NS, but the NS and the CSX interchange traffic right downtown, less than 10 miles away, in Minyard. We supply scrap to steel mills that have access to both the NS and the CSX. Those two specifically are US Pipe and Commercial Metals in Birmingham. There are two steel mills that are served by both. NS, however, selects an interchange location that's closer to the destination, preserving its long haul instead of switching the traffic to, C to CSX at a nearby interchange in Atlanta, which would allow a competitive alternative. I understand that the railroads oppose reciprocal switching because they believe it will cause more interchanges and inefficiencies. It is not in our interest to decrease the efficiency of the railroad shipments by adding multiple interchanges. If reciprocal switching is expanded and if the bottleneck carrier is best positioned to provide reliable and faster transit, then it would likely keep the traffic. But at least shippers would have an option to switch their traffic to a competing carrier at a nearby interchange, assuming that switching would lead to improved service or more competitive rates. With the rampant inflation going on throughout the country, competition would help to bring that inflation down. In the real world, the only competition our rail carriers have now is trucks, and that is only to mills within about 150 miles of our facilities. And we're using that as much as we possibly can, especially since 2017. Finally, why SA Recycling and ISRI urged the board to promptly adopt its reciprocal switching rules. As the board well knows, the existing commodity exemption for fair scrap shipments creates an additional hurdle for our shipments. As explained in my testimony, ISRI members who operate captive rail facilities experience the same challenges as non-exempt rail traffic. The iron and steel scrap commodity exemption is outdated and no longer reasonable based on the highly concentrated rail industry, and it should be revoked by the board respectfully. Ferris scrap shippers should have equal access to expanded reciprocal switching and the benefits of rail competition. Thank you again for holding this hearing, and I'd be glad to answer any questions you may have. Uh, thank you, Bobby. Uh, so do you have, when you said one of your facilities is dual served, is it through reciprocal switching that it's dual served or how, how does that work? It, it's, it's, uh, it's our facility in Chattanooga that we just recently picked up by buying PSC. And it is an, uh, it's a facility that used to be a foundry. Uh, year, decades and decades ago, and it's downtown Chattanooga and it's also on the river. So it's got NS, CSX, and barge. And because of the efficiencies of barge transportation, I, I think they ship most of their scrap out by barge on the Tennessee River. But it is actually served by both because it's a big facility that has rail coming in from different right. So to use either railroad doesn't require a reciprocal switch in that. Yes, so I'm, I'd like to, if you have any experience, you know, we had a lot of questions yesterday about how does a reciprocal switch actually physically take place as compared to one that's not reciprocal. And I wonder if, if well, let me ask this, the yards that, that are served, sole served, are, are your cars picked up by a local train and taken to a servicing yard, a switching yard? Yes, sir. And in that yard, they are then classified and put on some track where they're then connected to a train that's going to a steel mill. Is yes, that right? Sir. Yes, sir. Do you know whether any of those yards that service your locations also provide reciprocal switching services for other shippers other than yourself? Yeah, I do. I do not know the answer to that question. Um, but I, I, I know that um, if we are going to a destination that, let's say, on the CSX, uh, either through uh, Rule Eleven moves they would go to like the Inman yard, which is in downtown uh, Atlanta, and they would hand off those cars to the CSX. And I think that happens on a daily basis um, because they have two yards right next to each other. The NS and the CSX have yards right next to each other, downtown or West. So, West. And, and whose line serves your, your, what local? Is that a short line or is that a CSX local? 
No, our facility is on NS. So the NS That's actually has on NS. I see. Yes, sir. So like in East Point, where we're talking about East Point, uh, the NS has a small yard here in East Point where they because East Point's a historically industrial area. So they have a they have a yard there. And um, now they don't always take them to the Inman yard. I think they take them to the I, I don't know exactly how the NS does everything, but they take them to the East Point yard and then they probably build a train and they may send it on to another yard for more cars. I'm not exactly sure how they build trains. In that situation, I take it if you're, what, what you would like to have is uh, the ability for that local NS train to deliver your cars to the CSX yard as well. Yes, sir. As an option. Yes, sir. Would that involve one extra move, no extra moves. Maybe it's an unfair question. You're not in the rail yard business. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I know in our Decatur yard, and I'm not sure. So Decatur, Alabama, we have, uh, which used to be the uh, Denbo uh, scrap. It's been there a long, long time. Uh, and they don't do that much rail business because they have new core Decatur right down the road, just a few miles. So they truck a lot of it. But I do know from talking to Joel Denbo that, um, they have they're served by NS, but they can um, they have some mechanism that allows them to uh, get rates and bill directly out on CSX. Um, and so, and I so I I, I can't uh, quantify how much better that is because of their proximity to Newcore Decatur, which is four miles down the road. It's hard to it's hard to ship scrap. Uh, on on rail away from a steel mill that's four miles away. Yeah, so well, that's understandable. I, I, um, uh, if you were provided reciprocal switching, and let's just take up UP at their description, that it would add a day to the delivery, but it was a consistent day that you and the steel mills could plan on. Would that be? an improvement in your view, or would you rather not lose the day? It would absolutely be an improvement because we, we, I believe routinely lose days here and days there all the time for different things. So having that, uh, that, that option of talking to uh, and getting rights from a, from a competitive, a competitive source would, I would take that in a second. Yeah. Is it the reliability and consistency that's as important as just how long the trip takes? maybe more important um we you know reliability is uh it is very sketchy at best so it's not very dependable so having the ability to get uh better pricing would be worth more than reliability and dependability when we met with you uh, a couple of years ago uh, you know, bunching was a, certainly a big issue. I think the uh, railroads have gotten better in that regard, um, but still, the reliability uh, is uh, hit or miss, and uh, it's well, it's gotten better since you know this last batch of bass of COVID. Uh, really, uh, they they really suffered in really December, January was lots and lots of miss switches. Well. You're not saying reliability is unimportant. You're just saying you're pessimistic that you'll ever get it. Yes. Is that fair to <laughs> say? Yes. Yes. Um, yeah. Okay. I, uh, I I had another question for you, but let me, uh, it has escaped me for the moment. Let me see. Uh, Karen Hedlund has a question. So let me hand it off. Yes. To it's not a question. Um, uh, Bobby, you're in Atlanta, and I just wanted to point out, we have been talking for the last two days about the meaning of terminal area. What is a terminal? Uh, and uh, it reminded me that the original name of Atlanta, Atlanta was founded in uh, 1837 as the terminus of the um, uh, something in Atlantic Rail or Great Western and Atlantic Railroad. And so the name of the original name of the city was Terminus. I, you're exactly right. I didn't, I didn't, uh, I didn't always know that, but I, 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 do, uh, I do for the last 20 years, but you're right. Terminus. Terminus. Yeah. All right. Are there any, uh, any other questions for Bobby? Hey, Marty. Yes. Thank yeah, you. Go ahead, Patrick. Hey, Bobby. Good to see you. Um, the, you mentioned your 35 facilities, 
one truly dual serve, three short line. Um, the three short line, do they have access to more than one railroad? Yes, the so three short lines only, one is in my region, it's Phoenix City, Alabama, it's on the CCH. And uh, we have access to at least, almost all of it goes NS because of uh, where we go from there, but it, they have access to the CSX as well. And then on the West Coast, um, our facility at Terminal Island, California and Bakersfield, California, California are both served by short lines as well. Now, of your 31 that are served by one railroad, how many of those, and I I'm, I'm don't mean to put you on the spot, but so ballpark is totally fine. Um, but, um, you know, uh, how many of those would you classify as rail dependent versus the 31 that might be sole served, but, you know, you feel that for a variety of reasons, I think you've already given an example of one that, that you know, for truck or maybe even barge is a, um, is a possible option for the 31. A good option, I should say, effective option, maybe the more precise term. So um, the the facilities that we that we acquired from PSC uh, last fall, um, they have barge service in Chattanooga and Nashville. Oh my gosh, you're putting me on the spot. Um, St. Louis, I think uh, they don't have barge access right there, but they're a mile from the dock, so they they put a lot of things on the water. Up in uh, Ohio, they're just uh, rail, but they're more, there's, there's closer proximity to uh, steel mills up there. You know, there's still a lot right. of steel mills up there. So they, so truck is a more viable option for them. Where, where I work every day in Georgia, um, you know, before 2017, we shipped almost exclusively by rail because most of the scrap steel we produce here goes to Alabama. Alabama being the biggest steel producing state in the nation, um, 10 steel mills, I think off the top of my head. So there's a giant sucking sound of scrap going into Alabama every month. And uh, you know we have one steel mill here in Georgia in Cartersville, it's a Gerdau mill, and we truck there because it's on CSX. And so, um, so we, uh, and finding truck drivers is, uh, very difficult right now uh, with the manpower shortage. And uh, I don't know if uh, younger people entering the workforce, just like, I don't want to be a truck driver. Uh, that's passe. I want to, I, I don't know, but we certainly could use a lot more truck drivers and it's been exasperated by uh, the rail car or the yeah. rail service. Inefficiency. But suffice to, suffice to say, you know, looking at your facilities, you have, some with competition, some with a lower degree of competition. And the re where I'm headed with this is I'm wondering, you know, similar to a question I asked um, Perfba earlier, which is, can you, you know, readily distinguish or discern that your facilities that have better competitive options, either, you know, dual serve, short line, barge, truck, the, the, the facilities with better competitive options, do you discern a market difference in their rates and service product compared to the ones that have worse competitive options. Yes, and uh, the classic point is when we talk to our, our friends at the railroad, and once again, as I told you all a couple of years ago, I generally like the people I deal with the railroads, they're, they're nice people, I, uh, so I have, I have, I have nothing uh, against them personally, we get along well. Um, but you know, it's frustrating to say, to sit down and say, hey, your rates are going up 10%. It's like, really? Uh, you, after you apologized last week for missing all of my rail switches, you're going to raise my rates 10%. Anyway, anyway but so those facilities, uh, or excuse me, those destinations that are closer, that have competition by truck, those, those rates are much more competitive. So example, Atlanta to Birmingham, where I can run a truck over and pick up a backload and bring something back, those rates by rail are are, are actually quite good rates. But if you go a little bit further and you go Atlanta to Tuscaloosa, Atlanta to Decatur, where, where it's too far for a truck to make a round trip, prices go up. Now, now what about, I mean, you, you, you provided important testimony in the, the merge context and um, obviously engaging on 704 about, uh, you know, uh, uh, issues with bunching, which you said has gotten better, which is good to hear. But, you know, do, do you see the same differential service performance as well, like you do for rates um, between the not as competitive versus more competitive? 
so I can't tell you when they when they come in to service us, they don't differentiate their service based on whether it's going shorter or further. So it's it, it's I, I don't know that I can make that, that statement. You don't even think on the first last mile, there's much of a difference between competitive and not. Um, I don't know. So every day uh, we ship out, let's say, 12 cars. Four of them may be going to Birmingham, six of them may be going to Decatur, and two of them may be going to Mississippi. So I don't think there's a differentiation on uh, the service. I'm more, I'm more comparing the facilities, the origination points. Comparing, oh. uh, yeah. So if you're comparing, let's take uh, your Chattanooga or your short line served facilities, um, you know, uh, 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 where you got, you know, intramodal competition and let's take your most rail captive facility with one uh with one railroad would you generally expect to see different rail service performance not within cars based on destination but within the origination points that are differently situated i don't know that i can say that so i i know that um i think the cch the short line in phoenix city does a, a really good job i think they're very attentive to uh service and I think it's because being in Phoenix City, we can we can use trucks easier there to go to Alabama to those mills in Alabama. So, and I and I think logically um, that your statement is is correct. That the the more competition, the more people know that they've got to perform, the better uh, their performance is going to be. Got it. And I actually, uh, uh, Karen, I have, I have one question for you. I uh, hope to. Uh, take advantage of your expertise on the line. You know, yesterday it was mentioned by uh, a railroad witness about adding things like product competition and increasing the RVC threshold beyond what we do, and um, you know, beyond but what was included in, in the in the proposed rule. And you know, I I'm sort of you know uh, wondering is it, is it your assessment? that that would take the framework, as well as maintaining a conduct standard of some type. Is it your assessment that that would take the framework both beyond what the board rejected in mid-tech itself, as well as to something that's more complicated than even a rate case? Well, um, I guess, Patrick, just kind of thinking about that, I mean, of course, the NetLeague proposal going back in time, right, had created these conclusive presumptions with the intent of sort of creating what, what we called at the time sort of a fast pass to relief. If you could meet certain criteria that, you know, we explained in, you know, the original petition, that would be kind of prima facie, if you want to call it, uh, evidence of a competitive problem. Right. You should have a faster, you know, option to get this relief to 240% RVC was one of those factors. That, that Knit League had put but, forward. But importantly, now, Knit League did not have a conduct standard, right? It did not. Right. So, no. so if you're gonna if you're gonna add those things in and keep the conduct standard, that's additive, right? It's 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 more right. it's, it, it's something beyond. Um, but I, I think the conduct standard is important too, and I I, I mean that, that you're sort of probing in, and 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 we've had interesting dialogue yesterday and already this morning, and you know that's something we're obviously going to need to think through as we evaluate this. But I, I think, you know, going down the path of comparing, um, you know, what service like at a captive facility versus at a competitive facility, is that the right way to um, produce evidence, so to speak, of a problem? You know, it, it might be, we heard Herman, you know, touch on first mile, last mile data, what have you. You could think about, you know, number of switches, consistency, reliability, car supply, cycle times. There's lots of things that could be looked at. But I, I do think that you also, touched on yesterday, an important point of burden of proof, because you can kind of start thinking about, well, okay, um, if you're going to be comparing captive and non-captive, well, is it the same company, which we're talking about to a lot of witnesses? Is it the same industry? Uh, is it the same commodity? Um, you know, and there might be situations where uh, you might be captive or competitive for some commodities and maybe the railroads don't like your commodity like a TIH and you may <laughs> not have a way to establish, you know, any difference. Uh, rural versus uh, urban, um, you know, volumes. So I could see where 
burden of proof starts to still get quite complicated, potentially, right. in going down this path. And, you know, we're not going to solve that right here, right now. But I, I do have some concern that that would not be, in my view, a proper sole criterion. You know, maybe, maybe that's one. But we also heard, you know, board member Primus kind of continue to talk about impact on shippers business and economic, right. which, you know, maybe other ways to look at what are the impacts of poor service that may not require that type of comparison. And then we've heard about downstream impacts on supply chain. So I right. think there's a lot of interesting ideas, you know, kind of coming out through this dialogue that, you know, we could we could think about. I'm not here today. I'm not talking to my right. clients about what they agree to, you know, what have you. I, I'm really glad to hear you say that. I'm yeah, tremendously glad to hear you say that. I'm also, you know, I, it caught my attention as well. I was also heartened to hear from AR. I think Mr. Horowitz at the end of his presentation talked about shifting burden, right? And the, the stuff that the railroads are better positioned to provide and to offer um, and whether or not that could reduce complexity for shippers. I think in the PERFBA dialogue, we had, you know, um, you know, Herman had, the, I think, the, the really good idea um, about whether or not there were there would be extant data that could also reduce the burden for shippers. And I, and I heard, you know, uh, notes from, from both BN and UP about trying to think about complexity and, and ways to find solutions for that. So even though, you know, I think people have taken tough positions at times, I actually do think that we are, we are circling around some ideas. And so the, the fact that there may be some openness among the shipper community and taking a look at conduct and not, not just circumstances, um, you know, and then the, the, can, we, can we capture conduct in a less administratively complex way, um, you know, and just working through that a little bit, I agree with you, it, it, that, that is a tough issue to tackle because, you know, do you compare just with yourself? All the reasons you mentioned, do you compare just with yourself? What, what about, you know, degradation in service, you know, uh, what, you know, um, you know, what, you know, does it have to be controlled for commodity? You know, I think there was an idea yesterday about, well, you have to do rate adjusted service, right? And you can imagine complexity starting to pile up. So, you know, we've got a lot of smart people testifying today. We had a lot of smart people testifying yesterday, a lot, a lot of expert people who are well positioned to think about what true matters <laughs> um, for differentiating uh, different service products. And, and I would just encourage everybody to, to, you know, to, to continue uh, to think about that. Is there a way we can build in conduct and build in competitive circumstance uh, in a way that we can actually uh, adjudicate cases in, a, in an expeditious manner? So, yeah, so no, Absolutely. Now we're, you know, I'm here reacting to the dialogue and, and your questions. And um, I am not here to say, obviously, that our clients, you know, agree to that, that the statute requires that or anything like that. But obviously, we are listening to the dialogue. We are thinking about these issues which everybody should be doing uh, as, as they're being discussed. Um, and, and that's, you know, sort of what I'm giving you here, which is an off the cuff uh, Totally, uh, I, I hear you and greatly appreciate the engagement. Yeah. You know what, well, I'd like to, I just want to add a, a brief comment before we go to the next question uh, on what Karen said. Uh, I, I have been focused and I'm gonna to continue to focus on the physical logistics of accomplishing these goals. And the statute is debatable. It's like almost all the statutes we deal with, uh, leave something to be desired. I, I think it would be most productive on trying to figure out what is the best physical solution, if I could just use a too simplistic wor word, to provide competition, to minimize any impact on the network if there is any mm -hmm. negative impact. And once, if we can come up with physical ideas that work or tests of what you and Patrick were discussing, which make good sense, then the lawyers could put their books out, you know, to work and see if we could figure out, yep. is this something that is allowed and permitted and authorized by the statute? Yeah, and I, I think but you're very much touching on feasibility. And yeah. And I think Jeff Marino <clears throat> probably described best in terms of what, what we still continue to believe is an operational um, solution. You know, we talked about the local trains and the road trains and right. whatnot, but, and, and, you know, more thought should be given to that. I'd love to hear more railroad input uh, around that. Um, we, we think, you know, those trains are already operating and running, those yards are there. You know, there may be these, you know, 
small delays that some shippers clearly are willing to accept. But but I I mean again, our view is that the you know the impacts uh, are are a bit overblown. But but that would also be able to be fleshed out in the context of of a case if if some area some particular request had more complexity uh, than than others. Yeah, all all I, all I meant to suggest was that if you start the discussion with the lawyers, you will end up with a more <laughs> limited amount of creativity. Uh, and I would also add, Marty, that if you if if we leave too much to a particular case, where we find ourselves sort of somewhat in a straitjacket to the facts of that circumstance as well, which I think you actually see evidence of in the mid tech decision, which I think yeah, we can. No, uh, I, I agree with both points. My goal for the moment is to have the most creative thinking brought to bear to the problem um, uh, because it's a, you know, as we are learning and have learned, it's a complex problem. I think Michelle has been patiently waiting to get a question in, in, in Robert. Thanks, Marty. And, and Bobby, thanks for your testimony uh, this morning. Um, I think you mentioned that the majority of your members are actually captive shippers. So I wanted to ask you, um, to, to what extent are you in favor of reciprocal switching because it would lead to lower rates or, or are you in favor of reciprocal switching because it would lead to better service or, or perhaps is it for, for both reasons? I would say it's for both reasons. I think competition naturally brings out the best amongst us all in, in providing better service and better, better pricing. Um, the example I, I, I shared with our rate um, renewal process this year, to get a 10% proposed rate increase across all your destinations, it was, it, it was really, uh, uh, it's not logical to think about how that's justified, except without uh, competition. So we would, we would hope to get better, better service as well as better rates, which, uh, you know, happens in all those industries where there's competition. Thank you. Robert? Um, I'm sorry, Michelle. Michelle. Can, I, can I just make one quick point to Michelle's question? Because I, I think, you know, we have heard a lot that it's both, but but I think one of the other really important elements around competition that I know our clients talk about is getting better leverage in contract negotiations, right? Right. The contracts today are so one-sided. You're, you're hearing an example here of that's just the rate level, but there's more to contracts than just the rate. And some of these service issues historically used to be able to be addressed in contracts when there's a little bit more equal bargaining power. You can have service terms in your contracts. You don't have to go running to the board because you've negotiated cycle times. You've neg I mean, the shipper today may have to give a minimum volume commitment, which the railroad demands. They want that certainty, understandably. But they, the shipper doesn't get anything in return in most cases. Maybe where you have competition, you can get it. But you're not getting any reciprocal commitment and service for the volumes you're committing. So some of this is also about, again, broader benefits beyond you know, just the rate, just the service at this one location. But doesn't competition bring benefits to the commercial relationship that limits the need to run to the board for regulatory assistance because you actually have competition that leads to more reasonable contract terms. So I, I just wanted to get that uh, point out. No, that was very helpful, Karen. Thanks, thanks so much. Thanks, Karen. Uh, Robert? Yeah, I appreciate that, Marty. And Bobby, thanks again for uh, hanging on for us. I know everybody probably needs a break, so I'll be very, very... Uh, <laughs> You mentioned that uh, you just saw a rate increase at one of your facilities um, that was having a lot of service problems, 10% uh, increase. Uh, was that was that at a captive location? Yes, sir. Uh, did you see uh, any other uh, rate increases to that level at any of your other plants that that are dual served or or? or uh, uh, so, so the, the problem there is I only have one that's dual served and that one that's dual served really doesn't use rail that much because they're on, that's the Chattanooga facility that's also on the water and water rail barges, just much more competitive. So I, I can't, I can't say that. Um, really the, the thing we used in 
fighting back or pushing back on that 10% increase was a little bit playing with their uh, emotions uh, and understanding that we, we miss service. Uh, we miss switches all the time. We miss service uh, all the time. We had to con- we have to continue buying more rail cars. So we have to buy the rail cars in which we're going to move our product. So there's the capex requirement, um, and and like I said, where we can, we say fine. We're adding more trucks uh, because we because that is the competition. But uh, it's so I I try to I try to use all the different. Uh, tools in negotiating uh, and do the best we can. But, you know, the result was still a, a big increase and it's a big increase every year. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, Bobby, I, I wanted to get back to this question of trucks, which you mentioned at the outset. I take it that in some of your areas, your locations, you are using truck where you would prefer to use rail, but yes, you're not, not getting the right price or the right service. That's correct. Right. Can you quantify that? Um, well, that that argument really only works where a truck can uh, go out and come back that same day. These truck drivers are locally based, so they'll go to Birmingham. They can come back. They can't really drive all the way to Tuscaloosa and back to Atlanta because of traffic and wait times at steel mills. So if it's within that 150 miles of from our location to the mill destination, it works. So our rates are best from Atlanta to Birmingham versus how they are to further out steel mills. Um, the same thing, our Savannah facility, um, the Nucor mill in Ber- Nucor Berkeley, which is just north of Charleston, that is about 120 miles from Savannah. So in that instance, the, the first rates that we got from the railroad when we started that facility were sky high. And, and, uh, and we use trucks and we use trucks for years. And then in, in, you know, in meetings we have with the railroad that they'd say, well, what, what opportunities do you have? Say, well, we're running a heck of a lot of trucks every day down the road between Savannah and, and uh, Berkeley. If you would give us a rate, We'd love to go to rail. Rail is easier for us loading, you know, it's the equivalent of four, four truckloads and we can load it right in our, so we, we love rail. And so they would probably go back and think about it and they'd come back and, you know, but eventually uh, because they knew they weren't getting that business, they would lower that rate. But that's the only time we get that oh. sort of, well, let me, I'd like to sort of sort this out for a moment. Um, you indicate it makes sense that if you only got four miles between your yard and the, and the mill, you're not going to use train. What is the distance where it makes more sense to use train than truck? Is it 120 or is it something less than that? I would say if the... It's much easier loading a rail car than a truck. And so uh, I don't have any mills. Uh, the closest one here, the only one in Georgia is, is the Gerdau mill in Cartersville and it's CSX. So we don't ship there because like I told you, if, if, we, had, if we had interchange, we would ship to Cartersville by rail. But their CSX served in most of all my shredders are all on NS. The, so the only yards that I have on CSX are two little small yards. They really don't do much business. So the, the bulk of our, I'd say 98% of our rail costs or the, the money we spend on rail is in us here in Georgia. Well, so well, to answer your question, yeah. if, if there was a steel mill 30 miles away, I'd rather ship by rail. Oh, so even a short distance like that. Yes. Well, the one you just did, mentioned where you're on NS, but the mill is served by CSX, you can't get an interchange rate or whatever they call that? We can, but with, with both, of those, both of those hands, in other words, NS and CSX both want to make something, it's cheaper to go by truck. If it was NS direct, I believe that they would, uh, or if I had the ability to go to CSX and say, give me a rate picked up in East Point to go to Cartersville, 
I believe that they would sharpen their pencils and say, what's the competition? The competition is truck. And we could get that many, four more trucks off the, off the road. But right now, you still have situations where you could go by rail, but the truck is cheaper. So rail's not meeting the market. Is that right? In some in, locations? In, in the instance, what we were talking about, like to go to Cartersville, the rail rate is high because you have both railroads want to make some minimum amount of money or they're not willing to entertain it. And well, because it's not, because they can't be, um, because there's two people involved in that negotiation or three people involved in that negotiation, they're not going to put the effort into working on saying, hey, CSX, lower your rate to, you know, 300 bucks. We'll lower our rate to 300 bucks so that we can get SA's business and we can, and we can do that. So they, they, there's not enough incentive there, I don't believe, for them to, to get together. What, I, what I'm trying to understand, though, Bobby, is it cur at currently, are you shipping scrap by truck that you would prefer and is feasible to ship by rail? Yes. That's, and what's, so in those situations, the railroads are not meeting the competition. They're saying, go ahead and use truck. I take yes, it. Sir. Yes, sir. And can you quantify how much of your business is on truck um, that you would prefer to be on rail? Well, before 2017, we didn't use many trucks at all to go to steel mills. And so I, I bet, I don't know, I, I believe it's probably 20% of our volume right now is going by truck. And I would love 100% of it to go by rail. So- well, you can't do 100% because you've got one mill that's four miles away. Right. I'm sorry. So, I'm sorry. When I answered your question, I was talking about my Georgia region, and yeah. that, that yard in Decatur is in the yeah. Alabama region. Right. So, I was, I was really answering you for my Georgia-based. All right. Can you give me the numbers for your, for your entire company? You said 20% in Georgia is on truck that ought to be on rail, in your view. What is it company wide? Would you say? Um, I have less uh, visibility as to what goes on on the West Coast, so I could I, I think okay. I could answer you more east of the Mississippi, and I think uh, it's it's probably about that same percentage. It's probably okay. it's probably about twenty percent. And, and what can you approximate? What number of trucks is that for, that are on the highway that ought to be on the railroad? On a yearly basis, for example? Um, I think we have just in Georgia, probably uh, 30 trucks a day. And I think Alabama has probably a similar amount. You know, it's, it's probably 75, 80 trucks a day, every single day or 20, 23 days a month. So, so you're talking about uh, 60, you know, 25,000 a year. I'm yeah. To drive a decimal around. 23 place. times 12. Yeah, 22,000 ish a year truckloads. So, you know, we keep hearing from the railroads that their goal is the same as my stated goal, I think the board stated goal, and that is to get as much rail freight off the highways and onto rail. At least for those 20,000 truckloads, you're not seeing the effort. Is that a fair statement? Yes, sir. And it's kind of a dilemma, it seems to me, from the way the legal system is set up, <coughs> whether it's a particularly in the rate area, because you know we're mandated to look at a market dominant standard, which, which, you know, as I understand it, means an area where there isn't enough competition to control freight rates. Now, maybe you're in a market dominant if the trucking option isn't enough to control freight rates, but you do have truck as an option, and that usually undermines your ability perhaps to get some kind of relief, at least many shippers would view it that way. But yet, as a matter of public policy, it puts more, the fact that you have trucks at an option puts more trucks on the highway, uh, which is, seems to me, counter good public policy. Well, Marty, 
And your just one more question I had, Patrick. In your particular commodity, Bobby, isn't it also the case that the your customers would much prefer to get the scrap on a train than on trucks? Yes, sir. Absolutely. Steel mills, they don't they don't want trucks. Uh, they've they've only added more uh, ability to receive by truck because of the congestion and service problems they've had with railroads. So they would prefer to have scrap uh, come in in a rail car. A lot of times they can use those rail cars to bring that scrap right up towards the melt shop where they can unload and put into the into the charging buckets. So there's and in many yards, uh, they end up taking that what that which comes in by truck and then reload it in a rail car to get it up closer to where the melt shop is. Uh, vast, vast, major, yeah, vast majority of steel mills would rather have it in a rail car. Well, you know, uh, the railroads have tried to school us in the world of efficiency, and I guess they have a different definition of efficiency than I learned in my English class, but we'll deal with that when we talk to the railroads. Patrick, you had a question. Well, Marty, I, I, if I could make a remark on, on your yeah. observation, because it's a topic you and I have talked about a lot, and I think we share... Um, you know, the general perspective of, of moving things to rail can do uh, good things for congestion, environment, infrastructure, wear and tear, et cetera. Um, I, I do have to, to note that um, while that's an important public policy consideration generally, um, you know, it is not the only public policy consideration, particularly not in the things that we regulate. You know, in, in my view, uh, our regulations are, are, are mostly designed to address competitive problems as opposed to modal shifts. You know, for example, you know, we don't have a rate case system that just brings anybody who has market dominance down to a 180 RVC. We are not discussing a switch fee that would one, be $1, you know, which would surely, you know, and, and, and so, you know, to the extent that we want things to move by rail, there's, there's a difference between addressing competitive situations that stop things from going on rail versus sort of artificially subsidizing rail transportation, which I don't understand, which I don't understand, by the way, Bobby, to be advocating in the, in the no, slide. I, I don't either. I hear no. Bobby's advocacy about, about where competitive circumstances might not be as good as they, they could be. And that's what's preventing it. So that's the only thing I want to mention is I think if we're just focused on moving things from the highway to the rail, I think we would lose other important public policy considerations. And I don't mean to suggest, Marty, that you, that you disagree with that notion. I just thought it was important to preserve for the record. No, I don't. But I think I'm making an observation that perhaps is above the pay grade of the STB board members. And that is that when the laws involving uh, rate regulation and uh, market dominance and so forth were written decades ago, the world wasn't on the edge of a climate disaster. And so certain public policies perhaps should be elevated to a higher level of precedence than they might have been when we were just looking at economics. But that is a discussion for another day. Yeah, it know. is. And I might, might, might say that that's, you know, there are infrastructure projects for on-dock rail and other things that might yeah. be coming in, in the future that, that would advance that goal. I think, as you know, and perhaps other observers know, uh, I have chosen to exercise my discretion as a board member to push the envelope on supporting cl climate change issues and as it's arisen in other cases. And that's really all, all I'm raising. But it is, it is frustrating in this proceeding and in our rate proceedings to hear of a shipper like uh, SA Recycling that's got a commodity that he would prefer to put in a rail car, that his customer would prefer to get in a rail car, that there's a train that goes from here to there. And the railroad says, you know, I, I don't think, Bobby, let me just a ask this question. And you may not know the answer, but you're not asking the railroads to give you a, a rate to match the trucks that would cause them to operate your traffic at a loss, are, are you, as you understand it? No, no, I'm not. So it's just a question of how much yeah. profit. Isn't this boiled down to whether your traffic, the rate that you could pay, provides them with the same OR that Wall Street is demanding as compared to some other commodity. Isn't that really what this boils down to? Yes, sir. So that, that to me is an area that we could perhaps can appropriately address perhaps in another form with a different rulemaking, but it is a frustration of mine. I've expressed it frequently.
And I think there are some Wall Street observers listening to these hearings. And I hope when they write about the issues that have come out, they'll include that one. And, and I think the listener who I'm talking to knows who I'm talking to. Uh, are there any other questions for Poppy? All right, well, this has been uh, extraordinarily productive, Bobby. Thank you uh, uh, very much. And uh, full disclosure, I think everybody knows it now. I grew up in this, related to the scrap business. My father was the publisher of the trade magazine for the scrap industry, which was actually bought by the predecessor of Israel when my father passed away. Uh, I have never been in the scrap business and I was never in the publishing business. I fled to go into the law, <laughs> but uh, uh, I grew up knowing a lot of scrap dealers. So, uh, but it has not affected my votes on this board, but uh, it is fair disclosure to make. Uh, if there are no more questions, uh, we have been going uh, quite a long time. I think we need a, to take a break. I, I don't know if it's 1210. Should we make this a lunch break or should we take just a short break? Uh, we'll hear Chuck Baker and then take a lunch break. Does that make sense to the board members or what's your preference? Speak, I think in order to we move- already, I, you know, co cognizant that we have three panels left. If we took the lunch break now and maybe work through the next two panels, that might that might save the most time. But I, I don't want to, listen, I'm, I'm not, you know, there are, there are people that are doing more, more rigorous work than me here, so. You know, and I'm, I'm uh, cognizant of uh, people of my age group needing to get up and walk around more often. So let's take a 10 minute break now. Come back at 1220. We'll hear from Chuck. Chuck, you'll be incentivized not to make board members hungry by not talking too long. And when you're done, we'll take a lunch break. That's good. All right. See you all at 1220.
All right, welcome back, everybody. Apologize, I'm two minutes late. Chairman's prerogative within the Metro on time standards. Okay, uh, Chuck, are you ready? Yes, sir. You are on, you are so important that you are on a panel unto yourself. <laughs> well, well, I would actually say that the short lines are on a panel by ourselves. I do have two folks with me, uh, Chairman Clawson from the association and Dr. David Clark from University of Tennessee. So hopefully you all have room for all three of us before Yes. Before lunch, but if not, we're happy to wait till after lunch also to finish. Well, I do see those people on the list. I didn't mean to shortchange them, but uh, uh, certainly the short lines deserve their own day in the sun. So proceed. Well, well we are flattered. Uh, and good morning, Chairman Overman. Uh, I should say good afternoon here, but still good morning to you, Vice Chair Schultz and members of Books. Headland and Primus. My name is Chuck Baker and I'm the president of the American Short Line and Regional Railroad Association. The Short Line Association represents almost all of the 600 class two and three railroads in the United States. We like to say that as an industry, short lines punch above their weight. Although the typical short line employs only about 30 people, serves about 18 shippers and hauls freight about 50 miles for those shippers, we have an outsized impact, particularly in small town and rural America getting our customers' goods to market. In total, we operate nearly 30% of the nation's route miles in 49 states, touch one in five cars on the network, and in several states operate the entire freight rail network. In the communities where we do business, we are job creators and economic drivers. For each job on a short line, 2.6 jobs are indirectly supported. Nationally, just north of one half of 1% of all business inputs rely on transportation services provided by the short line industry, amounting to 478,000 jobs, $26 billion in labor income, and $56 billion in economic value added. We take that responsibility seriously and do not take our critical role for granted. Short lines are small businesses with limited resources, but with relatively large private investment needs. We typically invest about 25 to 33% of our revenues each year back into our infrastructure and have spent decades rehabbing light density lines that were generally, generally neglected and frequently headed for abandonment under past ownership. We are the critical first and last mile for more than 10,000 customers. And those customers know us as partners who will fight for each and every carload or even scrap and claw for each and every carload as Al Pacino would say, member folks. Uh, creating opportunity where there was none before for any customer or any potential customer on the line. Today, I'm appearing before you to reiterate our opposition to regulations that we fear would make freight railroading less efficient, routing more complex, and decrease infrastructure investment into the rail network. At a time when the public has seen the need for a supply chain that is more sustainable, more resilient, and more fluid, we question whether forced reciprocal switching will help railroads meet those challenges. While short lines often consider themselves shipper representatives, and we certainly have our share of frustrations with our class one railroad, railroad partners, and we can even see where the desire for this rule came from, we do see this rule as counterproductive and likely to cause more harm than good. We believe that the existing suite of STB remedies is sufficient to handle problematic cases and that the current balanced regulatory structure has resulted in the world's premier freight rail network. Over the years, the Short Line Association has provided comments in dockets EP705, 711, and 711 sub 1. We have submitted extensive written comments, testimony, and evidence demonstrating why forced reciprocal switching and other similar proposals were contrary to the public interest. In particular, we showed that Short Line Railroads already face extensive competition. We already go above and beyond to do right by our customers. We have unique and fragile economics that would be put at risk if they were subject to a forced reciprocal switching rule and that forced reciprocal switching that would apply to short line traffic is unnecessary and unwarranted. The STB's proposed rule unnecessarily puts the nation's efficient rail ne network at risk and threatens to cause further supply chain disruptions. An inefficient route due to an extra switch would not just impact the shipper who has requested that switch it would impact all other shippers using the line. It may reduce throughput on a line, unnecessarily tie up inventory already in short supply, such as boxcars and locomotives, 
and increase the potential for incidents and injuries with the addition of more switches and car handling, which are two of the industry's most common areas of accident and incident risk. This significant change in regulatory policy could drive deteriorating service for customers, force freight off the rail network and onto the highways, and result in negative public impacts in the form of increased road congestion, decreased safety, and harm to the environment. All of these unintended adverse effects could lead to diminished capital investments in the freight rail network and risk progress towards an integrated, resilient, safe, and ever more environmentally friendly freight rail network ready to handle the ever-increasing demands of our growing country. In short, it seems a lot to risk for the near-term benefit of a small number of specific shippers in particular cases. However, should the STB move forward with a reciprocal switching rule, we ask that you continue to exclude short lines expressly and specifically from the regulations. We recognize that the existing NPRM intends to exclude short lines, as did the original NIT League petition the rule was based on, but we do have three small wording suggestions to, to help the rule fully meet its intent. I'll speak to those changes in just a moment, and they're also included, of course, in our written comments. Before I note those small wording changes, I'd like to speak to the basic economics of short lines for a brief moment, and Dr. Clark, who will be speaking right after me, will cover this in greater detail too, although also briefly due to lunch, of course. Given the economics of a typical short line, that short line status as a viable entity would be put at risk if a forced reciprocal switch were to significantly impact its revenue from a major customer. Compared to larger railroad carriers, short lines have shorter lengths of haul, higher fixed costs, and larger capital needs for infrastructure investment, including the task of upgrading bridges and track to handle modern, heavier 286,000 pound rail cars. Short lines provide high touch, customized service to a comparatively small number of customers while facing pervasive competition from trucks, barges, and transloading operations for their freight traffic due to their typically short lengths of haul. While a large carrier could at least potentially absorb a small reduction or relatively small reduction in overall re revenues due to mandated reciprocal switching, it would be a far different matter for a short line. On an average short line, just three customers account for two thirds of the rail traffic shift. Thus, the loss of a significant portion of the revenues from even a single shipper could have a meaningfully adverse effect on the financial, financial viability of a short line given the high infrastructure and fixed costs that must be supported by those revenues. And a decrease in revenue from a key customer on a short line would have a multiplier effect. The other small shippers utilizing the line would be negatively impacted if the short line were no longer able to provide service to them at rates that make the shipper competitive. Even worse, if the line had to be closed and the shipper was forced to find alternate transportation or relocate. For the short line industry in total, that number of shippers is in the thousands. The stated purpose of this rule is to help shippers, but including short lines in the regulations would put those shippers, those thousands of shippers in harm's way. Short lines are particularly important in rural and small town America as job creators and economic drivers. As I noted at the beginning, one short line job supports 2.6 other jobs in the community and companies locate where rail exists as a transportation option. So if a short line were to fail, it would have far reaching adverse effects on the vulnerable communities they serve and those 478,000 jobs in industries that are dependent on short line service. Short lines are known for their responsive and customer focused service. They fight to win every customer and work even harder to keep the ones they already have by ensuring that they are providing service that will enable their customer's success. Short lines grow their business painstakingly over decades, one customer and one carload at a time. If they need to provide an extra switch on a Sunday morning, they'll do it. They'll provide industry track maintenance. They're constantly on hand to resolve issues for their customers. They partner with their customers on state and federal infrastructure grants. They get creative on car supply. They'll find an extra place on the system for storage. Whatever it takes to get their customers, whatever it takes to serve their customers and get to yes, they'll do it. Shortline customers tell me regularly that they could not be successful without their shortline connections. In our written comments, you will see multiple verified statements from shippers underscoring and confirming their partnership and backing up the shortline association position. As I mentioned, and as shown in our written comments, if the STB does proceed with this rule, we are proposing to add three words to the text that would clarify the exclusion of short lines in the current NPRM. 
which we believe would be consistent with the STB's intent and also with the intent of the NIT League petition. When language is used that references customer facilities that are served by class ones, it should say that the facilities are served directly, physically, and exclusively by class ones. As the proposed rule is currently written, while the plain English language would seem to mean that the facilities of the shippers or receiver in question must be served by a class one rail carrier to access this proposed rule, the rule is not necessarily sensitive to the nuances in the accounting and billing practices in use between short lines and class ones and could leave some room for doubt. For example, in many cases, short lines provide the first or last miles of service, but do not appear on the way bill and may not be the entity sending the invoice to the customer. So upon examination of the way bill and the invoice, it could appear that a customer facility is served by a class one, even though it's actually served by a short line. And in addition, there are some circumstances where one facility is served by both a class one and a short line. And even though that's obviously a facility that is served by a class one, it doesn't seem to be a facility that the rule would intend to put within this reciprocal switching regime. So adding the words directly, physically, and exclusively would clarify those situations and keep with the STB's intent. I thank you for your time, and I'm happy to answer any questions either before or after Dr. Clark and Chairman Clausen testify. Thanks, Chuck. Let's keep rolling. Great. Uh, Dr. Clark. I'm here. Thank you, Chairman Overman and, and other members of the board for this opportunity to speak for you. I'm going to give you the Cliff Notes version of my written testimony, um, which covers this in more detail. And I'm going to try not to overlap too much with what um, Chuck just said. He covered a number of points that I would also raise, and I, I don't want to waste everybody's time. It's bad to stand between you and lunch. Um, just as an introduction, my name is David Clark and I've been active in rail research education engineering now for over 40 years. I retired from full-time employment at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville at the end of 2020. And from 2008 till, till, till 2020, I was director of the uh, Center for Transportation Research at the university, which is one of the nation's oldest academic research centers focusing on transportation. In preparing my testimony, I was asked to address the following questions. How do class two and class three railroads, which I'll term small railroads, uh, differ from class one railroads? And how might the mandated reciprocal switching uh, regulations adversely affect small railroads? So we have seven you know, large class one freight railroads and there's more than 600 smaller class two and class three railroads as Chuck indicated. And we've used the term railroad fairly loosely uh, this morning in, in the testimony I've heard as if all railroads were equal were the same and, and they're certainly not. Class one railroads operate complex networks that cover large geographic areas and they serve thousands of shipping points. They, they provide line haul services covering hundreds and even thousands of miles. Small railroads in comparison are very limited in geographic scope. On average, they operate uh, 108 route miles, but the median of 47 route miles better characterizes a, a representative property. Sorry. The uh, class one railroads provide a long distance movement for most traffic handled by small railroads. And so small railroads are very dependent on that service. The national rail carload length of haul is uh, 1,021 miles in 2016. And uh, small railroads had an average and median haul lengths of just 38 and 24 miles respectively. So even a small railroad handles the shipment at most. Turned off my cell phone, but not the main phone. So small railroads um, depend on the, the class ones for the majority of the length of haul. Even if a small railroad handles its, its shipment at both origin and destination, you're still relying on the class one railroad for most of the movement. So that makes the small railroads heavily oriented towards last mile pickup and delivery. And 81% uh, of car loads actually handled by small railroads are originated or terminated. So this, this is obviously the majority of their traffic. 
And whether it's a class one railroad or a, or a small railroad that performs these pickup and delivery functions, they have very high unit costs associated with them in comparison to the line haul portion of the move. The long haul uh, that the class one railroads enjoy helps them greatly to offset these costs, but small railroads don't have that, uh, that luxury. So on the whole, small railroads have low traffic densities in comparison to class one railroads. The class ones average nearly 17 million revenue tons per route mile. By comparison, small railroads average about 620,000 revenue tons per route mile, and that's only just a little under 4% of the class one statistic. So this has important implications for small railroad economics. In 2016, the median average revenue per route mile for small railroads was $97,000 versus $508,000 per route mile for the class ones. And, you know, as, as, as Chuck mentioned, the, you know, small railroads typically have, uh, you know, a very small traffic base with a limited geographic area. It can't be very diversified. And you typically have an average of about 18 customers and a median of about 11 customers per railroad with three customers typically accounting for over two thirds of the car loads. So loss of revenue from even a single major customer can severely affect the financial condition of a small railroad. Now, again, we talked about the limited commodity mix. Um, a single commodity is usually about half of a, a typical small railroads revenue car loads. So because of the commodities moved and the, and the limited uh, quantities handled and the short mileage, small railroads compete vigorously with other modes, uh, particularly motor carriers uh, and, and barge and, and transload um, are also uh, in the mix. So 35% of small railroad car loads are products of manufacturing processes, which are highly susceptible to competition, particularly from trucks. And that could be either for the entire rail movement, cutting out the class ones as well as the, as, as the small railroads, or it could be for the small railroad portion of the move. Bulk traffic handled by some small railroads is also susceptible to truck uh, diversion, especially to a, a transload facility. So with all of these, uh, these factors, limited territories, low traffic densities, very switching intensive operations, small railroads don't have the economies of scale that characterize class one operations, and they have very high portion of fixed costs on each shipment. Chuck mentioned about the creation of, uh, of many small railroads post staggers from rail lines that the class ones no longer uh, were interested in, in operating. And so, uh, you know, they these railroads face the burden of, of dealing with degraded and obsolete infrastructure and a, a very eroded uh, traffic base. Over one third of small railroad route miles still can't handle the 286,000 pound rail car that typifies um, what shippers want today. And small railroads have to generate capital to, uh, to obtain their property, address deferred maintenance, modernize infrastructure. Uh, and those high fixed costs from those activities have to be spread across the units of traffic handled. And that's in addition to maintenance, crew labor, and other administrative costs that are also relatively fixed for a given range of traffic. So the small railroad really faces a threat when they lose a portion of the revenue that they are currently earning. And, uh, you know, it faces, they face the risk of not going to be able to cover either their fixed or their variable costs to the degree necessary to, to sustain the operation in the long term. Um, so in my written testimony, there are numerous examples of the differences between the economics of the class one railroads and the small railroads. And it's just important to recognize that um, given competitive pressures, raising prices to provide or make up uh, lost revenue is a very risky strategy for a small railroad company. So in looking at reciprocal switching, and, and I know that the rule doesn't, uh, as it's written, uh, apply to small railroads. And while I question whether it's even, you know, necessary for class ones, I, I agree with Chuck that small railroads should certainly be excluded. They're really incumbent carriers only in hauling traffic a relatively short distance to a class one interchange 
And so your effective competition has to be between the class one railroads that provide the majority of the line haul. Looking at 692 small railroad operations and operations here are more than the number of companies because some companies have disconnected segments. 47% connect only to a single class one railroad. So they have no ability to influence a competition at all. And 53% have access to multiple class one railroads, which small railroads consider to be highly desirable on, you know, as it benefits their customers. So, you know, mandatory reciprocal switching really doesn't make a whole lot of, of sense when you're dealing with this segment of the railroad industry. Um, you know, competition is intended to lower shipper charges. That's a good, obviously a good, good benefit. But with shipment revenue arrangements for small railroads, um, many receive a, either a flat fee or a portion of the class one revenue. And if the status quo is upset by reciprocal switching, the small railroad faces a, a severe pressure to reduce its revenue share, and that, that risks the economics of, of the small railroad. Furthermore, the, the, the larger customers of the small railroad will be the ones that most attract a larger railroad's interest if there is some sort of reciprocal switching arrangement. And given the dependence on major customers, a small uh, loss of revenue can cause significant financial stress or a loss of revenue from one large customer. So, um, what we ultimately don't want to see, given that many of these companies lack deep capital reserves, um, is for them to suffer financial stress that would affect their capital investment and their expenditures for, for maintenance and operations. So I agree that any revision to these rules, if, if they're put forth, should exclude class two and class three railroads because they operate in a completely different economic realm than the class one railroads um, that the rulemaking addresses. And, uh, you know, ultimately, if, if revenue is lost to a small railroad through this reciprocal switching arrangement, um, there is a much greater potential financial uh, impact on the small railroad than would be the case for a larger class one. Ultimately, it could even make some railroads be, become financially non-sustainable, and that would result in a loss of uh, rail service to all the customers on those railroads. And, and to conclude here, I mean, small railroads have to be highly sensitive to the needs of their customers. They operate in a completely different uh, universe than, than the class one railroads. They're highly incentivized to route traffic as their customers wish, and there's really no compelling reasons to include them in the, uh, in the proposed rules, but only really downsides to that segment of the industry. Thank you for the opportunity to speak, and I'll go ahead and yield my, my floor. Okay, yeah, should I begin? Okay. It, to Chairman, Chairman Overman and fellow board members, do you do you want to ask questions of either me or Dr. Clark, or you want us to just move straight to Chairman Chairman Doc here? Uh, why don't you go ahead with your next witness, Chuck, and then we'll have some questions. Okay, very good. Yeah. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. I greatly appreciate the opportunity to address the group. Uh, my name is Doc Clawson. I am Vice President of the Gulf and Ohio Railways and Chairman of the Board of the American Shortline and Regional Railroad Association. I've had the great fortune to be a second generation executive officer of a family run business that creates value every day for customers across the states of North Carolina, South Carolina, and Tennessee. Following a 10 year career as a diagnostic and interventional radiologist, I heeded the call for the horn of the railroad in 2006 and have been pleased to participate in an industry that is so vital to America's success. The GNO was established by my father in 1985 and is a holding company for five short line railroads and the Three Rivers Rambler excursion train. Our railroads operate on 230 miles of track using approximately 30 locomotives to haul freight for 64 industrial customers. With over 50 full and part time employees, GNO plays an important role in the local economies where we operate. Uh, the railroads handle over 30,000 freight cars annually, hauling freight that ranges from ethanol to wood products to steel to chemicals, and we interchange with both NS and CSX. 
Currently, I'm also serving as chairman of the board of the American Shortland and Regional Railroad Association, guiding the work of the organization along 500 other railroad members and nearly as many associate members who provide services to the short line industry. You've heard from my esteemed colleague, Chuck Baker, about the short line position on the proposed force reciprocal switching regulation under consideration today. And you've been briefed on the unique economics of short lines by Dr. David Clark. My hope is the testimony I provide today will further eliminate the illuminate the potential impact of short line railroads and turn our shippers, thousands of local economies and overall US freight rail system short, should the short lines be subject in any way to this regulation. Although the short lines were in business as early as the mid 1800s, the Staggers Act passed in 1980 is considered the genesis of the modern short line industry. The economic freedoms and regulatory flexibility embodied in that act allowed entrepreneurs to save light density branch lines rather than abandon them. The results were quite remarkable. From 8,000 miles of track in 1980, the short line industry today operates nearly 50,000 miles or about 30% of the national network in 49 states. And in several cases, short lines operate the entirety of a state's rail network. Moreover, the inflation adjusting cost to move by rail has declined 27% from pre staggers rates. The hallmarks of our short line industry are well known and a source of great focus and pride for us, a constant customer focus an entrepreneurial spirit, adaptability, resiliency, and an obsession with connecting our customers and communities to markets around the country and the world. As the first and last mile of the shipment, short lines provide flexibility and responsiveness to the unique needs of each customer, sometimes with significant private investment. Each customer is, critical to, is a critical partner to a short line, and the customer's successes drive ours, one customer and one car load at a time. By way of example, the Santa Teresa Southern Railroad in New Mexico has steadily built expertise in moving some unusual and complex loads, namely windmill blades for wind farms. One of their key customers, GE Renewables, had the opportunity to nearly double its production, but would need the capability of loading two full train loads at a time. Rather than risking production moving to another plant or blades moving via road, the Santa Teresa Railroad stepped up with investment dollars, partnering with GE to build out a dedicated train loading facility for GE, including 10,000 feet of track, a 10-acre staging and loading area, and a 4,000-foot roadway connected to a major county road. As a result, GE reduced its train loading time from three days to one and expects to ship a significant volume of wind turbine blades via rail in 2021. Total wind for the railroad, the customer, and the county all due, strong, all due to a strong partnership, shared investment in the long view. Short line success is driven by our size. Short lines relatively small size and entrepreneurial leadership allow us to quickly pivot to serve our customers. Examples abound in our industry. The impact of short lines on our local communities cannot be undervalued. Our role in connecting customers to markets drives the local economies, providing family supporting jobs beyond the railroad themselves. The presence of rail and community as an alternative transportation option and, one, and an environmentally friendly one at that drives growth within the company is willing to, to locate on rail served property. Paying close attention to the auto industry sales and production trends allowed the Ann Arbor Railroad of Michigan to entice Fiat Chrysler automobiles to locate a new distribution center for finished automobiles at an underutilized facility in Toledo, Ohio. Breaking ground in 2018 and beginning operations in time for the Jeep Gladiator launch in July of 2019, the facility supports Fiat's Toledo and Detroit assembly production with an 1,800 car throughput capacity per day, has created 102 new jobs and helped stabilize the local economy. Lake State Railway Company overcame the potential shutdown of several customer facilities in 2020 and pivoted attention to its transload business, bringing in nine new customers and growing carload volumes in the last two quarters of 2020. One of the products projects was restoration of an auto loading facility in Flint, Michigan, constructing a 44 car spot facility at a former Buick loading site and rehabilitating two miles of an out of service former main line, eliminating the need to move finished vehicles on the highway. The project brought approximately 20 new jobs to the area, not including jobs added by LRC's subcontractors and invested several million dollars in the area surrounding the facility, helping to bring back an area of town that had been vacated for decades. For large parts of rural and small town America, short line and regional railroads are the only direct connection to the national rail network. In my personal experience as a short line railroad operator with Gulf and Ohio Railways, there are many ways we work with customers to capture long-term viability from moving products to market in a price competitive manner. By way of example, the Atkin Valley Railroad is located in Western North Carolina. 
where flat land is certainly at a premium. The YVRR has three feed mills it serves, all of which were built on the available or relatively easily adaptable flat land in the area. As unit trains of grain increased in length, a point was reached wherein none of the three mills could handle a unit train of grain individually. Losing the economic benefits of unit train shipments would have put all three of the feed mills at a significant pricing disadvantage due to the increased shipping costs with any alternate method. Led by the Yadkin Valley Railroad, the three mills, the class one that serves the Yadkin Valley Railroad and the Yadkin Valley Railroad, a deal was constructed wherein the YVRR would manage the car supply and provide the service needed for the three mills to effectively shear unit trains and maintain the value of that pricing. This arrangement has been working well for at least eight years and has ensured that the grain produced in the heartland can reach the U.S. economy and beyond at a competitive price. I could, but won't. <laughs> spend literally all day sharing these types of examples across the nation's 600 shortline railroads. Our shippers have also weighed in. As part of its written testimony today, ASLRRA has submitted verified statements from several, several shortline customers. They too understand the criticality of shortline service to their success. Doug Flint, manager of the Sturgis, Michigan facility, the Atlantic Packaging Corporation, shared his perspective on the shortline serving his plant, the Michigan Southern Railroad. Michigan Southern works every day to ensure great service to us and to resolve any problems that may arise. In fact, I look at them as an extension of my workforce. Flint supports the ASL RRA position on reciprocal switching, stating, we urge the board to consider the interests of small railroad in this proceeding and at least exclude short line railroads from the proposed rule to assure that the critical railroad, the critical role played by small railroads like Michigan Southern in the transportation system is not harmed. In five, to wrap it up, in my humble opinion, force switching will not serve the public good. As illustrated provided by the testimony provided by Mr. Baker and Mr. Clark, it will con drive congestion of the delicately balanced trail network, create additional complexity, reduce the incentive to invest, and increase costs for everyone involved. The industry can address customer service issues successfully through other available avenues, through both purely private solutions and through existing STV mechanisms. If the board moves forward with its rulemaking, I hope I have shown today that applying forced reciprocal switching arrangements in any way to short lines, which is a segment of the industry that is already subject to unrelenting competitive forces, demonstrably focused on above and beyond customer service, and at fin significant financial risk if a customer is lost in the forced switch due to the simple economics of our operations, would have significant negative consequences. Uh, if, a swarf, if a forced reciprocal switching rule is adopted, I urge the board to adopt the clarifying text changes submitted by ASL RRA, making the rule applicable only in such instances where a customer is served directly, physically, and exclusively by class one railroads. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity uh, to address this board and uh, I'll open the yield my time for questions. Uh, thank you much, Doc Clawson. Uh, so Chuck, was that that's your presentation? Are you open for questions now? Yes, sir. All right. So I I, I have a few that I just like to clarify. Uh, I should start at the outset, by the way, that I always enjoy hearing about the entrepreneurial uh, ethic of the short line industry, and I wish that you could somehow sell some of that entrepreneurial enthusiasm to the class ones. Um, but you don't have to respond to that point. Here's, I want to sort out your, your concerns. So as I understand it, if we take a short line that has three or four shippers on it, you know, typical small short line, you're, you have several concerns. One concern is you don't want a, a class one to be able through reciprocal switching to take that customer away and serve them directly. That, that's one of your concerns, right? Well, the I way do, we I want to separate them out. I think you have several levels of concern. I'm going to make sure I understand each level. So let's just right. talk about that concern. Right. Uh, on that first one, I, I would say in theory, if that could happen, that would obviously be like an existential threat type concern. Okay. The, the way I understand the reciprocal switch rules is that wouldn't really be a likely outcome. That, that would be more if you were considering the broader suite of uh, access provisions like through routing and trackage rights. Uh, uh, all right. And, and I don't think anyone is suggesting that there is 
that that kind of approach is, was ever contemplated in this rule or that anybody's pushing for it. Secondly, what, what I'm a little confused about is that are there not situations where if there is a reciprocal switch, the short line is just moving the cars between the two class one railroads. It's not affecting the short line's own customers. Is, is that right? Well, the, the concern we have is okay. if you imagine a scenario and I'll name a couple of class ones here, but I hope they don't think I'm picking on them, but just so I'm not referring to generic railroad I'll, A and railroad I'll, I'll defend you. <laughs> um, for instance, if we move, a, if we move, if we move a train of steel coils 50 miles from the customer and hand it to CSX, and then CSX currently takes it another thousand miles to its final destination, and that whole route is $2,000. We, we are concerned that if that customer were able to say, we want CSX to stop 100 miles after they get it from the short line, and hand it off to NS, who will take it to the final customer instead, and because NS will do it for $1,500 instead of $2,000. We're concerned that right now we get, say, $200 out of the $2,000 move. Yeah. But if the move is now cheaper, that NS or any, any class one in that situation would come to us and say, hey, short line, we're now doing this move for $1,500 instead of $2,000. So you're going to need to give up a portion of your 200 because that's no longer feasible. So you need to do it for 150 or 125. And our contention is that short line economics are so fragile and so dependent on just a few customers that just that right there puts their viability at risk. Well, so let me ask you about that. Since you're the only railroad to be able to get those steel coils out of the customer's yard, why would you have to agree? Well, th that's a great question. So we would have two, we would have two challenges, right? If, if NS or any railroad, and again, I'm not picking on them, came to us and said, we need you to reduce the rate. And we just said, no, the, that, that's not being very cooperative with people who we like to cooperate with and work with. And that's not being helpful to the customer or our class one partners. And so if we said no, you know, that the one of the risks is, uh, well, now people can't agree on the rate, they can't agree on the switch fee, and they come to the STB, they come to you and, neg and negotiate it. And now we're spending time, we're spending time, resources and effort in a never ending series of legal proceedings that we don't, that we're not staffed to do. All right. So in the, the scenario you just outlined, how does the rule language you want to add to the rule protect you from that situation? Well, we're, we're suggesting, and we think it's just clarifying language that sort of clarifies the rule. We're suggesting that if traffic was served by a short line, that that traffic and that facility is just not part of this regime, is, is excluded from the rule, that this rule okay. should only affect uh, facilities. In other words... Yeah. You're, what you want the language to be clear is, is that the customer has to be directly served by a class one local. Correct. In order to be eligible at both ends, I, I assume. That's right. That's I right. Assume. That we just, you know, and again, we, we still don't think the overall rule is great, but my job is to represent uh, short lines. And uh, I, well, I want to get to the, that level. Well, well to, be, to be clear though, Marty, when you say at both ends, I understood, Chuck, and please correct me if I'm wrong. I understood your point to, to be at the relevant end for a switching case. Well, okay. Yes, I think, yes, that's the way I... That's yeah, I, I, that's, a, that's a better way to put it. I would say yeah. at, either, at either end. Either end, yeah. The, um, let, me, let me ask you this, uh, Chuck. Do you need a blanket exclusion to be protected? Or are, is it not possible that the economics of some reciprocal switching situations wouldn't put pressure on the short line to lower its rate for its share of the movement? Or do you think that's 100% gonna happen every time? Well, I mean, 
I, I want to be honest and say, I, obviously, there could be exceptions, but we would think in general, it would put untenable pressure on short lines. And we think, given the service level we provide to our customers and the economics, that it's a solution where the costs or the risks outweigh the benefits for anything touching short line. So we do think that a full exclusion is warranted. Do, do you understand the shipping organizations who advocated for this rule agree with your position on that or do they? Have well, to... you know, um, obviously I don't get to speak from them. They, they generally just completely don't reference short lines at all. Um, you know, obviously your previous speaker, um, Bobby, I'm blanking on his last name now. He, Bobby he Tree, about, yeah. Right. He talked about the short line, his short line service not being a problematic problematic area for them. I, I would say, you know, and again, at the risk of speaking for people who can very much speak for themselves, that it's fair to say that their concern is not with us. I, I can't say that they would be totally fine with a blanket short line exclusion or not. Do you do you have any uh have you been able to compile any data that would tell us uh, it's a subset of short line traffic and that is traffic that gets to del delivered to class ones that are could be eligible for a reciprocal switch? Do you have any idea the volume of such uh, traffic that would be excluded? Well, I mean, we're, we're suggesting that 100% of traffic delivered from short lines be excluded. Are you no, asking no. what percentage of overall short line traffic that is? No, of overall. I mean, of overall, of overall rail, class one yeah. railroad traffic? Yeah. Um, yeah, it, it's uh, in total, short lines are about one in every five cars on, on the network. Uh, it's a higher percentage of that for, you know, car load business and a lower percentage of that for intermodal. But Overall, we're about twenty percent of the of the cars. We and some percentage. I'm sorry. Just to, so so twenty percent of the traffic, if we accepted your approach, would before you even analyze whether there's a meets any other hurdles, would not be eligible for reciprocal switching. Roughly. That's right. Yeah, that, that's okay. that's exactly correct. Yeah. Right. I, I had a, a Patrick. Did you want to? I was just right on that point, Marty, which is the only reason why I want. To jump yeah. in, um, I think maybe the way to think about the percentage of traffic that would be excluded is if, if we consider that s some portion of short line traffic, you know, is already uh, uh, connecting to multiple carriers, whereas a lot of the class one traffic that's served, you know, they're, they're going to want to protect their line haul. So I think even just taking the percentage of traffic that is served by short lines perhaps overstates the exclusion. And when you actually look at the, you know, I think we just heard um, from Mr. Trish about, about how his three short line railroads, I, I, I think all three of them connected competitively. I think he indicated that. Um, so, so I just only point that out that the exclusion is pro probably in practice, in practical terms, smaller than that. Well, are, are you saying, uh, I think that's a good point. You're saying Chuck, the of that 20%, I guess following up on Patrick's point, some of that 20%, the short lines actually can deliver it to more than one class one already. So the customer has some competitive options. That's right. There are a fair number of short lines, you know, probably a little bit less than half that are dual served where uh, they already can, it, it can go to, either CSX and NS yeah. or BN or UP or whatever. And those customers, obviously the reciprocal switching would have never been relevant for them anyway. Yeah. I, I don't want to put you to a lot of extra work and I appreciate your experts. I don't want to deprive them of a living either, but it would be interesting to get a little bit of a breakdown on the data. If you, but you're, if we're looking at, at how many, car loads or how much volume of freight would not be eligible for any reciprocal switching if we accept your language. It really is le less in the sense that not all 20% is going to a sole served class one. So it'd be interesting to get even an approximation of a breakdown for our record. I think that would be helpful. 
Uh, we can do that. Uh, let, let me just ask you the then the broader question. I take it that aside from protecting the interests directly of short lines, which is what we've been talking about, you are echoing the overall objections of the class one world by saying, you don't think it's good for the network. If it's not good for the network, it's not good for the short line industry. Is that a fair yeah. summary? That is a very fair summary, yes. All right, so you're, and your concern is it's, you know, you were listening yesterday. I, I'm still struggling with the arguments that the short lines make about how complex these switches are We've all seen the, uh, I'm surprised we haven't seen it in this hearing. I was thinking of showing it myself. The AAR's uh, animated uh, video of 67 moves. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, ye yesterday uh, I got the distinct impression from UP that it's for most of these switches, it would be one different move. It would just be putting it on a sorting track that's going to the other railroad rather than on the sorting track that's staying with the host railroad. I mean, wh why is that going to congest the system, as you understand it? Well, I, I do think that the, the idea that you have floated a few times where if it were limited to just bringing a car to a yard where reciprocal switching to the other railroad in question is happening anyway, I, I do think that that would be more limited, you know, and be more along the lines of the way you're describing it, where it's just hey, you got to put it in this yard anyway, and it's one track instead of the other. But overall, the current rule as drafted is not limited in that way. And to me, it reads that there would be quite a few places where the railroad that has the line haul would otherwise be going point A to point B and now has to stop at some intermediate point and hand it off. And I do think the I know you didn't love the presentation yesterday, but I thought the idea of the um, the runners handing batons to each other made sense to me. And every time you introduce an extra touch or an extra switch or an extra handoff, th there's additional kind of choke points. Uh, I would say this, Chuck, if railroads were dropping baton batons the way they tried to sell it in that, that uh, Amit Bose would have a lot more work on his hands even than he does. But let me, <laughs> let me just... Uh, follow up here and then I'll, I'll hand it off. It, it, would it be fair to say if the approach the board chose to take was to limit the geography to shippers, uh, you know, who have, whose traffic is ex already taken to yards where existing reciprocal switching tariffs are in place, your overall objections would be, if not removed, lessened it, it's fair to say they would be lessened I, I would i'd be hesitant to speak for the class one kind of operational people who um who frankly know more about moving the cars than i do but they would be lessened that's fair yeah okay that's a fair fair statement that, that was really all i had uh, uh i appreciate it um uh the uh uh, Doc, I just want to say you're an example of a pre-COVID shift in career choice. You presage the huge move that the rest of the country is now doing. <laughs> it's very impressive. I, I wish I could claim that degree of omniscience. But uh... <laughs> other uh, other board members, Karen, you have your hand up. Uh, yes. Um... We've heard from the class ones that a switch can take, you know, 24, 48, 96 hours. When your members hand off trains to a class one railroad, uh, typically how long does that take? Well, th that's a fair question. There's 600 short lines and I, I struggle to give you a typical. There's times where it's seamless and, you know, like almost instantaneous, like a live handoff. And there's times where it sits for a week. Uh, so I would be inclined to, you know, and again, just trying to be honest here, we have plenty of frustrations with our class one friends, but I would be inclined to take them at their word that, you know, if they do an awful lot of switches and if they say that it takes an average of 24 to 48 hours, I, I really don't think that they came in front of the board and, and lied on that stat. Thank you. 
So I got, I got a quick question, Chuck. Um, yes, sir. Robert, go ahead. In the, uh, and I'll, I'll, again, I'll be brief. In the, in the year plus that I've been here, I've had an opportunity to talk to uh, a number of uh, uh, your membership. And, uh, you know, there's been a number, and I'm sure you're, you're quite aware of this, of um, frustration uh, at your membership at the fact that, uh, you know, being left at interchanges, waiting for switches, uh, sometimes so long that they've even got to replace crews. Uh, and and that, that has, that has uh, you know, played itself out again and again and again in terms of my conversations with, uh, a lot, with some of your members. And so, uh, you know, the question I'm asking is, you know, would it be, you know, the, the, even the idea of, uh, of, of, you know, what, what Marty is broaching reciprocal switching, even at the, the, the locations where, where it does occur, you know, wouldn't that stand to, to make even some of, you know, your members create a little better relationship between, uh, uh, you know, the customer and, and your members? Because I know that, you know, the frustration is there. Uh, within your membership that that it's hard to to go back and tell their customers that they've been waiting for four hours or six hours or even a day and 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 you know they haven't gotten that that service handoff so you know you know in in looking at it the totality of it I mean doesn't this wouldn't this actually create you know if there was more competition out there and and and, and greater ability to have better service and more reliability does that doesn't that bode well for, for, for you as well? Well, it, it's a fair question. And obviously I have my fair share of those same conversations that you have. And I, um, I hear plenty of, plenty about it. And I tried to be honest in the testimony that, you know, we do hear that there's plenty of frustrations out there between short lines and class ones. I, I would posit that that's probably always been the case. And it's, and it's sort of a natural friction in business, just like there's tension between, kind of name a customer and name the supplier or name you and your local restaurant. But to answer your question, uh, we, we, don't, we, we don't think that the reciprocal switching proposal in particular would help. There, there, are, there are frustrations and you know, I, would, I would suggest that there are existing remedies at the STB that people can consider. There's common carrier obligations, there's rate, rate relief cases, there's the existing reciprocal switching rule. And then there's lots of private conversations. And that's what most of our short lines do every day to try to work it out. It doesn't, it frankly doesn't always work, but I, I, at the end of the day, we come back to, we think the reciprocal switching rule has more downside than upside for us. Yeah, I, mean, I, I would just, just say this, that um, it, it has been going on for a while. I, I know that you would probably, and you may not, but uh, uh, you know, in the last several years, I probably five or six years, you probably see uh, seen your membership seen it increase. Uh, you know, PSR and other and other factors included. Um, and I guess all I'm saying is is I understand I and I do uh, um, you know you know agree that we have remedies at, at at our power right now to use it. But I think even you know uh, a portion of your membership as well has said that that even that has has not worked. And it's time to start looking at, at, at others. And all I'm saying is I hope that moving forward, we can continue to work with you and, and you'll be open-minded and your, your group will be open-minded to, to the suggestions that we have uh, to try to fix, fix some of these problems that, that even your membership has, has, uh, has uh, brought to our attention in, in, the, in the time that I've been on the board. Well, I can at least 100% promise to be open-minded and uh, continue to work with you. Appreciate that. Thanks, Chuck. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, Patrick. Already, I'm good. Thank you so much. Okay. Any other uh, questions for the short lines? Um, I have one. Uh, first, thank you for your testimony today. Uh, Chuck, you actually spoke to uh, safety concerns that this rule uh, might actually uh, increase accidents. And Administrator Bose. Uh, spoke in his testimony about about this concern as well. I was wondering if, you know, short of eliminating switches, if there's anything that we could include in our in our language to address safety concerns or anything um, that this this board could actually do to consider safety concerns. It, it, it's a great question. I appreciate it. Uh, you know, by their nature, um, switch points and 
handling cars is essentially the most dangerous thing railroads do. So if, um, and I think you're going to hear testimony, or at least it's in the written record uh, later today from um, a gentleman at uh, George Mason, who used to work at the FRA, who's got some compelling data on that. If the rule creates more switch points, I, I do think it's pretty realistic to expect there to be some more accidents coming from that. You know, uh, Administrator Bowes made the point that these can be done safely and must be done safely. And that's a, it's a fair point, but on the other hand, all existing switches can be done safely. And, you know, 99.9% .9 of the time they are, but occasionally they're not. Um, so I guess it would come back to the fewer, the more you limit the rule, uh, the fewer extra switches and handling and touch points you would have and the lower the risk of accidents would be. But I, I wouldn't know of a way that you could write to just insist that a switch be done safely. I mean, you could write it, but. Thanks, Don't have any slippery batons. Uh, right. Well, if you take the example we were dealing with yesterday uh, of, a, of a shipper whose uh, car is being taken to a switching yard, it's either put on the host railroad's track or the other railroad's track, it's the same switch. That doesn't add to the chances of a injury, right? I, I would agree with that, that if it's, um, if it really is just replacing one with the other, then you're not I increasing the moves. Yeah, this is an idea which is gaining traction here. I, you know, we ought to, I realize that the way the current rule is drafted would give the impression that switching might take place everywhere under the sun, but there does seem to be some merit to thinking about making it take place at least as a starting point where we already know it works just sort of common sense um you know i i don't know if that's going to be our view or even my own view but it just seems to be an idea that ought to be thoroughly explored um all right as usual chuck right on, right on target anything else <laughs> thank anything you. else for chuck and his crew thank you much see you in washington Yes, sir. Have, a, good, have right. a great lunch. All right. Thank you. It is 119. Uh, half hour, 150. We'll re, re, uh, return. Everybody agree? All right, folks. We will recess until 150 Eastern. See you then.
I can't. Excuse me. Michelle, can you hear me? I think you can. I can. Yeah. Okay, good. No, no, that's good. That's all working then. Okay, good. We'll just wait for everybody to get back. Okay. Sorry, that was like a voice from a higher being. There we go. All right, everybody. We are back in session. Um, we will move ahead to panel six which are the following folks, Dr. James Nolan from the University of Saskatchewan, Diversified uh, CPC International, Sandra Dearden, uh, Indorama Ventures, which has uh, three representatives, Hussam Awad, Barbara Hagler, and H. Baker Lane, and the Reason Foundation, Mark Scribner. So uh, let us proceed, Dr. Nolan, you are, Chairman Oberman, can I can I share my slides? Is that okay? Surely. Okay, I think I can do that now. Um, let's just make sure this works. And yeah, there we go. Okay, I'll put this on a slideshow, and I do I have to do it twice usually. There we go. Okay, and again, I want to thank the board for allowing me at the last minute to slip in and disturb the network. It's a bad joke, uh, but I really really appreciate that. The last minute here, I'm I'm was, probably. Uh, yeah. Doctor, no, it, it was only one switch, so we could handle it. So we could handle it. Wasn't wasn't twenty four hours? Well, it was a couple of days before I heard of it. Um, as one of the few academics who's actually published in journals research on this uh, on this to some people obscure topic, uh, I'm really really glad to be able to come here and talk about a couple of things. Uh, any of you who want? I am currently uh, the journal editor of the Journal of Transportation Research Forum. I've been president of the TRF and. Uh, Patrick has very kindly spoken to us at TRF meetings. Thank you very much, Patrick. And uh, so I, I have a lot of experience in a sort of broad transportation research uh, and have public have been also journal editor of the Canadian Journal of Ag Econ. And I just want to mention up front that uh, part of this particular research I'm going to show was actually funded by the USDA, uh, although it doesn't show up in any report that I've written for them. They help fund grad students. So you'll see some of the, the material coming up here. Um, so what I'm going to focus on, rather than my a lot of my prior research, which we can certainly talk about, uh, about the Canadian kind of previous air switching experiences. One thing I wanted to kind of bring up here that I didn't think anybody else was going to do, and that was the recent Canadian experiment experience. So 
what you can think of is that basically from 2014, 2017, we had a natural experiment in Canada. And that was where we took the standard interswitching rule, <clears throat> excuse me, which is dominated by a 30 kilometer or about an 18 mile radius. And it got changed to 160 kilometers, which is about hundred miles. And the reason it got changed, and I'll, well, let me, I'll back, the reason it got changed was based partially on research I had done previously, which was published in 2008, where we basically tried to map out in the grain handling system or the grain delivery systems, uh, essentially uh, the different types of, uh, of grains that we do. We don't export much corn here. It's mostly different types of wheat. Um, we took that market and said, can we plot how much of grain capacity, so we measured volume by capacity, how much can we pick up with these interswitching limits if we change them? And I noticed that, you know, out here in, in Western Canada, a bit like Western US, the distance to interswitching points or distance between the two railways is often uh, quite long. And the 30 kilometer limit, 18 mile limit seemed quite limited. And so we played around vis-a-vis -vis a little GIS simulation you know, what level would we need to kind of pick up a certain level of capacity? And that's one thing that I think the board is going to have to think about in terms of other major industries that are that are captive. Um, this rule could be designed to pick up a certain amount of capacity in the industry. Now, you won't pick it all up. We found out, for example, uh, just sidebarring a second, 160 kilometers was about our median point, which is why I think the government chose it. Uh, we When we went out to 300, 320 kilometers, which is more like a couple hundred miles, we were picking up even then only about 90% of the grain capacity or grain output. So to get to that 100%, every captive shipper being um, affected or being you know, positively affected by interswitching, extended interswitching, uh, would have been uh, 300 miles plus. So I urge the board to be you know, very careful how they set that distance. But anyway, uh, what happened in 2013-14, there was a grain handling crisis here. This happens every so often in Canada. We had a record grain crop and again, exceptionally cold winters, surprise, surprise, it's Canada. Uh, it affected Western rail operations and delay shipping in the Thunder Bay. Uh, CP at that time, this is just post Hunter Harrison, and I'll talk about him in a second, uh, tried to streamline their operations, kind of, you know, an early, an early uh, PSR kind of uh, uh, thing here where CP was basically streamlining a whole bunch of their operations. And there were, you know, obviously with CN, there are two major carriers. Uh, some stakeholders would blame the railways for finding themselves unequipped to deal with the increased demand for rail due to the harvest. And by the way, this isn't the first time this happened in the time I've been here in Saskatchewan. Uh, 96, 97, there was another grain crisis, which led to a previous uh, set of re regulatory decisions we can talk about later, but I'll, I'll get to that. So this is sort of cyclical. Um, the railways tend to get to a point where they can't deliver and the, the shippers get upset about it. And grain is treated differently in Canada than most other commodities. And there's a reason for that. Um, it still comprises about 20% of the railway's revenue. So grain is a really, really important commodity moving out of Western Canada. Uh, it has less, sorry, uh, less importance in the U.S., but it is very important in Canada, which is why it gets, historically has been treated a little bit differently. Uh, anyway, so just going on a little bit here. So, and this was a conservative government which set this order. This is very interesting. This wasn't the liberals who are sort of left of center in Canada. This was the progressive conservatives who are, you know, seen to be more right of center, which in Canada has a little less meaning in the U.S., but they are a little bit more market oriented than are the liberals. March 7th, 2014, order in council by the, the PC government, um, setting a minimum movement threshold of 5,500 cars per railway. So there's this kind of a two-pronged change in regulation in response to the grain crisis. Uh, the railways had to move a certain number of cars per railway. But then they, on May 29th, they passed what they called the Fair Rail for Grain Farmers Act. Among other provisions, it extended the order in council to August 2014, so they were sort of seeing how many months this would take. It demanded more stringent reporting of data by the railways and extended the historical extended air switching limit, which is reciprocal switching, from 30 kilometers, which has been historically since, since time immemorial in Canada, to 160 kilometers for a period of two years. Uh, in June 8, 2016, those provisions were extended for one more year to August 2017. Okay, so what we have here is basically a natural experiment in taking a very, very short radius, 18 miles or 30 kilometers, and stretching it out based on some of the work that I had done previously, but I believe I'm the only person who ever did work on this, to 160 kilometers, uh, about 100 miles, and see how that would work. Okay, we can, you certainly ask questions later. So just having a look at it. This is historic, you know, we think of interswitching as being shipper B right now has access to sort of the single railway, but might want access to the second railway by railway B. And of course, under the 30 kilometer limit, shipper A doesn't have the same dual access. But if you extend it to 160 kilometers, both shippers have access to that. So that's just a little simple visualization of how this thing sort of worked, uh, picking up those shippers. So 
we got some data. The grad student actually got some data. This is kind of a collection of data that came from a variety of sources. Um, mostly, I believe it was from Quorum Corporation, but also, I believe, some rail shippers, uh, grain shippers put, put this together. And what they did, they got basically data on car cycle times and a few other things we'll see in a second here. Um, and we wanted to see, you know, the design of this, when you think of the, the policy, the government said, okay, railways, you've got to move 5,500 cars. That's, a, that's important to clear out the backlog. But they also included these inter-switching rules, these new rules that extended the radius. Um, and they did that because they thought that would help the backlog. So we sort of took a look and said, did it actually do anything with the backlog? Um, the data are a little bit sporadic, and I, I, I can probably talk that a little bit later. But again, it's, it's a, we have some data, but basically we've got data from July 2015. So not from the start of the inter-switching change, uh, but somewhere in the, you know, after, after it began up to September 2018. So we include about a year or so after the inter-switching rule changed back to 30 kilometers. And we'll talk a bit more about that. So the first 26 months of data covers the time when the new extended inter-switching rules were in place. And the last 14 months spans the period in which standard inter-switching provisions were reinstated. So um, I have my student run a regression on this. Basically, it's a simple linear regression where we have variables covering things like weather, uh, you know, how, many, how much shipments went where, basically. Car, and we just wanted to know, can, did this actually affect car cycle times? And I guess what I want everyone to take from this is because the data mixes both the 160 kilometer limit and the 30 kilometer limit, although more of it's in the 160 range, take these with a little bit of a grain of salt. But I guess what we want to show here is that inner switching at the 160 kilometer level, if anything, improved car cycle times and certainly did not worsen them, right? So getting back to that issue around how much this inner switching rule, whatever the board decides upon, if they decide upon it, um, that rule didn't really seem to affect the railways too much in terms of car cycle times, okay? So here's car cycle times to the West Coast. This would be Vancouver in Canada. And the key variable here is this thing here, whoops, this inner switching variable, which basically says, uh, given all else equal, et cetera, is paribus, uh, there were 1.5 days saved on the average cycle time with inner switching in that particular data set. And then from total grain time, total time the grain sat in the, the grain handling system, it was 5.2 days less under inner switching. And I'll explain a little bit how that occurred, okay? And this will bear, I think, upon the kind of policies you folks are going to have to think about um, moving, moving forward, okay? All right. Um, so do the new inner switching rules help to reduce system congestion? Again, grain of salt. Uh, in Canada, the, the reduction of about a day and a half to get to, to, get to Vancouver, uh, the access overall grain stayed in the system of 5.2 days less. Um, car cycle times to Eastern destination and U.S. destinations not seem to be significantly affected. So there was mostly the West Coast, but that was what it was directed for anyway. But here's the more important part, observations here. Um, the grain shippers were able to estimate how much they save, not only from an actual inner switch, how much they save by negotiating with a different railway and getting a cheaper rate, but how much they saved when that didn't happen, but they negotiated the rate. So the estimates that, that they got over the last two years, of the policy, but everyone got used to it, was about $15 million over the two years. And that's not insignificant. So these were actual inner switches with ones that never actually occurred, but kind of like contestability theory, there was this threat that a another operator would get in and take the traffic. So the railway had to lower the rate to, uh, to the shipper to, to get that rate to move. Um, what typically happened, in, from my understanding, and again, uh, the Canadian Transportation Agency and a lot of people are pretty mum about this, but my understanding from talking to shippers about this was that it wasn't so much CNSCP competing with each other, although that did occur. It was Burlington Northern coming up through the West Coast of Canada through some of the track they have into Canada and exploiting that 160 kilometer limit and taking some of that traffic or you know, offering a rate to destination, whether probably Portland on the, on the Columbia, but offering a rate that the shipper was able to negotiate to get their rate down with CN and CP basically. Um, so that's kind of how that experiment worked. And it was really that third competitor, which is really important. I'm running out of time here, let me go quickly. Um, my observation, the policy was so successful it overturned was under, overturned under the influence of the Canadian Railways. Now, I know enough people in the agency to know the railways worked very, very hard to get the inter-switching provision changed back from 160 back to 30. Uh, and there is a policy now in Canada called LHI, and we probably talk about this. This is long-haul inter-switching. Um, it's interesting in that it sets a really long radius. It's about 745 miles of radius. Uh, it's never been used. And the reason is, from my understanding, the shipper has to go to the agency 
and tell the agency, well, I tried to negotiate with the other rail with the railway, but they wouldn't negotiate. So I want to call this LHI. And it seems like no shipper is willing to do that. Or there are other things going on in Canada right now as well. We're switching now from a tariff, public tariff based system in grain transportation to a um, uh, a, a contract system. So uh, the railways are trying to avoid interswitching completely by writing these contracts differently. So anyway, uh, LHI has proven to be pretty clumsy. In fact, the, the agencies told me they would love to have someone try to call a case because they're not sure how it's going to work either, but they haven't. They haven't actually called a case. And that was instituted basically 2018. So we're looking at four years of, of uh, LHI never being called. Um, anyway, so what, what I'm going to suggest quickly here my prior research that showed up in Choices back in 2015 on the U.S. network in Montana and the Dakotas, we mapped out a 50-mile radius, uh, but we're not really sure what that radius should be. And that is a really interesting uh, question that's kind of up to, the, up to the board to think about what they're going to do with that. Um, we truly do need flexible regulation, a flexible regulator. And I think listening to, to Chairman Oberman, uh, I think there is a lot of push to do that now. And by that, I mean... If you set a radius and you set a way to do inner switching or, or sorry, reciprocal switching, um, you've got to be flexible. If it's not working for shippers and carriers, then there has to be some way to change out of the radius or the onus and this sort of thing. Um, and one thing I'm going to suggest as well, and I, we haven't talked much about this at all, is you know that that regulated rate that's going to have to go to the to the uh, railway, the home or the the landlord railway to take the shipment to the inner switch point. Um, we need to think about using Ramsey pricing, which of course is a zero profit compensatory pricing on these regulated reciprocal switches. That's one thing that the board has to think about as well. Um, again, I don't think this is going to solve all captive shipper issues. I know in all deference to my, my wheat colleague, uh, Mr. Henry, I don't think that a 300 mile radius is really going to work for anybody. I think it's going to cause operational issues. Uh, but again, um, if the regulator is flexible, if the STB is flexible about this and it works, then it works. And if it doesn't come back and change it. And I realize that may not be an easy thing to recommend. It's an academic thing to recommend. Maybe I'm not living in the real world, but flexibility is important. Um, and one other thing I'm going to say too, is you can't let this whole process get bogged down by case by case allowances, save possibly for computing the regulated switching charge, which are obviously dependent on demand. Um, the LHI variant in Canada not being used is proof that reciprocal switching needs to be something like a bright line policy. And from what I'm hearing from Chairman Oberman and the rest of you, I think there is a notion of having a bright line, an RVC test or something, which would enact this sort of thing. But the radius is going to be a really important consideration as well. So, all right, I'm over time. Thank you for being patient with me. I much appreciate that. No, thank you, Dr. Don. Very helpful. Let, let me just ask you, uh, I want to... May I stop sharing, Chairman Oberman? Is that okay? Yeah, sure. Okay, yep. I'll, uh, I'll these are available, of course, yeah, for whoever uh, wants them, so yeah. Yeah, we should put them in our record, I think. Somebody else may ask you to put them back up. Do, do they, these rules only apply for grain, as I understand it? Excellent question, yes. So the, the extended 160 kilometer, the 30 was everything. The 160 that was put in 2014 was for grain only. What happened as part of the negotiation process was a lot of shippers who weren't grain said, wow, can we have that 160? Can we have that as well? And that's part of the reason I think it was it was basically turned over. And that's just my opinion. I think the government realized that there were probably some difficulties in extending that to forestry, to coal, these sorts of things, right? So they didn't want to go that route. The LHI that they came up with in consultation with the railways does apply to all commodities there are restrictions in corridors. There's restriction on toxic, uh, any kind of toxic commodity moving in there. But, but there's some restrictions put in there, which essentially were put in to prevent American, essentially, as far as I can tell, prevent American uh, class ones from stealing traffic from Canadian class ones. The, uh, have you thought about the idea that I've uh, queried some of the witnesses about having a different mileage in the United States? to apply to grain shippers who, as in Canada, are much more spread out. One of the things I would suggest you look at is having two tiers potentially of this policy. And again, you know, as a regulatory economist and understanding some of your decisions you have to make, and you're a five member board and you have employees, but you know, I don't wanna impose more regulatory decisions on you folks, but having a double tiered or a multi-tiered reciprocal switching radius might be the way to go. So for example, in urban areas, you might have, let's say, a 15 mile radius, whereas in rural areas, you might have more like a 100, 150 mile radius, something like that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Patrick, Thank you, you have a question? 
Yes, uh, thanks uh, very much, Dr. Nolan, uh, for the presentation and good to see you. Um, I, you know, for folks that may be concerned about the impacts of uh, any rule that is issued by the board, um, would you uh, think we would be well advised to build in um, the types of metrics that you identified to judge the impact of our rule uh, if one is issued um, after the date of issuance? In other words, to more intensively you know, develop a, a plan to uh, provide kind of retrospective review of the effect on the rule on things like cycle times and rates and other, other metrics. Um, you know, so would we be well advised to do that? And do you have any further thoughts about the best way the board might go about doing that? Wow, the latter question's tough. Uh, but the, the, the first question you asked, Patrick, I would definitely think what you're suggesting. And I know you've been talking a lot personally about uh, first mile, last mile data, that sort of thing. I think that's a really, really excellent idea in terms of uh, picking up, you know, your monitoring of the system, basically. I think when you institute a rule that's this, it, you know, reciprocal switching is, is going to change the industry. And I think everyone agrees on that point, right? And as much as it does that, the regulatory body, you guys have to be cognizant that it may or may not, it, you know, it may work. One of the things about contestability theory says one of the ways it may work is you may not see it working. You may hear from shippers saying, holy crap, I got a great rate on this because the threat existed. And thank you for that threat. Thank you for that competitive threat, right? So you got to be careful to try to follow that kind of data as well and talk to the shippers and say, did this benefit you in any way, which won't show up in, in like, you know, for example, uh, uh, the, the kind of data that you would post on the way bill, that sort of thing, right? So, right, w right. You know, and, um, you know, the way bill oftentimes doesn't capture that first last mile. And, you know, some of the timestamps might not tell you everything about what was expected, for example. Exactly. Right? exactly. Things, like, yeah. things like car share plan compliance. And so I'm sort of wondering, you know, if, if the board wanted to be especially cautious, whether or not, you know, it could design kind of a pre-assembled basket of comparative, you know, some that are subject to the rule and some that aren't, kind of a basket of, of different movements and to compare what actually happens on things like car share plan compliance, cycle time, yep. et cetera. Yep. And, and if we start to see really negative effects to the traffic that is subject to the rule or that gets a switch. Yeah. And we might, you know, have some sort of out switch. You know what I mean? Something. Right. Something, right. Something, Let me. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. Can I add something, Pat? Yeah. On that yeah. point, I think it's a great idea. Um, in Canada, when the 160 existed, it is my understanding that the, the rule was automatic. So, but what it meant was me as a grain shipper, I had to go to a competing railway, not my, not my host railway. I had to go negotiate a rate to destination with them. Then I could go back to the agency and say, give me the interswitch. Or I go back to the host railway and say, hey, look at the rate I got. If I interswitch, can you match it? Right. That's what happened. I think in your case, it sounds like you're thinking of uh, making this thing dependent on some kind of RVC, we'll call it test, some kind of test, right? Um you know, and that's where I'm, even though I've researched this quite a lot, I'm a little torn as to which one is better because there are instances where just the threat, right? Just the idea of saying, if you can access a second shipper within, let's say, 60, 70, 100 miles, just the threat of accessing that second shipper going to the board, the board says, yep, here's the rate we're going to, here's the regulated rate to get your shipment to that inner switch point or that reciprocal switching point. Here's the rate. And that gives the shipper leverage to come back and negotiate, right? I don't know, given the structure, we'd have to look at the topography of the U.S. network. Are there enough, you know, two competitors seems like not enough. And I hate to use the word collusion, but it sounds like the two Canadian railways, they definitely talk to each other. I'm probably not supposed to say that, but they do. They talk to each other. They know what they're doing. They often switch traffic very freely. They said that earlier in the last deposition from CP yesterday, right? They know what they're doing. I don't know in the U.S. if there are enough, you know, it's that, it's that two competitor to three competitor problem, which is really an issue here, right? And whether or not reciprocal switching would solve that is a good question, actually. Well, and, and I think also, you know, factoring in some the, the, the points that were made about potential efficiencies from, you know, single service in some markets. Excuse me, right? yes. And also factoring in some of the differences between the Canadian network and the U.S. network, which I actually think some of Marty's points on designs of, you know, terminals and other locations, I think also sort of implicitly. Yes. Gives, I think, I think that's sort of those two reasons are sort of why we're also talking about a conduct element 
which is the railroad showing something beyond just circumstances. Yep. Because of those substantial differences between Canada and the U.S. Yes, exactly. Kind of thinking about thinking about that also sort of adds a layer of complexity. I have one more thing. I I, I took note of your sort of view that um, Ramsey pricing principles should be factored into compensation. You know, but would it be accurate to say that the Canadian inner switching pricing is not really a Ramsey price? That's an excellent question. Um, it tries to be. Uh, I've actually worked with a couple of folks at the agency to examine, in fact, at, at, G, at TRF coming up in April, which I won't be at, there's a paper where we try to compare the current rate base, the rate set, to what we think is the equivalent Ramsey price, you know, given assumptions about demand, et cetera, et cetera. And they're not that far off, actually, believe it or not. So the, the rates came from costing. They came from a Canadian costing model, which said, okay, if you're going to move, you know, a, a typical car shipment over a certain typical distance, here's the money you get per car to do this, right? But it turns out those rates aren't that far from Ramsey pricing, right? So I don't know whether you guys want to follow that. Well, uh, sorry, go but, ahead. Yeah, no, sorry to interrupt, but you're just to make sure I'm kind of like, I mean, are you, you are talking about the average price of a costing-based system versus the average price from a Ramsey system, right? But I, yeah. isn't the whole point of Ramsey pricing that you have, you know, you're not looking at the average price across shippers. The whole point is that you differentially price across, you know, two different yeah. shippers based on, you know, the inverse of their elasticity of demand, right? Yes. Yeah. So, so, yeah, so, sorry. So I don't know if yeah. that average price comparison is going to do it. I don't know. What do you think about that? No, it's a good, it's a really good point. I, I would tend to think, so when, when I did this with the colleague, we were just averaging out to make the paper simpler, but you're absolutely right. You would have to do it probably on a case by case basis. And it could be done once you've got a formula, once you've got a setup and you, you ask the, you know, for example, the railway say, what do you think the demand is for this rail transportation on your, on your network? And they give you an estimate, put that into your Ramsey model. It's doable. This is all with data, right? And you sit there and say, okay, here's the equivalent Ramsey price that gives you zero profit, but compensates you. And we're off to the races. If that's too much work, then yeah, maybe I'll have to think about a different way well, of doing it. But. And, and you're talking about the we're, you're talking about line haul profit, right? I mean, yes. you're factoring that in now. Yeah, I, I would say you know, is it too much work? I would just it's it's been my observation, and you know, listen, you know, if if the state of the economic art is different than that, it's been my observation that accurate estimating elasticity of demand on an individual shipper basis is very difficult. Yeah, it is. Text of individual cases, and no question. You know, I think one of the themes you're hearing is, you know, um, you know, can we protect core important economic principles, but also eliminate or minimize undue administrative complexity. Right, right. Do worry about whether or not, and and that's why we don't have a Ramsey price. We have Ramsey pricing informs our rate review, but but our rate review is not Ramsey pricing, for example, you know? And so I just, I just put that out there to to think about, you know, the, the practicality of really estimating elasticity of demand as it pertains to, you know, compensation. But Patrick, this has got to be easier than an SAC test, right? I mean, the and, and you know, ideally the well, SAC right. gets you to a Ramsey, right? But it's got to be easier now, to do it on a case by case. But. No, well, yeah. I mean, listen, that that's what they say, but you know, their their elasticity of demand is nowhere to be found in a SAC case. Yeah, that's true. That's a good point. So, actually. so, yeah. so, you know, yes, CMP, I guess, is informed by Ramsey pricing, but it is not Ramsey pricing. So, no. So, and, and I would argue that that's because Ramsey pricing is potentially even more complex because of the elasticity of demand problem. Right, but right. even though I take, I very much take your point on the economic principles, I just worry about the complexity. No, it is. And I think, Patrick, the way you might do that, too, is to say, OK, we're going to assume for grain, here's the elasticity of demand. For glass materials, here's the elasticity of demand. Coal, here's. And if you make that transparent to the railway and say, OK, here's your compensation based on that, then you can have that argument you know, outside of that system, probably. I, I it is complicated. Yeah, I know. It and is I don't complicated. Need to the point because I know my colleagues, I'm sure, have questions. But you know that, you know, that's just a commodity-based elasticity demand where true yeah. pricing would be, you know, the totality of the circumstances, including geography and other things. But, you know, listen, you are putting forward something that could reduce the complexity, and I appreciate that. So it's a Thank good question to have. Thank you, Patrick. No, good, great questions. Other board members? Who, who want to take a stab at trying to understand what Patrick and Dr. Nolan were talking about. <laughs> um, I, I don't think I could do any better than that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm so, sorry. I'm sorry, no, folks. No, no, it's okay. 
It's where I turn turn over the hearing to the economist. That's all. Yeah, I was gonna I was gonna say another dirty economist coming in here for you. I'm sorry about that, but yeah. All right, Michelle, did you? Have- yeah, I think I think mine's going to be a bit easier. Um, just, <laughs> just to clarify, I think I think what you said was that uh, green shippers, once they were granted, uh, I believe it was was it 160 miles or 100, 160 kilometers, kilometers, 160 100 miles, 100 miles, 100 miles, 100 miles, um, that having that access was associated with uh, five five point two days less in, in travel time, if I heard you correctly. Yes, but 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 that data covers not only the 160 limit, but also includes a year of back to normal, back to the 30 kilometer limit. So it's a little bit, it's a little bit, and that's what the student did. It's a little bit skewed. I probably should have taken just the uh, inner switching 100, 100 mile data and done that, but I didn't. But even so, even incorporating all that, you still, you, it looked like it wasn't hindering the time the grain sat in the system, basically. Um, no, in fact, it, I'm, I'm, if I'm trying to make sure I'm understanding this correctly, the 5.2 days less actually improved the, the travel time, if, if I'm understanding that correctly. Yep, yep, yeah, it did, yeah. And what, I don't know if you, you know, you could speak to this, but what, what was the reason behind uh, that improvement from, from your perspective? I think it, if rather than sitting on a track, the shipper, the grain shipper, was able to negotiate with another railway. So let's say they're on CP track and their grain is sitting in an elevator or sitting loaded and not moving. Then you go to Burlington Northern and say, hey guys, can you move this out for me? Burlington Northern comes back and says in a day or so and says, yeah. And it then they go back to CP and say, hey, Burlington Northern is going to come up tomorrow. Uh, they're going to get the inner switch the day after because the CTA will automatically enact the inner switch. Uh, you know, what can you do? And then CP probably says, oh, crap, we better move that, right? So there was that negotiative suasion, which must have surely occurred between grain shippers, grain companies, and railways to move any kind of grain that was just sitting on a track, for example. So that's why I think there was a benefit. Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, Michelle. Oh, just, I, I guess there's a follow-up question to that then as well. I don't, and I don't know if this was something that, that you looked into, but whether or not there were any other operational challenges you know, in, in perhaps related to either either other, other commodities or, or in more uh, dense areas associated with, with that 100 mile radius? That's an excellent question. I don't, I don't know the answer to that. I think CN's coming up later today. They'll probably have, maybe they'll address that. I don't know. Um, it did clear out the backlog as far as I know, because it took, it took about a year. Well, maybe a little less than that. It took some time to clear the backlog out, but I didn't hear anecdotally about any backlog as of, let's say a year the next, the next delivery season, basically. So the other thing I wanted to mention to you folks quickly, um, I believe it was Mr. Henry who said, or someone else said, and I don't want to blame him, uh, it's not a bad thing. They said, oh, well, Inner switching really helps Canadian uh, grain, you know, move the way it does. We, we, you know, there's much more, much more grain moving in Canada at lower rates than it is in the U, or let's say equivalent amounts at lower rates. Um, it turns out that the reason for that is um, the there's an extra piece of regulation which came out of that 1996-97 kerfuffle with grain transportation called the Maximum Revenue Entitlement or the MRE. And what it is, it's kind of like uh, an average revenue regulation, revenue cap, which was put on, again, on grain movement. So if you want to think about it this way, between 2014 and 2017, the Canadian Railways had a double regulatory structure imposed on. They had the MRE, which limited how much money they could make on moving grain, and they had the inner switching, which they had to address, basically. So the MRE, which I'm not asking you guys to consider whatsoever, obviously, it really does. It's funny because I've seen studies from the late 90s where where U.S. rates from North Dakota down wherever they, you know, Columbia, wherever it got delivered through Portland, whatever at that time, they were far lower than Canadian rates at that time. But because of this MRE, it looks like that situation has flipped over, actually. I just wanted to get that in because it does relate to what you're talking about. Sorry about that, Michelle. Thank you for That's that. Okay. Thank you. All right. Any other uh, questions? Again, thank you, Chairman Olberman, for letting me get in this. I really, really uh, no, appreciate Dr. it. Dr. Nolan, I'm glad you uh, signed up. Um, your research is uh, you know, very enlightening and adds to the mix of our knowledge. We may get back to you. Thank you very much. All right. I understand that Sandra Dearden has solved her high-tech problems and is with us from Diversified yes. CPC. Yes. 
I apologize right. for being late. You're not late. You're right on time. Okay, good. Go for it. Um, good afternoon. Um, my name is Sandra Dearden, and I'm speaking on behalf of Diversified CPC International. Diversified CPC manufactures propellants for aerosols, high purity hydrocarbon refrigerants, and specialty applications, including biomass solvent extraction products. Headquartered in Shanahan, Illinois, Diversified CPC has six manufacturing plants and they are all rail served. There has never been a time when reciprocal switching was needed more. In their numerous filings, it became apparent that the railroad seemed to think this proceeding is all about rates. However, we view increased competition as an opportunity to drive improved service while confirming competitive rates. Obviously, rates are a serious concern, but if shippers cannot rely on carriers to deliver their products efficiently and in a timely manner, plant shutdowns can occur in which case rates can become secondary. Supply chain disruptions and transportation capacity are a national issue, and this is not a short-term problem. In 2021, the American Trucking Association reported the industry was short 80,000 drivers, and that number will grow to 160,000 drivers by the year 2030. The impact on manufacturers has been profound. Shippers are challenged on a daily basis, simply trying to get equipment to load. And at a time when service has declined, freight costs continue to increase. This is a problem that has been developing for more than a decade. Precision railroading has devastated the rail workforce, shrinking capacity while freight volumes and rates continue to increase. Union Pacific's Ms. Hammond in her opening statement yesterday cited UP's need to compensate its shareholders for their investments. Her comment underscores the real problem here, that the railroads prioritize shareholder value over customer needs. I do not believe that access to new reciprocal switching rules will open a floodgate. However, increased competition should establish the discipline needed to turn this around so the carrier's primary focus is on serving their customers. I could cite numerous examples when diversified CPC experienced missed switches and delayed cars. The link in the supply chain is broken and the need for significant change is now. A clear example is the incident I cited in my filing where it was obvious that the railroad managers were demarketing customers due to shortage of capacity in one lane. Demarketing due to lack of capacity benefits no one. If the railroads will put emotions aside they might recognize the benefits of reciprocal switching for shippers and for the railroads. For example, sometimes a route by an incumbent carrier is not the most efficient route. This presents a reliability risk for shippers like diversified CPC that ship rail in private cars. Also, in situations where a railroad is short of capacity, like the example previously mentioned, adding a second carrier will add capacity. There is a working interchange with a second carrier within 10 miles of the plant receiving product in the lane I mentioned that was being demarketed. If that second carrier had access to diversified CPC's plant, there would not be a need for the incumbent carrier to alienate customers by auctioning off capacity in their lane. Reciprocal switching can establish a better option for carriers and their customers 
to plan and manage capacity. And it can also open up new markets to shippers and to rail carriers, where the only current practical option is competition from other origins and or other modes. The operational impacts cited by the railroads are greatly exaggerated. Reciprocal switching is a common operation performed by the railroads on a daily basis. And any concerns about the need for greater investments do not appear to be relevant since applications will be considered on a case-by-case -case basis. The railroads have the technology and operating personnel who work collaboratively with other carriers to provide service and sometimes to conceive ways to streamline operations. Railroad executives know this, and they take pride in the quality of their personnel. So raising operational impacts and greater investments as concerns, along with labeling this proceeding as forced switching, are nothing more than emotional responses on their part. AAR has submitted that the board's proposal is unsound because it extends reciprocal switching beyond terminal areas. Again, the practicality of a proposed reciprocal switching arrangement will be reviewed on a case-by-case -case basis. But there is no good reason to limit reciprocal switching to terminal areas. Consider, for example, the working interchange mentioned previously, which would be considered to be in a remote area, is less than 10 miles from diversified CPC's plant versus the Chicago terminal, which is 234 square miles. While the definition of terminal has not been confirmed, limiting the new process to terminal areas will probably pr preclude many rail customers' ability to use the new reciprocal switching rules. The new rules proposed by the board comprise more than just a good proposal. Shippers large and small need a practical way to access reciprocal switching. BNSF in their filing acknowledged market failures in the form of unreasonable high rates. And the American Antitrust Institute confirmed when competition is eliminated that duopolies price higher. That brings us to today. I respectfully request that the board re reconsider the inclusion of testing for market dominance in prong two. It is a lengthy and costly process that few shippers would use if it was even appropriate. However, testing for market dominance in reciprocal switching procedures is not practical, nor is it appropriate. Consider shipments to and from a single plant some, com some commodities and lanes could pass a market dominance test, while others would not. If that were the case, would that industry be open or close to reciprocal switching? It would not be manageable to have some lanes open and others closed. And even if that were the case, would the industry be required to refile whenever new business opportunities and new lanes developed? Prong one, which is if, it, if practicable and in the public interest, is a common sense case by case approach to confirm that a shipper's facility meets certain stated criteria, which makes one wonder if prong two is even needed. It is an accepted fact that rationalization of the rail network has gone too far and competition has been eliminated. So just what are we trying to prove? Whether one prong or two, testing of market dominance to confirm competition is not relevant nor appropriate here and should be eliminated from the new rules. I will not reiterate some of the other points made in my original filings, such as the relevance of Canadian inter-switching and our objection to ECP when setting reciprocal switching fees. 
Of course, fees should be decided in reciprocal switching proceedings on a case-by-case -case basis. A simple method might be to develop fees based on benchmarking against existing reciprocal switch rates that apply in the terminal and or the region. My only closing comment concerns a need for a separate rulemaking proceeding to develop standards and procedures for railroads that arbitrarily decide to terminate existing reciprocal switching arrangements. Within that proceeding, the board could have the opportunity to establish standards and rules for shippers to challenge charges for reciprocal switching. Certainly, we do not want to delay this proceeding further, which is why I'm suggesting a separate rulemaking proceeding. The need to protect shippers from the loss of competition when railroads terminate reciprocal switching arrangements without notice or justification is an important issue that should be addressed. While we all agree that we need to find ways to drive competition, it is equally important to protect competition that we already have. In the interim, I submit that any new reciprocal switching arrangements established under these new rules should be infinite until those standards and procedures are in effect. Thank you for allowing me to present my views. Um, we appreciate the board's interest in this very important uh, issue and I encourage the board to proceed in an expeditious manner. Uh, thank you very much, Sandra. Uh, I have a few questions. How many um, uh, different plant locations does Diversified have that are rail served? Six. And can you, where are they? And okay. The headquarter plant at Shanahan, Illinois, the rail station is Lorenzo and that's located on Burlington Northern Santa Fe single served. Um, they have a plant in Sparta, New Jersey, which is on the New York, well, it's the NYSW. And the NYSW connects with uh, CSX and Norfolk Southern. They have a plant in Sebring, Florida, which is local on um, CSX. They have a plant in Petal, Mississippi, rail station Dragon, Mississippi, which is served by Norfolk Southern. And they have a plant in Anaheim, California, which is local on Union Pacific. And their newest plant, which we just started last year is at uh, Beaumont, which the, the rail station's Amelia. And it's at, at the Iron Horse Terminal, which is served directly by both uh, Union Pacific and BNSF. You have the pleasure of dealing with everybody. Uh, mm -hmm. So, our, so you've got two locations that are dual served. Is, is your experience in the dual served locations different from the ones that are sole served? Um. Well, yes. I I think I one of the benefits of having dual served. Is it's kind of part of our whole network um, because we have a lot of options not only for uh, shipping in and out of our facilities but also where we source our raw materials. And so what we do is is we we apply leverage um, from the standpoint that we we have options to source product from different locations. And, um, and then also, obviously, for example, when you go into Sparta, you know, that there's direct rail to rail competition between uh, CSX and Norfolk Southern. And one of the carriers is does a better job at that um, than the other one, we have basically taken all all 
all the competitive business away from uh, Norfolk Southern. CSX has done, uh, CSX has been very good to work with. And based on what I've been hearing from these hearings, I think the reason they work with us the way we do is we educate them on our business and what our options are, and they respond to that competition. If we did not have that competition, I don't, I don't think uh, it would be as good as they. By the way, they have benefited too. They have, they have increased the business they do with diversified uh, five, five by multiple of five. So could you, uh, and I'm sorry, I just don't recall from what the written comments, could you give us more detail on your the demarketing episode you referred to? Where, where did that happen and, and what did the demarketing consist of? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, what happened is uh, all the railroads except one holds our rates uh for the contract year and in, in, in the propane industry contract year is April 1st to March 31st. The only exception is Norfolk Southern and they reserve the right to increase the rates quarterly. Um, and which they have not done, you know, in recent years, but they did come out with a, a proposed increase for January 1st for one Lane, and that was um, Birmingham to our plant in Mississippi. And that proposed increase was 24 and a half percent. So whenever possible, our approach to the carriers is not to be adversarial, but instead to try to understand their, their positions so that we can work with them. And so my comment was, in the initial meeting, um, help me to understand what's behind the 24 and a half percent. And what they said was um, they have they lack capacity in that lane. And um, so they're just trying to figure out which customers really want capacity in, in their lane from Birmingham. How far how far is that location from Birmingham? Hmm. Oh, I got it. There it is. 235 miles. So, uh, and this happened in January of this year? Yes. Well, they came to us in December with the anchors. And, and was the capacity a crew shortage problem? Because we've been hearing a lot of Norfolk Southern crew shortage problems. Well, Birmingham in general has been a choke point for quite some time. And I think it's a good congestion problem there. And is Birmingham the nearest terminal to your plant? No, uh, there's actually uh, an interchange available uh, 10 miles from the plant at uh, uh, Hunts at my, my brain just like, anyway, there's another, there's a, there's a working interchange 10 miles from the plant. Well, I'd be interested to know what that is, because I'm looking at uh, NS's uh, reciprocal switching tariff, and I'm wondering if that's an interchange where they do any reciprocal switching. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you know? No, I don't know. Well, it'd be interesting if you can, while yes. you finish, if you could figure out what's the name of that interchange, I'll see if yes. it's in the tariff. Okay. Uh, because, you know, I don't know if you were listening yesterday. Excuse me, sir. Yeah. It's Hattiesburg. Hattiesburg. Hattiesburg, I'm Mississippi. Mm-hmm. Well, let's see if they're in there. And and who, do, who, who does that interchange with, CSX? Canadian National. Oh, well... 
NS has a reciprocal switching tariff in Hattiesburg with CN. Yes, that's what you're talking about. And they apply it to one customer, Hub City, Grist and Feed Mill. So if we, so you had been concerned about limiting reciprocal switching to terminals. I've been raising a query with people. What, what if we limited it to any place where the railroad currently performs reciprocal switching and has a tariff? So mm -hmm. we didn't have to debate. I don't know if Hattiesburg is considered a terminal. Do you consider it a terminal? Because nobody seems to know the definition of terminal. <laughs> no. I, uh, I, I love it more. I, except I would say this, if this hearing goes on much longer, we all may end up being terminal, but I think that's <laughs> a different meaning. Uh, but uh, in that case, if, the, if there was a reciprocal, reciprocal switching rule, which made you eligible, uh, if you could switch at any place where there was a uh, existing tariff, you you could have better switch with CN at Hattiesburg. Would that have solved your problem for that plant? It would add capacity. And the, the point I was trying to make is, you know, this isn't all bad for the railroads because if they have a capacity problem in that lane from Birmingham and, and they have congestion at Birmingham and they, there's been times when they've had congestion uh, trying to get cars into uh, our plant. Um, by adding a second carrier, you will be actually adding capacity, which will relieve that capacity shortage. Did, did you pay the 24 and a half percent? I, we spent four meetings, totaled about four and a half hours, and <laughs> succeeded at getting a progressive increase, but they stuck, stuck by their 24 and a half percent. I did point out to them that this increases, uh, this is raw materials coming in from a major supplier and that it increases the production cost at uh, the plant and that they are actually jeopardizing the future of that plant. So when you use the, you know, I've heard the term demarketing since I got to the board in different contexts. Uh, you may be the first person to put it in a concrete setting. But would it be fair to understand when you said that, that NS came in and said, if we raise your rates 24 and a half percent, will you stop using us because we don't have enough capacity? That's essentially right. the message you were given, right? Yes. That's what you meant by demarketing. Yes. And it sounds like you responded by saying, well, you're not going to get rid of me because I need the service. Right. And I take it that trucks would not be an option for whatever. What raw material is that that you get there? It's uh, propane. So you don't want, I assume that's not really uh, it's, practical. Well, okay. it's coming from uh, West Virginia. It's originating in West Virginia. So the it's roll eleven rate from, uh, yeah. from West Virginia on CSX to uh, NS at Birmingham. I imagine there are quite a few of drivers in that part of the country who wouldn't like to be speeding down the highway at seventy miles an hour next to a propane truck if right. they didn't have to. Um, the so, other thing, is, sir, yeah. Uh, yeah. Chairman, um, that's important is. Diversified products cannot just go on any truck. You know, it has to be dedicated trucks. Yeah. And they're they're experiencing a great deal of difficulty in get it, having enough drivers and and equipment for mm -hmm. their products. And so, switching to truck is not an easy transferable thing to do. It's something that requires a lot of thought. I mean, it doesn't mean we won't, but um, it's not an easy do. So let me ask this question. Did you ask NS if they would just give you a reciprocal switching rate for Hattiesburg when you were negotiating with them? No, but that would be a good approach. Yeah. 
Well, there, I want no extra charge. You can ask them the next time you talk to them. Uh, are, are there any um, of your locations where you do have an existing reciprocal switching tariff with any class one? Not for diversified CPC. Yeah. No. Okay. Yeah, well, I mean, there's some where yeah. they have a second carrier that directly serves, but, and then NYSW connects with two carriers, but. I have a suspicion you know enough about the rail industry. You could answer this question, but if you can't, that's fine. Do you have any idea if you were allowed a reciprocal switch at Hattiesburg, how many movements that would be? Um, how complicated would the, the move be? Well, I think if, if you count the inbound and the outbound, it's probably um, the potential of 80 to 100 carloads. No, no, but how many moves would the, uh, in other words, where, where do the NS, uh, where does the NS traffic go now or where does it come from? It comes all the way from directly from West Virginia? West Virginia is one, one move. There's another one that comes out of Ohio. Um, and then we also ship out of our headquarter plant in uh, Illinois down to um so the that rule eleven rate would be Chicago to uh, destination. What I'm really after though is each time there would be a reciprocal switch in Hattiesburg. Is it yes? Is it more complicated than just dropping your cars off and having CM pick them up or vice versa? Well, I I think the answer today to that kind of question would be different than it would have been say a year ago because none of the railroads are, are very efficient right now. So logic would tell you that if, if you have a carrier directly serves the customer, their route should be more efficient, but that's not always the case because there's, there's instances, for example, we're getting product up to Sparta from Texas and some of those cars I just learned a couple weeks ago, uh, some of those cars sat at Decatur, Illinois for 10 days without moving on NS. And um, so in that case, you know, it would be that those were vendor cars, by the way, they were not diversified cars. In that case, it would be nice to be able to switch that business over to uh, CS Ducks. But um, it's been our control. It's not our control. But all we can do is try to trace the shipments and, and make sure they move. All I was trying to get at, maybe I didn't ask the question clearly. Yeah. The NS move of the propane is a single line, it sounds like, from West Virginia to your plant. Mm -hmm. if no. Were... no. 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 No, it's CSX Birmingham NS. Oh, I see. And then NS from Birmingham to your plant. Uh huh. And if you were going to respond to NS's demarketing by saying, "Well, give me a switch at Hattiesburg to CN," then what would the move have been made? How would the how would the stuff get to your plant on CN? It'd probably be over a different interchange, but it'd be CSX CN. I see. Um, okay. Well, that's, that's very help, helpful. I'm trying to, I think your experience helps put some of these issues into the real world situation. So for the moment, you're, uh, suffering silently with whatever deal you made with NS, it sounds like. Right. Yep. And trying, Maybe to not decide so silently. About, Pardon? trying to decide what to do about the plan. Yeah. yeah. Not so silently. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, other you're board welcome. members. Anyone have any questions? I do. Um, Robert, go ahead. Yeah, Senator, thank you very much uh, for being here today um, for your testimony. I I, I want to stay on that that this point about uh, your plant and the twenty four percent. Have you ever received an uh, uh, increase at the uh, to that extent before? No. Um, you know. The, the and again, as I've talked to, if you were on 
during the day, you know, I, I'm trying to focus on the economic implications of, of the of the chippers and, and what they're going through. Because of course we, we hear the railroads saying how much, you know, they stand to lose due to reciprocal switching, but, but not how much their customers are losing right now without it. So can you talk about the implications if you had to shut down that plant? Well, what would happen is um, we would shift, we wouldn't lose, we would, we would shift production the Western part of the uh, country to the Beaumont plant and we would shift production for uh, the East, Eastern part to uh, our Florida plant. But there would be people there who, you know, obviously would lose their jobs. Um, and even though you shift it to other plants, you're still looking at substantial loss overall. Would that be fair to it to say? Yes. Well, I mean, you've got infrastructure. We have to move. We have to get. We have to move not only uh, production facilities, but storage tanks and so forth. So, I mean, there. There's quite an expense to doing that, right? It's a major decision. And, and, and one of the reasons I'm asking it also is because uh, uh, we've heard time and again from folks, AAR and, and other railroads that uh, their number one focus is growth. They wanna grow their business. They wanna you know, uh, 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 compete and, and uh, uh, for, for new business and, and you know, treat their customers. And do, do you see what they're, what, what's happening now is an indication of that? Well, it depends on which railroad you're dealing with. I, I think there's there's some railroads like CSX that are they're aggressively trying to, to grow their business. Um, some are treading water because they're just trying to keep up with status quo right now. Doesn't mean that, that they don't want new opportunities, but they're so focused on on just trying to deal with the day to day issues that they aren't they aren't looking ahead. Um, and then there's other companies that are saying, you know what, we've got too much business, and um, we just can't handle what we have. I don't see they they don't mention what they're doing to address that. Right. What, what concerns me is if, if you look at the DOT projections for freight growth in freight volumes, um, this, is not, this is not a temporary issue. I mean, it's like this freight volumes are going to continue to increase. Driver shortage is going to continue to increase. Um, and so there's going to be a disconnect there. And it would be nice to know that the, the railroad planners are planning not only on how to do the business today, but what, what's it going to look like five years from now or 10 years from now? Right. Especially what it's going to look like with you, with you in the picture. Yes. Not in your mind uh, uh, being demarketed out, out of, uh, you know, out of a, a region you know, because of capacity. Mm-hmm. Well, I did remind them that uh, I do have capacity in the lane and it's called common carrier obligation. Um, they didn't seem, the managers I was talking to didn't seem to understand what that was, but um, they, they did tell me that diversified CPC wasn't the only customer they were talking to that they, they listed a long list of shippers they had to give similar messages to. And um, so it's not isolated. It's not, I didn't feel like we were, we were being picked on. I think it just, they, had, they have a, a capacity issue. Understood. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you, Robert. Other board members? Sandra, you are so precise and explicit in your discussion. There's no further questions for you. Uh, really, that you you know every uh, person who has uh, addressed us has enlightened us to a different kind of situation that 
needs to be taken into account as we think this through. And I hadn't heard about your specific problem. We have been hearing repeatedly from NS about crew shortages. Mm -hmm. And uh, to a lesser extent, it's been improved, but still there from CSX. Um, so I'm not shocked to hear how, C how NS is handling it. Um, and it is interesting because it, it, in your, your impression is that CN could handle your traffic if you could have yes. get a switch. Mm -hmm. did, by the way, did you talk to CN and ask him if there was some way that they could help you negotiate a deal with NS? No, but you know what I'm going to do tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be honest. By, 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 by law, I cannot accept a commission. <laughs> <laughs> But I would say this, I would be uh, very interested to hear if you're able to uh, negotiate any solution for this involving, well, any solution. You know, our CPA stands ready at the board, I'm sure you've dealt with them, to try to help. Uh, as good as they are, they can't manufacture crews for a railroad that has a shortage, no. but they might be able to provide you some assistance. So I would invite you to, to call on them, but let us know what happens be very enlightening, particularly as this proceeding continues. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra. Much uh -huh. appreciated. Okay. All right. Next up is uh, Indorama, which has three uh, representatives. Is everybody there? Hussam Awad, Barbara Hagler, and H. Baker Lane? I believe we are all here. All right. Are you, you are Barbara, I'm guessing. Yes, I am Barbara. <laughs> I'm the easier one to pick out, I think. Sometimes I'm just uh, really insightful. <laughs> uh, uh, why don't you uh, go ahead? The floor is yours. I sure will. I sure will. As, uh, as you said, I'm Barbara Hagler. I'm here representing Indorama, um, all the sites we have in North America. Um, I am here with uh, Hussam Awad, who is our Senior VP Procurement and Supply Chain for the Americas region as well as Lane Baker, uh, also North America um, Logistics Manager. We all belong to the part of Indorama that is combined PET segment. Uh, we're responsible for the commercial and operations of logistics functions for the majority of the sites within the Americas for Indorama, which includes all rail related active, excuse me, activities. We are the three who have personal firsthand experience with being captive shippers with the railroads, working with the railroads on service issues and uh, the rate negotiations since about the early 2000s. Um, before we get started, I'd, I'd like to take a minute and just thank the board uh, for having this hearing. Um, it's a matter that's extremely important to us, as well as clearly many other shippers. Um, a lot of us are captive and access to competition has been reduced or completely eliminated altogether. We intend to show that reciprocal switching is advisable. It meets a need and can be accomplished with minimal adverse effects. We commend the board for bringing reciprocal switching back to the forefront of discussion and holding this hearing to provide an avenue for, for us and other shippers and receivers to share our experiences, concerns, and strong support of this proposal. Sam's going to go now and tell you a little bit about Indorama, um, who we are, where we are, um, and our interests. Yes, thank you, Barbara. My name is Hossam Awad. I'm the Senior VP for uh, Indorama uh, for the Americas for Procurement and Logistics. I echo uh, Barbara's comments and I thank the board for having the meeting. This is not my first time uh, coming in front of the board. It is my first time virtually but I've been in Washington a couple of times uh, uh, giving some uh, presentations. So I'm gonna go through briefly about Indorama. Indorama's headquarter in uh, Bangkok, Thailand with a global operating sites uh, of about 33 three, three countries with 123 different operating locations. Uh, Indorama Ventures is, um, is listed in uh, Thailand uh, Stock Exchange with a global manufacturing footprint across Africa, Asia, Europe, and the Americas. Uh, the company profiles comprises of integrated PET, uh, fibers, uh, packaging, specialty chemicals, and olefins. Uh, we produce the, uh, 
they uh, produce and serve major fast moving consumer goods, automotive sector, beverage, hygiene, and uh, personal care, uh, along with tires, uh, safety segments. And Drama has approximately 24,000 employees worldwide and consolidated revenue of approximately $11 billion in 2020. The company is also listed in the Dow Jones Sustainability Index. Uh, specifically to the region, to North America, Andromeda has 21 manufacturing facility located in the US, Canada, Mexico, serving over 200 customers and over 300 transloading, and we, we use over 300 transloading sites. Uh, over the past decade, Andromeda has invested in greenfields, brownfields, and acquisitions in Americas, with the most recent being the pending acquisition of Occitino, with presence in Americas, in the US, Mexico, Uruguay, and Brazil. Uh, I'm not going to go over where the facilities are in, uh, in the US, but uh, I can mention that we're in North Carolina, South Carolina, um, uh, Texas, Alabama, uh, Louisiana. Uh, we have multiple sites in, in those, in those uh, states, along with uh, Mexico and uh, uh, Montreal, Canada. Um, all but one of Indrama sites and most of our suppliers and customers are captive to one class one railroad. This is uh, little to no competition. And we find that railroads are less willing to negotiate rates and act quickly to remedy service issues when our only uh, option is, is the railroad being captive to them. And maybe we have some uh, destination that we might be able to serve by trucks. Many sites are only set up to ship and receive products by rail. So there are times when we truly have no other option uh, than rail. We believe that increased competi competition encourage fair pricing and efficient service, uh, where the lack of rail competition allows the railroads to focus less on their customers and service and more on their own um, shareholders value. In Drama operate extensively in both the US and Canada. In our experience and observation, the Canadian competitive switching process or the inter-switching as we heard earlier, uh, operates effectively. While CN physically service our plant uh, in Montreal, uh, we have used uh, Canadian Pacific in the past on the reciprocal switching process we first exercised the op this option in 2018 and we were able to, to obtain a more reasonable rate. We also found service uh, that was not significantly um, affected. Uh, in some cases, we found it to actually improve. And in one of the cases, the railroad was willing to, uh, to adjust service to accommodate our needs. Um, in this instance, they, we were able to add a service day to a highly congested conju uh, junction to keep the supply chain flowing smoothly and decrease the bunching of rail cars we, that we were experiencing at the time. Without this com competition from another railroad, we do not believe we will have success in promoting this crucial change in our service. The reciprocal switching right in Canada helps, helps to keep rail freights reasonable and railroads quickly re reacting to service issues. It provides major benefits to shippers and receivers and has not resulted in significant adverse effects on the, but to the railroads by causing service problems. If anything, reciprocal switching has improved service overall for Indorama. In the US, railroads sometimes have shown tendencies to serve their own interests to the detriment of captive shippers' interest and the public interest. Most recently, this has been evidenced through the service issue that have been developed after class one railroad, with the exception of BN, began implementing precision schedule railroad in 2017. Through the impl implementation of the PSR in the US, Class one railroad over the past five years have closed hump yards, cut thousands of employees, reduced service, and changed overall operating guidelines to improve their operating ratios. 
This was done at the expense of their customers and employees. Based on numbers from STD uh, Form C on the STD website, since 2017, CSX has cut approximately 28% of its employees. UP has cut 26% since 2018, and NS has cut 27% since 2019. Since 2017, Indrama sites have experienced miss, missed switches at plants and customer sites, bunching of cars in transit leading to a feast or famine scenario at the delivery site, slow return of empty cars back to the operating sites and longer, much longer transit times. The railroads have, push, have pushed our sites to take on more expense and change operations to match the new process and operating strategies. We have had to increase, increase our rail, rail car fleet by over 10% in the past couple of years, solely due to inconsistency in the rail service and increased transit time. And we're about to increase our fleet again in the next six months by approximately seven to eight percent. And this is again due to the inconsistency in the service and transit time. We have brought on additional storage yards in addition to increase the fleet service at our expense to accommodate the changes in the, in the free time and the last mile operations and schedules. Service issues related to PSR implementation has not gone unnoticed by the board. And in Drama again commends the board for holding the railroad accountable for such service, uh, bad services. Beginning with the listening session in 2017 with CSX railroad executives to requesting service performance information toward the end of 2021, due to a steady stream of complaints about this, the standard performance, the board had tied to, tried to hold the railroad accountable for the problems caused by PSR. We understand that Indorama is not alone in having service issues with the railroads and changes uh, must be made. And now I'll turn it into Lane to give more uh, examples of the experience that we faced with, with the railroads and our operation. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and board members for allowing us to speak today. <clears throat> I'm Lane Baker. I'm one of the North America Logistics Managers for Indorama. Uh, to make matters worse, um, just as the railroads were smoothing out some of the problems caused by the implementation of PSR and service was beginning to improve in most locations, COVID-19 hit. The railroads had cut so many employees with PSR that they had been unable to recover as employees called out sick and left the railroad for other industries. Any small uptick in volume caused significant issues with the railroads. We've had multiple incidents of not receiving service needed by the class one railroads and having to slow or stop production lines at our plants as a result of lack of raw material rail cars being delivered to our plants. This is devastating to our business. <clears throat> in the plants in the Southeast, we've lost almost 110 million pounds of production in the last 14 months at one plant. Another plant in the Southeast lost production of over 5.5 million pounds over a six month period. Both sites have captured with com competing railroads nearby. Our plant in the Northeast lost production of over 57 million pounds during the first two months of 2022, mostly due to increased transit time and railroad delays resulting from crew shortages. The results in lost sales at, for our sites and the lost revenue by the railroads because we cannot ship what we cannot make. In addition, <clears throat> even though this inadequate rail service resulted in millions of dollars in damages to our company. We have no recourse um, to the serving railroads who will not provide any service type of guarantee and will not share any responsibilities for the damages it causes to our business. With reciprocal switching, we could keep our supply chain moving by engaging another class one railroad to help accommodate these huge gaps in the rail service by the serving railroad. We have had to ship trucks in many cases uh, when we've not been able to get our empty rail cars back to the plant in time to load and ship back to customers. In the past year, we've used multiple special train requests, which we pay significantly more for due to the lack of service by the railroads, ironically, but at least they kept our plants running. We were granted these special trains only on two occasions out of more than a dozen requests, the railroad, stating they did not have crews 
or power to make the special moves. During the <clears throat> during a 10 month duration in 2021, uh, one of our plants had to ship approximately 280 trucks to cover customer shipments, primarily due to rail service issues. With today's supply chain issues, trucks come at a very high cost. And even when we are willing to pay the higher rate, we cannot always find available equipment, especially if it's on a short term notice. Again, lost revenue for the rail railroads and much higher cost for Inderama. Inderama fully believes that if reciprocal switching was in place, providing competition where currently we are only served by one class one railroad, the railroads would be forced to focus more on servicing our plant's needs as required by the common carry obligation. If Inderama had another rail option that captured operating sites and customer sites, we would be able to switch to a railroad that provided the best service, not just the only one that's available. Examples of favoring railroad interest over captive shipping uh, shippers' interests and public interest also historically includes excessive rates and charges, paper barriers, over recovery fuel surcharges, restricted routing, and other techniques that impede access to more reasonable rates. Reciprocal switching will allow for the use of most effective routes and thereby provide improved service. When moving raw material from Wilmington, North Carolina to our Asheboro, North Carolina site, each captive to a different railroad, we must travel significant outer route miles for the two to connect. If reciprocal switching was in place, we could ship direct with just one class one and travel more effectively. Also shipping out of one of our Decatur, Alabama sites to a customer in the Northeast, one class one railroad must go through a short line, which is over congested and serve the customer. But the competing railroad has the ability to bypass the short line and shave days, if not even a week off of the current transit. With the global supply chain disruption due to the pandemic over the past two years, the railroads could have capitalized on additional volume by putting more product, by pulling more product from the highways and inland waterways. An effective and consistent rail system is critical in North America and in the Rama supply chain. <clears throat> now, more than ever, in the Rama values our relationships with the railroads and strives to open and honest communication, hoping to combine effort that results in pathways to improve service issues. We currently have sites that when we contact the local serving railroad representative, they cannot be reached live or anyone will return phone calls. They have even attempted meetings, but the response time is not improved. We must resort to contact corporate to get any kind of service response or actions from the local team. Reciprocal switching can help improve service by allowing more than one railroad to serve captive ship shippers and receivers and provide more options to move additional volume. And now I'll turn it over to Barbara. So I know we're out of time, so I'm going to uh, uh, extremely abridge my version uh, of talking about how it benefits rates. Uh, I think we've heard multiple times that uh, competition does, in fact, uh, um, bring lower rates. Uh, we, we've seen service issues on the rise. Our rates are on the rise. Um, and we're finding that railroads are no longer using um, cost-based methods or distance or other historical type of um, uh, costing methods uh, to come up with their rates. Now it's just basically based on, well, this is what the market is or what they perceive the market to be. When there's no competition, the market's kind of what they want to make it. Um, we're seeing their operating ratios um, increase significantly. Um, I, I believe one class one um, in an article uh, from their uh, fourth quarter full year 21 financials um, showed that their operating ratio increased by over 11% while during the same period, um, it was a 15% increase in revenue, but a 4% decrease in volume. So clearly it's just by the rates that they're charging. Um, we are absolutely observing that when we have a uh, dual served customer, um, we, there is more competition, uh, we get much better rates, um, we're able to actually negotiate, and um, uh, we've, we've had success with our Montreal plant as well, using the interest switching that they have in Canada, um, keeping those rates more reasonable as well. Um, so in conclusion, um, we just, again, thank the board for uh, allowing us to speak and we uh, respectfully urge uh, the STB to uh, adopt the reciprocal switching rules proposed in the proceeding. 
Um, the argument is stronger now than ever um, because of the implementation of PSR. Um, uh, we believe that the implementation of the rules in this proposal will improve the service of our railroads and make their networks more eff eff efficient and effective. Um, thank you for your time and uh, we'll open it up to questions. All right, thank you very much, uh, Barbara. I'd like to just drill down and get a little more specific information. Uh, I saw that you have 21 plants in North America. How many locations are in the US? So we have um, the, the only plants that we actually have um, in the Americas outside of the US. We have one in Canada and one in Mexico. Oh, so um, the other 19 are in the yes. US. And we, we are continuing to grow. And it sounds like you're generally scattered around the country. So are you, when you say you're, do, are all the plants, serve, uh, rail serve plants? Yes. Yes. So there, would it be fair to say that every one of the, do you deal with every one of the class ones or? Yes. Yeah, we deal with NS, CSX, CN, CP, um, UP, KCS, and BN. Um, so I'm a little uh, confused by one of the things that Mr. Lane said. You you have a you have two locations in North Carolina, I think, and you said that they were served by different class ones at each end. So if you could have had a switch, you could have had one single line connection between the two. I'm, I sort of I couldn't follow the way you were explaining that. So yeah, go ahead, Barb. I was just say I can speak to that because it's right. it's somewhat of a commercial. Um, as well as a operations issue. It's actually one of our suppliers is um, on the coast of North Carolina. Our plant is in Asheboro and um, the supplier is served by one Eastern Rail Railroad. The plant is served by another because there is, for lack of a better way to say it, no way to get there from one place to the next without kind of going around your elbow. Um, we're adding a lot of miles and a lot of transit to the route because the two have to connect. However, the railroad, the CSX, which serves the coast, the supplier, can get within 30 miles of our plant. But because it's not a standard interchange point, they won't use that and they have to come through Charlotte. So they're going way out of route to go back up north to connect in Charlotte with the Norfolk Southern rather than connecting with them in high point. And we feel if reciprocal switching was in place, that high point location would be more of a feasible location because they are, they do connect there and they do hand cars off there from time to time. It's just not a standard junction. Uh, Does that what, make more sense? Yes, how, how much extra mileage is it to go to Charlotte? We, we look believe, at that, Barbara, I think, yeah. Yeah, I was going to say, I believe it was 150 extra miles. Yeah. Well, what is the name of the interchange point you'd like to use? High Point? High Point. Yeah. One of them calls it High Point and one of them calls it High Rock, but it's the same location. Is there any uh, reciprocal switching going on there now with other shippers, to your knowledge? Not that I'm aware of. Um, we have a storage facility there um, on the HP uh, High Point in Denton on a short line and um, they both can reach that facility. Um, but it's. Uh... Well, you and I've looked at their uh, tariffs. I don't see a location there, but well, let me ask, uh, you've heard me ask these questions of both the railroads and other shippers about trying to proceed on an incremental basis by perhaps focusing on allowing switching where it's already taking place by the railroads, reciprocal switching. Do you have any sense of the, where your plants are located? Are they close enough to either terminals or yards where switching goes on now that that would still benefit some of these 19 locations? Yeah, it depends on how, what's the radius. I mean, it was gonna be 
30 miles or maybe 35, 40 miles, I think we'll, we'll have some location that will benefit from that. Well, it, it may be that the way to define it is not by the mileage, but by where your cars are normally switched. Uh, I, would it be fair to say, I'm trying to understand how this system works and we've had others explain that for the most part, a local train from the class one services your location. Is that a, a way to understand the way you work with your class ones or is it with short lines? Yes, it, well, go ahead, Lane. No, it, it's the class ones. Yeah. Right, so in each case, is it a, a local train? It's not a long haul train that's picking up your cars and going directly to the destination, right? You're going to a yard someplace. Right, there's a local train it picks up at the uh, facilities. No. And typically how far is it from your plant to the yard that the local train operates out of? Uh, well, in the case of Ashburg, it's like 30, it's less than 30 miles. And do you know if any of those yards are yards that the class one is using for any reciprocal switching for any customers? Yeah, I, I don't know if they're using uh, those yards for reciprocal switching myself, so we'd have to read that. But the, but the other railroad, there is another railroad that also uses that yard, correct? Oh. Yeah. Uh, Uh, okay, because I, I have a, uh, you know, I've been looking at these tariffs and I see that Indorama is listed in the reciprocal switching tariff that CSX has for Decatur, Alabama. Yes, Decatur, yes. Decatur, and there is a special arrangement between NS and CSX. And what, what and you are allowed reciprocal switching there? Yes. When when the destination is located on CSX, then yeah. we we take it to the interchange, NS picks it up and take it to the interchange, and then CSX takes it to the destination. So, say, that, go say that for me again. Who picks it up? NS. So NS serves the plant indicator. Uh -huh. I, think, I think the piece that who Sam that uh, if the if the destination is served directly by the NS, we have to give that destination to the NS. Correct. But it's but the tariff is listed in CSX's reciprocal switching tariff. So how does that work? I'm, I'm sorry, I miss. I misspoke. I am looking at the Norfolk Southern reciprocal switching. Yeah. 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 So you're right. Yep. I got it. Okay. <laughs> I got too much paper in front of me. Okay. <laughs> uh, sorry about that. So you do have a reciprocal switching tariff with NS at Decatur. Is that, that's the only, is that the only place? In, yes, but, uh, yes. But again, it's not really, it, it depends on the destination. If the destination is CSX, then it, CSX takes the cars and take it there. So it's, it's, it's still a one, one railroad. So there's no true competition yeah. that is encouraged by this because the only thing the CSX can, can quote on is something that they deliver to. If NS is taking it to a West Coast carrier, class one or to a, a short line, if the NS can get there in any way, um, then we have to negotiate with the NS. Correct. We don't have the option of using the CSX. It's only when the CSX is the delivering railroad or a short line that the CSX only connects with. You're saying that that's the only tariff NS would give you for that location? Yes. Yes. Could, could you physically get to where you want to go through CSX if they would allow you? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. I got it. And do you have any idea what kind of, you know, we've heard a lot about the complexity of doing these reciprocal switches. Do you have any idea what kind of a move is made when you leave your plant on NS and switch to CSX? Is it just dropping it off at the yard and picking it up on a CSX train, picking it up? Well, in the Canada, the local would pick it up and take it back to the NS yard 
And yeah. then they, they would move it from the NS yard to the CSX interchange. Who would, who moves it? In, NS. NS. Well, either way, it's got to be switched to the NS yard. If it's staying on NS, it's going to get on a, off the local and onto a, another train. Correct. So in the NS yard, there's only one move. It either is to NS or to CSX. Right. Right. Yeah. And when it gets to the CSX yard, it just goes to a classification track for where it's going on CSX. So it's one more move. One. Yes. Is that right? That's yep. right. Okay. Well, it'd be interesting to, uh, I would be interested to uh, ask you to explore, if you wouldn't mind, whether any of your other servicing yards or classification yards are yards are yards where we've got so many plants i don't want you to take up time to name them all here today uh and tell us whether those are yards that any of your sole serve railroads currently have reciprocal reciprocal switching tariffs in place for any shippers it's a concept i'm trying to get enlightened on here as mm -hmm. to how, how much of a of a relief it would be for the kind of circumstances you're talking about if that is the way we limit it, decided to limit it in the rule. Um, you know, the railroads raised the concern about opening up all kinds of interchanges now where they aren't doing that kind of switching. Mm -hmm. Maybe they're right, maybe they're not, but if we go to places where they're already doing reciprocal switching, it seems to me it lessens the, as some of the railroads have acknowledged, it lessens any concern about congestion, uh, at least as I understand it. So I, I'd be interested in hearing about that. The, um, uh, you know, you've got a lot of experiences that are difficult. Have you, let me ask you this, have you tried to use our good offices at RCPA for many of these problems? You've detailed to us here over the last year or two? Um, you mean service issues? Yes. Yeah, we, we have actually, um, uh, we, we actually met um, with the, the, you know, the, the former chairman um, in, in uh, Washington, DC. We uh -huh. had some issues with, uh, with NS and uh, um, th there was, advice how to approach NS, which we, of course, we, you know, we, we of course adopted, but it took a long time back and forth uh, between us and NS to come to a resolution about some of the issues that were happening at this, at that time. All right. Well, thank you. It's a very enlightening. I would like to get your follow-up if you have time to do it on some of these questions. Um, let me uh, see if any other board members have any questions for you. Patrick. It's Karen. Oh, I'm sorry, Karen. <laughs> I think it's Michelle, not, not me. You know what, you know what happens, just so the rest of the world doesn't think I'm losing my mind. <laughs> All of these little messages to me come up under Patrick's name because he started the chain yesterday. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so, well, I have one, but I'll let Michelle go first. Yeah. All right, Michelle, you're up. <laughs> you're on mute, Michelle. There you are. Boy, the, the lateness of the day is getting to me here apologies um just uh, you may have covered this already but in the area that you actually uh have the switch in place are you able to speak to how how that occurred was it something that that was re requested and negotiated how did that come into play you mean the the decatur that we just talked about yes Okay, so that from my understanding, it was I mean that that site we acquired in 2016, it's a BP site. So we, we were not there more more than that. But from what I understand from the road, there is an agreement between NS and CSX about this uh, this yard or switch yard to do the the reciprocal switching, 
indicator in exchange to do another reciprocal switching in a yard in Tennessee. So there was something between the two uh, uh, railroads that benefited both of them, not for the shippers. Okay, thank you. You good, Michelle? Okay. Um, again, thanks for uh, taking time to, to come before us. Uh, if I could, uh, I want to, uh, Lane, I want to ask you again, you talked about the, the losses that, you, that you, you've been sustaining uh, uh, since, you know, with all the service relate, related issues. Um, and you said with, it's in millions of dollars of damage. Do you guys have a, have a, uh, a ballpark figure how much you guys are losing or have lost? because of uh, uh, service issues? I, uh, Sam, you probably have a better number on the, the millions of dollars that uh, from, the, from the true rack up. Yeah, I mean, we can get you that, Robert. I, I think we have the, the volumes, the production loss, uh, but we can easily get, get you those numbers. And, and you, and I appreciate that. Thank you. You also said that uh, I think there was somewhere like 280 trucks that you had been using. Um, you know, if if service had been provided in a way that that uh, uh, you guys expected, how much, how many of those trucks would you not have used? But if the service had been there, we wouldn't have used the. Truck. Okay. Yeah. The the only reason we use trucks is because of the poor service. Right. And, and you, you've been using trucks uh, at that rate for, for how long? Or has it been going on for months, for years, since PSR, as, as uh, 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 you, know, you alluded to earlier? Is, it, is, it, is this continual? It's a continual. It's been continual. I don't know that it, that it would go back two years, but I know in the last year and a half, we've been extremely heavy on trying to get trucks. And as I indicated, with the market being tight on trucks, I mean, it's almost impossible to get some trucks. So how, how does this sort of play out? And again, you know, this is uh, sound like a broken record, but I think I, I want to sort of make the case because of folks coming forward. Uh, you know, we hear on from, from the rail side of, of the economic implications of, of reciprocal switching. Uh, you know, what are the implications on, on your business if, if we weren't to do it and when we can continue status quo? You know, could you, you know, how, how, how much of a hit would it, would it be on, on your business if you continue this model? Well, I think, I mean, if we continue at the rate we're going, I mean, obviously it's costing us millions of dollars extra in freight just because we're, of all the trucking we're doing and, 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 the, and the poor service we're getting from the railroad. So that and a loss of revenue. Yeah, yeah loss of revenue, yeah. yeah. So that, does that, is that passed along to, 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 to your customers? Uh, we... We have not passed the loss along to the customers, uh, but obviously, you know, with some of the higher freight charges that we're seeing in trucks, I mean, we can't uh, deliver at the same price on truck that we are with uh, with rail. Right, and I'm not saying it's just thrown out, but I'd say at some point, you know, your ability to sort of bear the, the burden uh, is not going to be there. Would that be fair to say? Right. Yeah, I mean, we, I mean, when we have uh, supply agreements with our customers, we have arrangement to, um, um, you know, arrange for the for the rail cars to get to them. So we negotiate with the railroad, and then we agree on a you know supply agreement with pricing economics. So if the cars are not there, we have to to carry the burden to get the product to them, even though we're paying more in using trucks. All right. Does that answer your question? It does. It okay. does. So, uh, and that that was the last one. So thank you. Uh, uh, any other uh, questions from the board? Uh, let me just ask one uh, sort of broad question. Uh, if you, looking back over the last couple of years when you say you've really been suffering from these service problems, are, are they focused primarily on one or two of the railroads? Or are they equal across all of the class ones as, as, as far as your plants are concerned? They're equal, yeah. The one that adopted PSR, at least, except BN. So, but BN had their own, they also have some issues, but not to the same extent. 
So it's CSX, NS, and UP that are your principal print. Is CN, would you include them as yeah. problematic as well? Yes. Okay. Uh, Morning, I got one more question. So in, in, ahead, uh, in that line of thinking, you know, um, you know, again, we've been talking about growth and, and railroads have talked about growth. Have, have you seen a uh, uh, considerable increase in your, in your rates during, the, during this, this period also? Correct. I mean, once you're captive, right, there is very little room to negotiate because you don't have much options. Uh, like we talked, one of the, I think it was yesterday, um, you know, in some cases, depending on how far the customer is away from the origin, you know, trucks are competitive. But once you reach a certain distance, it becomes more expensive. Thank you. Sorry, Martin. No, it's all right. Okay. If there are no further questions, uh, Indirama, thank you. I know you have participated in other board hearings since I've been on the board, and uh, I really appreciate your stepping up to the plate repeatedly and taking time to talk to us. It's, uh, it's really quite important, and if you do have time to give us any of this follow-up material, I'd love to see it. We'll do. We'll do it. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. All, all right. We have one final witness on this panel, Mark Scribner from the Reason Foundation. Hi, Chairman Oberman and members of the board. Uh, thank you for holding today's hearing and providing me an opportunity to present. Uh, I promise to go quickly because I know you have another panel uh, following me. Uh, my name is Mark Scribner and I'm a senior transportation policy analyst at Reason Foundation, a national nonprofit public policy research and education organization with expertise across a range of policy areas, including transportation. At Reason, I focus on matters related to transportation technology, such as vehicle automation, and I'm also a member of the Transportation Research Board's Standing Committee on Emerging Technology Law. Others at this proceeding ex have expressed concern about the additional operational complexity and negative impact on fluidity that the board's proposal may unnecessarily introduce into America's rail networks. We share those concerns about possible short run operational impacts, but I would like to focus my remarks today on what we view as an under discussed topic at the board, and that is the potential impact of the proposed reciprocal switching rule on investments in automation that we believe are critical to ensuring rail's long-term viability and competitiveness as a freight transportation mode in the United States. During the last decade, automated road vehicles have captivated the public with the prospect of self-driving taxis and last mile delivery robots, improving safety and convenience in urban areas. Much of the popular coverage is focused on these passenger and small cargo use cases, but development has also been ongoing in the heavy duty truck market segment. Waymo, formerly the Google self-driving car project, is developing fully automated long haul trucks under its Waymo Via brand that are currently uh, being tested on highways in the Southwestern US. Other companies such as Locomation are developing cooperative automated systems that would allow trucks to automatically follow the direction of leading truck. Uh, saving fuel through reduced aerodynamic drag, which was the initial uh, impetus for that research and, and, and development and deployment, but potentially labor costs if drivers and following trucks and potentially eventually leading trucks can be relieved of their duties. This technology has the potential to cut truck operating costs by nearly half and lead to the development of so-called road trains. Most significantly, these coordinated convoys of driverless trucks could greatly reduce rail's traditional advantage over trucks for numerous commodity groups. U.S. freight railroads are now experiencing truck automation firsthand. In early February of this year, Union Pacific and automated truck developer Too Simple announced a partnership to launch a fully automated 80-mile truck route from a Tucson rail yard to a Phoenix area distribution center. These technologies remain under development, and wide-scale deployment is likely some years away. However, the eventual deployment of highly or fully automated heavy-duty trucks coupled with leader-follower coordination capabilities is expected to significantly reduce road freight transportation costs and impact competition between trucks and rail. Unsurprisingly, railroads are interested in a variety of automation technologies to improve safety, productivity, and their competitive standing with other modes that are anticipated to become increasingly automated. Train automation is likely to be incremental as functions are gradually automated and personnel are relieved from certain tasks as safety is assured. 
For instance, an incremental automation phase in would allow for reducing uh, train crew sizes from two to one, which Oliver Wyman in 2015 estimated could save US railroads up to $2.5 billion per year by 2030. Certain lower risk operations, such as those in rail yards or those involving shorter trains, are likely to see automation technology deployed sooner. But long distance automated train operations may be on the horizon as mining giant Rio Tinto Group successfully demonstrated three years ago with its deployment of auto haul iron ore unit trains in Western Australia. We are concerned that the board's proposed rule would negatively impact railroads returns on investment, thereby reducing their incentive to invest in train automation research, development and deployment. It is generally research and development of unproven technologies that get cut first when shareholders throttle capital expenditures in order to maintain their desired returns on investment through proven business lines. The board should avoid disadvantaging freight rail relative to its modal competitors, which would likely incentivize customers to shift traffic from rail to trucks. This would have private as well as social costs. When compared to freight rail, the EPA estimates that trucks emit 10 times as much carbon dioxide per ton mile and more than three times as much particulate matter. Thus, even a small degree of modal substitution would increase the transportation sector's emissions intensity. We urge the board to proceed with caution to ensure the public interest is protected. And with that, thank you again for the opportunity to present Reason Foundation's views to the board, and I welcome any questions or comments. Uh, thank you, Mr. Scribner. I have a couple of questions. Uh, in your prepared remarks, you cited as authority for your position the uh, AAR, um, I guess it's the animated video I've seen that shows 68 locomotive operations to make a switch. That was the thing on, on Railway railway Age featured it. Um, yes. Uh, and uh, you just took that at face value as the switches would require 68 moves? I, I took, well, I, and I say in there, it may not be the, the typical switch, may not be that complex, but I did highlight, the, I, 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 I highlighted the, the video. Well, why cite it to us? Oh, I just, I included that as the citation as, as something I, you know, I, I, now that I think about it, you probably had already, already seen that. Oh, I had seen it. That's why I asked you why you cited it. I, I haven't seen anybody who actually runs a rail yard show us how 68 moves are needed. Yesterday, UP showed us that it took one extra move. Did you watch that testimony yesterday? I, did, I didn't see the, the UP testimony yesterday, but there is that, that video and it's, a, it's, it's several minutes. Um, it's 14 it goes minutes. through but, all that. And I, I took it at face value. Yeah, it's 14 minutes. Yeah. I took it at face value too, but I took it differently. Uh, you know, you you said that our uh, reciprocal switching rule is going to force more traffic on the trucks. Did you hear the testimony today about the poor railroad service forcing more traffic on the trucks from the scrap dealers and from Indorama? I did, and this this case, what I'm what I'm the the hypothetical here or the potential impact here is a second order effect, um, uh, what I'm talking about. And I brought this to the board's attention because I don't think it's been, it's been discussed. Um, and you know, from in, the, in the research setting, the uh, train automation very, very early on, I mean, most automation in the railroad industry right now has been focused on, on things like automated track inspection, uh, automated train operations, particularly in the freight context, uh, and especially in the United States, um, not uh, really happening uh, right now. But because of what is going on in um, the trucking market, uh, where there is intense interest, um, uh, I mean, automotive total, tens of billions of dollars in recent years invested in automation uh, research uh, endeavors there. Um, so that is why we are we are highlighting that as a as a potential second order effect of a uh, of a of a proposed rule if it if it causes shareholders uh, to throttle capital expenditures in order to maintain their uh, their returns. Okay. Anybody else have questions for Mr. Scribner? Karen, I thought. Uh, you Mr. Chairman, I do. 
Yes, go ahead. Uh, Mr. Scribner, it's great to see you here today. I'm very familiar with the Reason Foundation and worked very closely with Robert Poole for a number of years um, getting uh, the whole concept of uh, privately developed toll roads and privately operated uh, and developed uh, airports in the United States uh, off the ground. But I have to say that um, for an organization that touts itself as free minds for free markets, I'm a little surprised that Reason would come here and advocate against more competition uh, in the railroad uh, industry. I realize that's not quite the thrust of your testimony. You're really talking about what the potential is for uh, automation, but I wanted uh, to make that point. Um, secondly, uh, your written remarks seem to suggest that automation, uh, automated trucks <clears throat> will <clears throat> could provide a good alternative uh, to railroads. But uh, again, I wonder why uh, reason is suggesting that when automated trucks have to run on highly subsidized highways as opposed to uh, trains, which uh, uh, our, our freight rail system is not subsidized uh, at any to any extent uh, at all. Um, and then thirdly, um, I do not share your concern that uh, uh, any increased costs on the railroads from this uh, this proposed uh, rule would crimp investment uh, in automation. It's obvious that the railroads today are highly profitable and have plenty of money to uh, put into uh, looking at alternative technologies. And I think I share with you um, the expectation that automated uh, locomotives uh, could uh, be very beneficial in the operation of railroads, in particular uh, in, um, uh, in movements uh, uh, within yards, uh, maybe for switching, uh, and also uh, perhaps uh, at our ports to help uh, clear them out faster. So I just wanted to make those three points, and the next time you see Bob Poole, tell him hello for me. <laughs> Uh, well, well, thank you very much for those questions. And uh, so I guess where we're coming from on the on, on where sort of truck automation fits into this, and you're absolutely right, we are we're strong supporters of, of road pricing and, and self-supporting road infrastructure uh, and have been for many years. Uh, but what we're really talking about here is sort of where the the technology for the the vehicle technology seems to be going, which is a separate question, largely a sec separate question from those infrastructure questions. Now there are some interactions potentially, especially at the cooperative automation levels, where you're going to probably need some additional infrastructure treatments in order to facilitate those kinds of operations. Same thing is true of you know, the rail, rail automation is likely going to uh, have some significant infrastructure components. It's not just going to be sensors on the on the locomotive, uh, mm -hmm. for instance. But um, we see this as just the direction of where vehicle technology is going. Uh, regardless, and if you if you listen to these companies, these developers, they say they specifically say, at least right now, by and large, they do not want any infrastructure changes. They are designing their technologies, their automated driving systems to operate on the roads of today. Um, so I'm taking them at, at face value there as well. Um, and we are trying to figure out, you know, what does this mean for the overall uh, competitive landscape of, of freight transportation in America? And, and you're absolutely right. I mean, this has less, much less to do with, with rail to rail competition, which has been the major focus of this hearing, and much more to do with, with rail to truck competition. Um, and that is, you know, I think that's where we're, we're going. I think, you know, in this automated future, we're probably going to see a lot more integration of the modes than we have today. Um, and that is sort of, that's our general approach and how we're, how we're trying to think through these issues. Um, yeah, I see that. I, I, uh, if you can get the trucking companies to agree to support told uh, truck lanes, uh, that would be great. I know that's something Bob is trying to get has tried to get for like 10 or 15 Many years. years. <laughs> the trucking industry has not been receptive to that whatsoever. So these automated trucks are still going to be running on highways that are subsidized by billions of dollars. It's the highest 
um, of all the modes, it is uh, certainly the highest subsidized mode uh, in the country and will be for the future. Agree. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Patrick? Yes, I, thank you, Mr. Scribner. Um, I'm wondering if it, um, you, you had mentioned uh, actually in, in your testimony that the trucking industry is spending billions of dollars uh, pushing towards automation. I'm wondering if you have conducted an assessment of how much the rail industry is spending currently. I haven't, I haven't done an assessment of, of rail industry spending. And like I, I said to, uh, to uh, Ms. Hedlund, I think the, the, the vast majority of that, if you were to do that assessment, would show up in automated track inspection, um, at least domestically in the United States. Globally, uh, in, in, like I said, Australia, that was the example with Rio Tinto. Uh, there's some Japanese involvement there with that technology, ATO, some in Europe as well. But ATO, I mean, keep in mind, is traditionally thought of in the passenger context, passenger rail context. So it's, it's, it's fairly new in just to see it in freight rail at all. Um, and that's why, you know, I don't think any of this is going to, you know, we're not going to flip a switch and suddenly have this available. There is a lot of research and development to do, but... Um, yeah, like I said, I think the majority of what you're seeing is in the uh, in the uh, track inspection. Yes. Now, you know, which, of course, is a little bit different than I think what you were describing in terms of automation overall, you know, in terms of the, the operations as opposed to the inspection. I'm, I'm sort of wondering, considering that railroads control their right away. Right. And have integration between their infrastructure and um, and their, their operating vehicles and their, their trains. Um, I, I'm sort of wondering whether or not you think that that level of investment in operating automation makes sense to you from, from a market perspective or uh, whether or not there's any insight to be gleaned about you know, what I think you described as a lot more investment in automation going to, in truck versus rail? Yeah, I, I think that's a great point. And you know, where you're going to see, you know, I mentioned some of the infrastructure treatments that you're likely to see. You know, Western Australia, very, very rural. You know, you're not dealing with the kind of urban uh, uh, context. Right. That we, and, and as you know, I am sure you've studied the Rio Tinto model. I, I have too. It's, it is pretty much a direct shot, loop track, no interchange, not a mixed manifest. I mean, you described it as a unit. Correct. I understand it. It is it is mine to destination, right? Well, it is a, it is a, on the main line. Yeah. I mean, that is where, and that's where it's operating as it approaches the, the ports. That's where you get, it does become crude. And during that period, this isn't, you know, you're not letting it out in the wild without any kind of supervision. There is, there is supervision uh, at the rail control center uh, where they can check in. And that's, you know, uh, uh, what I was about to say um, was, at grade crossings, that's probably where you're going to put in the kind of the both CCTV, which they did in Australia, but experimenting with various types of sensors. Because you know, in, in the truck, uh, in the in the automotive automation context, one of the major sensors that they're deploying is lidar. Well, lidar has a, I mean, that's perfect in a in a road context, but it has a range of you max out at at a couple hundred meters which isn't going to do, you know, if you've got the stopping distance of a one and a half mile train, that's not going to, to do you uh, much good. I, I totally hear you. Um, and and um, I, I totally hear, and that's a problem that exists today. To, it, it's something to be thought about with automation. And as I understand the Rio Tinto route has many fewer grade crossings than we typically see in, a, in American railroads as well. Correct, um, and they, you're right. Yeah. And that, now, would, switching, that would impact the cost. You're, you're absolutely right, the cost. Though. Yeah, now switching to the kind of the, Bring us back to, to the rule, you know, sup suppose we, you know, I, you could, there's one theory that, you know, increasing competition really is what drives innovation. When I talk to railroads and what's motivating them to think about things like dynamic block and, you know, better supply, supply chain visibility with items like rail pulse and other things, it's truck competition that's driving them to innovate and their competition, obviously having our line sufficient profit allows you to make those investments as well. Um, uh, and I, I'm sort of wondering, is, is there something that you would suggest that the board take a look at if it were to promulgate a rule to know whether or not it is compromising some of those, uh, you know, some, some, some of what you're describing in terms of the impact on 
uh, the railroad's ability to invest in um, uh, automation or new technologies, let's say generally. Is there something that you would suggest if the board were to say engage in the intensive oversight? I think you heard Mr. Nolan or Dr. Nolan talk about you know, service and other things. Is there something you'd suggest that we would look at to know whether or not the rule is compromising? That. I would have to I would have to think about that some more to give you a specific you know uh, recommendation there. Happy to do that. Um, and I and I think you know just to say I I think Professor Nolan made some great points. Um, but uh, you know this is like I said this is because we don't have I mean we have you could call them somewhat commercial, quasi commercial operating context in, in with with automated trucks today but very very little you know you've got some some partnerships I, I mentioned one but you've got one on go you've got middle mile service with with Gaddock and Walmart and, and things like that very very kind of small potatoes uh, uh, so we're not at the point where you know I think we're even we can really even see how this would impact the trucking market let alone impact the rail market. Um, but I will, you know, I will, I will yeah, give that some right. thought. I, I appreciate that. I think all of us are cognizant and attentive to any unintended consequences of the rule. So if, if you do have suggestions for um, ways for the board to think about that, you know, beyond just looking at revenue adequacy every year, uh, we'd appreciate them. Thank you. Sure. All right. Thank you. Are there any further questions for Mr. Scribner? Mr. Scribner, thank you for taking the time to come talk to us. Much appreciate it. Uh, and uh, it is exactly four o'clock. We have one more panel to go. So we will take a 10 minute recess and we will uh, reconvene at 410 Eastern.
All right, everybody, welcome back uh, to the reciprocal switching hearing, and this is our final panel. So I will call up uh, Norfolk Southern, Canadian National, CSX, uh, Cindy Sanborn, David Sappington, Dr. Mark Israel, and, and Ray Atkins. And Ray, I see you're appearing for both CSX and NS. For CN, we have Rob Riley, Bernd Beyer, Andreas Epley, Catherine Ganey, and Matthew Warren. Uh, and for CSX, we all have, so have Sean Pelkey. So with that, um, Norfolk Southern, you want to begin? Hey, thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Um, good afternoon. Ray Atkins on behalf of Norfolk Southern. Let me apologize right in advance for my voice. I can happily report I have a very normal cold, but it's uh, wreaking havoc on my voice today. <clears throat> Norfolk Southern objects to the 2016 forced access proposal. The 2016 proposal was an assault on demand-based differential pricing by which some customers pay higher rates than others. The desire for lower rates is natural. But here are the twin problems with the 2016 proposal. First, rate regulation is about striking the right balance between protecting a shipper from high rates and permitting the railroad to engage in differential pricing so that it can earn a reasonable return and profit on its investments. This backdoor attempt at rate regulation elevates the first goal and disregards the second. Second, this proposal comes at a large and unnecessary cost. Injecting inefficiency into the network to drive down rates for a subset of, of shippers is a tax on the entire network. Direct regulation of rates avoids that tax entirely. So Norfolk Southern believes that if the concern is about rates, then the board should and must regulate rates directly and you have a voluntary arbitration pro proposal before you to do just that. And if your concern is about service, well, this 2016 proposal is unlikely to help. It is more likely to make matters worse. And again, you already have a number of superior tools available, specifically your regulations at 49 CFR 1147. So today, Norfolk Southern's Chief Operating Officer, Sydney Sanborn, will explain how the 2016 proposal would inject operating inefficiency into the network and will exacerbate the challenges inherent with network planning. She will be followed by Dr. Mark Israel of Compass Lexicon, who will touch uh, briefly on the importance of demand-based differential pricing, explain the extraordinary breadth of the 2016 proposal and describe the lack of any real empirical reasons for such a sea change. And then finally, Professor David Sappington from the University of Florida will explain how economists approach access pricing if the STB were to proceed either with the 2016 proposal or perhaps a more incremental approach as Chairman Oberman has been exploring over the past two days. So with that, I will turn the mic over to Cindy Sanborn. Thank you, um, Mr. Chairman. I'm uh, Cindy Sanborn, Executive Vice President and Chief Operating Officer for Norfolk Southern. And I appreciate the opportunity to speak today at this very important proceeding. Network planning is, an, is inherently complex. When you operate a network, you must worry about network impacts. Every user within the network wants to optimize their piece of what they see. But as a network operator, you must be mindful of optimizing the whole. To open a location to reciprocal switching impacts not just the customers that decide to use the switch, but also the customers already in that area. In effect, optimizing one piece can lead to suboptimizing the whole. In listening to testimony at this hearing from shippers who are projecting how they would be using or utilizing the reciprocal switching option, I hear the notion that a shipper would potentially use the open switching option if they had severe service issues with the original carrying railroad. 
And the shipper would have every incentive to move traffic to another railroad only where it would not impair their service. And I believe them. But how could an individual shipper understand the impact to other shippers at that location? Managing the network by definition requires the duty to manage all shippers that desire to use rail and find the best outcome for all shippers, not just one. Creating uncertainty of how to go about this is due to unpredictable use of reciprocal switching creates extreme concern, especially considering the number of locations on our network that would potentially be open to switching. We've prepared a map that is our, in our written materials that Ray will now project. And when you look at the, these multiplicity of locations, and the multiplicity of locations covering all areas of our network, providing resources, additional switching required, and managing unexpected volume with existing infrastructure will have negative, unanticipated consequences. Managing the network is hard enough to do when we have real-time visibility on how our network is operating, how it is constrained by factors both within and beyond our control, and how those factors are changing every day. Once you force open a switch, you will have added a constraint to our network that will remain with us indefinitely, even if it no longer makes sense, if it ever made sense. What I heard from the shipper panels yesterday is that this constraint will appear very quickly if the STB were to Im implement the proposed rule. What I heard is they plan to bring cases to open switches as part of their contingency planning to address the possibility of future service issues. Bringing those cases will cost shippers very little, maybe some legal fees. But once those switches are open, we will begin incurring costs immediately because we will need to plan for a shipper with an open switch suddenly deciding that it wants, to, wants us to interchange with a competing carrier and vice versa. We will need to divert additional resources to that location to plan for this change in our operations. And that diversion will most certainly have collateral impacts elsewhere in the network. Impacts would likely be felt in several areas. Four examples come to mind. One, how should we plan for locomotives? With additional traffic, will the additional traffic require more locomotives for a local or any road train carrying this volume away from the serving yard? Number two, even if NS is a receiver of the traffic that would be handled with an existing local, we would add workload to that existing local. The additional switching would most likely take more time and put at risk other shippers on the local's route being switched within the federally mandated hours of service. And even if the interchange occurred in an existing location, there is no certainty that the existing infrastructure would be sufficient to support the additional volume. What happens to cars if a customer has more cars than they can handle at the facility? Who will hold them between the delivering railroad and the switching railroad? As I look at the map with all the potential locations subject to force switching, I feel great discomfort. How can we plan the network today for the possibility that any one of these locations can be opened and traffic shift as a result of its opening? This creates a network constraint in my mind. For switching is no way to improve service. Even if it improves service for customers requesting it, and I doubt that it will, it most certainly creates collateral impacts that will complicate the operation of the network and make it much harder to serve other customers. Mr. Chairman, you've, you've given us a lot to think about when your questions during this proceeding relating to the examination of existing reciprocal switching locations already in our tariffs. In NS's case, they are listed in the NS 8001A, where we have approximately 100 existing reciprocal switching locations. We appreciate that you've given thought to such an idea. And with a few hours to think about it since yesterday, I can provide an example of a location where an existing reciprocal switching arrangement exists that would be problematic if all customers in that area had access to the same arrangement. And it's ironic that that location is a location we've heard mentioned already today, it's Decatur, Alabama. And having had a career on both, uh, uh, had, having had time on CSX, as well as my time here on NS, I've kind of seen both sides of this location and some of the challenges that are presented there. And I'll just briefly walk through how interchange, how interchange is affected and the reciprocal switching executed. Essentially, in a, a CSX's yard in Decatur is on the east side of the main line. In order to get to interchange to NS, they have to operate out of their yard north on double track, which then operates into single track before it comes to a bridge of the Tennessee River 
that both NS and CSX use. From that point, it backs down off into what we call the new yard or the old yard. And there are four tracks in that old yard to affect interchange. CSX delivers um, cars into that yard. The, each of the tracks holds about 22 cars. So when you get more than 22 cars, then you have to start filling up the next track. And S then goes and pull, delivers in tracks that are left and pulls, from C, pulls what CSX delivered and then takes it to the new yard on an S and switches it again into the actual locals that will deliver to the customer. And then the cycle repeats. When you think about the number of customers that NS has in Decatur, which is almost 30, if every customer were open to reciprocal switching coming over CSX, CSX once we filled up the old yard with interchange, we would have, we would, and it had too much for the old yard to hold it interchange, cars would begin to back up. And there are times already today where that occurs. And in fact, in 2014, when I was at CSX, we were trying to figure out how to get more throughput through the old yard in Decatur. As far as investing in it, what we determined and what we looked at was the fact that we had crossings that were gonna be blocked. We, actually, the yard is in the very east end, actually has a crossing going over all four tracks. We are in the middle of town with roads right beside us. And we are constrained by the CSX main line that's on the east side. So if you think about the actual effort to get for CSX to get to the new yard, old yard, they've got to come out, hold a main line that already operates a number of trains on it, both NSs and CSXs, mm -hmm. and then shove off, pick up, and come back out and go back to their facility at Oakworth. And on the NS side, we've got to go over to uh, get the cars from the new yard, old yard, take them to our yard, and then switch them one more time. So it is a fairly complex operation. It is a location that is very difficult to be able to take on any kind of additional work with the complexities that exist in that particular case. And so with that, I'm happy to turn it over to Dr. Israel. You know what, Cindy? While we're talking about that, while it's fresh, I'd like to ask you some questions about that, this precise point. Sure. And I, I appreciate your uh, listening to my suggestions. I wouldn't call them suggestions, they're queries. I'm really trying to explore how to uh, tackle this situation. Uh, according to my count, you actually have 105 uh, locations. For reciprocal uh, switching, correct. Where you allow reciprocal switching. I have the tariff in, in front of me and you have 16 customers in Decatur who you already permit reciprocal switching. And we you have said, about... You, yeah, you said you had 30. So I guess my first question is, how'd you decide which of the 30 you were gonna give a tariff to? I've not been able to research all the way back, but what my expectation, what I believe is this was an agreement many years ago associated with a merger and more, more than likely there was a line that was drawn that car that customers on this side of the line were open to reciprocal switch and on the other side were not for uh, economic reasons at the time. But I can't really just explain it exactly. I do know that there were an addition, there were um, CSX also opened up switching in uh, Tennessee uh, as quid pro quo for, for this arrangement. Well, I, uh, I have a few questions about it. I actually, it's interesting, uh, I hadn't expected all this focus on Decatur as much, but we did actually pick Decatur as one of our random examples. So I'd like to ask Ian to put the Google Earth photograph up of what we've shown as the Decatur, or at least part of the Decatur area. If you can scroll through, through, through that, Ian. There we are. Uh, so interestingly, we list, we showed the uh, site of Indorama, uh, because they're listed on your, um, tariff as being open, but restricted. And I think, uh, the Indorama witness, Mr. Uh, Awad explained to us what that meant. And then we just picked one of the other shippers there. That's Nucor steel. 
that is not open. So I'm wondering, and then the uh, railroad tracks, and I'm not sure if they're yours or CSX's. So you, it would be helpful to me, because as I've often said, I'm not good at abstract thinking. Could you, looking at this picture, go through again the moves that are involved with a reciprocal switch? I, um, I don't actually see the new yard or the old yard, and I don't see the CSX main line and the bridge. So I think what we're looking at these is are the all NS, These are all NS tracks, I guess, right? So this would all be the industrial complex. So yeah. what, this would, what this would show you is when we build our local out of the new yard, it would then come out and serve these different locations with an NS local only. And then the cars that we, we pulled from these facilities that had a reciprocal switch opportunity, we're, we're going back to CSX, would go backwards just the way I described, back into the new yard, switched into the tracks that would go to CSX, taken to the old yard, left there for CSX to then come out of their yard and pull them. So this is the industrial complex that you're looking at here. All right. So let me get the terminology correct. You, let's just take Indorama. You pull cars from Indorama and other shippers in this area, right? All with the same local. I would say that, that more than one would serve this complex. But yes, there would be one assigned for each or a, t a time period where they would operate through here. All right, so typically does the local picking up cars from more than one customer? Yeah, sure. All right, so let's assume there's no reciprocal switching. Okay. Where does that local take those cars? To the new yard. The new NS yard. Yep. And it, then those cars get sorted out on different tracks and they're gonna leave that yard on an NS train going to their ultimate destination. So more than likely, yeah, they, this is between Sheffield and, uh, and Birmingham. So we would switch those cars either to go east or to go west. So there's just two directions out of this yard. Is that what you're saying? On NS. On NS. Now, if, are there cases where the local is picking up cars from customers, more than one customer, and on that same local, some of them are staying with NS and some of them are going to CSX? Yep. All right, so tell me then, walk me through that again. That train still goes to your new yard. And the cars are switched into a uh, track going east on NS, west on NS, CSX. Okay. And it, uh, uh, you know, uh, there may be a couple others, but I, those are the main ones. All right, let me, you're going too fast for me. The local pulls into the yard. Some of the cars are then shifted onto a track that's going east on NS. Some are going on another track that's going west and some are going to be put on a third track, which is going to go to the so-called old yard. Correct. Which is an NS yard. Yes. All right, so at that point in time, there's no extra switches. The cars have to go on one of three tracks, right? Right, right. So now another Either a, does a CSX locomotive pick them up at the new yard or is it an NS locomotive? NS locomotive takes them to the old yard. All right. And puts them on one track, which is going to be picked up by CSX? Depends on how many cars there are. The longest track, there are four tracks and they hold 22 cars. Right. So it, if, all, if one track doesn't hold it, then you, then you put cars in the adjacent track. Got it. But they're only going to one destination, and that is to the CSX yard. As far as NS is concerned, that's correct. All right. And uh, is that the only uh, purpose that the old yard is used for? Yes. So it's not otherwise, any, whatever's going on in that old yard is not otherwise interfering with any NS movements. You're just dropping cars off there for CSX to pick up. Well, yeah, let me, let me, let me make sure the, the, the other move, the opposite move also takes place. So right. yeah, CSX okay. might have cars in those tracks 
for Norfolk Southern to pull. Right. Okay. But so that, that is the purpose of those four tracks. Right. So, so far, if a car is being reciprocally switched at CSX, before it gets to the CSX yard, there is one additional move for those cars, right? Instead of going on an NS train, they're going to the NS old yard and being picked up by CSX. Yep. And would it be fair to say that once it gets the CSX yard, whatever's going on there is not a problem for the NS network because it's out of the network. Yeah, what I, when it gets to the CSX yard, it would be switched again to whichever direct, whichever destination CSX needed to forward it to. Right, but uh, it's not an issue for the NS network. It's not slowing you up or getting in the way of any NS train. It's out of your tracks, right? Correct. Okay. Um, so just uh, to follow up on the last witness, it didn't take 64 moves to get it there. Fair enough. I'm not sure where the 64 moves came from, but I would say it does take an intermediate handling between the two of us yep. because there's an intermediate point where the cars come to rest in between right. our new yard and CSX's yard. So how much extra time does that take to move the CSX bound cars from your yard to that yard, to the old yard? So we would use, it's, it's very close in distance. We would use an existing assignment that that would be part of their work is to go and deliver cars to the old yard and is then come right? back and then do other work. They would not be all that they do. They would do other things. So that, that crew is doing, is moving anyway, is what you're saying. I'm, I'm saying that that crew would come probably serve some customers uh, and then go deliver cars would be part of its day is what it would do. Got it. So what, um, so delivering the cars to the old yard does not require an extra NS crew because that's a local that's doing out there doing other work anyway. It's just one of their stops, right? Is, is what it's incorporated in the work that they do, correct? Yeah. All right. Now, what, what is the reason from a network point of view, according to Indorama, that you will only interchange with CSX if the cars are going someplace that NS doesn't go? Does that have anything to do with the, the network? Well, as I, as I mentioned, when you look at the four tracks that we're talking about in the, new, in the old yard, there are times when there are more cars than those tracks will hold. Is that the reason that you won't allow the shipper to direct? Those are commercial terms that we worked out a deal between us and CSX years and years ago, probably predecessor uh, railroads. And I can't, I can't really comment on the origins and the thought behind those rules, but. Right. Well, um, but, that... but right now, I mean, you know, we've heard a lot of discussion about jamming up the network. Once you've delivered the cars to CSX, it doesn't really jam up your network if CSX is taking those cars to a place that NS also goes to. In fact, arguably, it takes some pressure off the NS network, doesn't Our, it? The, the challenge would be, again, as I said, is overrunning the size of the handoff between us. That right. would be a concern where we would have cars for CSX still sitting in the new yard that could not go to the old yard because there was not room. All right, uh, uh, but aside from that point, once the cars get to the CSX yard, <clears throat> there is no negative impact on the NS network if you permitted the destination of those cars on CSX to be a destination that you also serve. Right. I mean, that just seems like a simple, obvious fact. Yeah, I would. I, I couldn't disagree with that. All right. And indeed, and we heard from a prior witness today, um, diversified, that you had some capacity problems in the South. If you allowed CSX to deliver some of those cars, it would relieve your tracks who are going to that same destination from having to take those cars there, would it not? 
what what I heard was a different location, completely separate from Decatur, well, in that particular store, in that particular discussion. Yes, that's true. But conceptually, is all I'm saying. <clears throat> if CSX is going to deliver one of your customers' cars to a location uh, from this area, from Decatur, that you also serve, one of the pluses would be that it relieves some of the capacity on your lines that are going to that location because CSX is taking there on their, on their tracks. That just stands the reason, doesn't it? That's correct. But it is, just as we talked about, we were talking about the old yard. Yeah. There's also the possibility that CS, that customers move cars to us that we don't expect. I, I think it would impact the, the, the direction that you're describing. You'd have to ask CSX if it felt like that, that would impact them. Yep. But I would expect that if I didn't, I didn't have a plan for cars to come to me that, that at NS, be, but because it was something that a customer wanted to do through CSX reciprocal switching, I would have to plan for that. And that is the challenge. So yeah, the direction you you're describing, I agree with, but yep. it has another side to it. I understand that. Okay. But you, you just told us that one of the reasons that the railroads class ones need to stay in control of this situation is because you plan for the whole network. Uh, the, uh, it seems to me that you and CSX interact all day, every day. You can do some planning to account for cars that are also coming in to the old yard so that you don't get overburdened there. When CSX and, and, uh, and NS can have the conversation without it being something surprising us, it's much easier to manage. Because I have to say, and, and I really need to say this, as we sit here and work through this on a very, very you know, specific scale in a specific location, yeah. we're holding everything else constant around it. And very seldom are things constant, whether it's, as I said in my, my comments, Sometimes it's within our control, a derailment or something like that. Sometimes it's outside of our control, which is weather. So when you get, you know, and one example would be weather. So when you get into the level of detail of this move, then that move, then that move, sometimes you have externalities that absolutely affect the network as well and create some challenges with even this internal, very small scenario that we're describing here. No, yes, but that's inherent in the railroad business. You have... right. Yeah, that, uh, I wrote down the number, uh, 100, 750 interchanges. You've got to deal with those all day, every day. So there's nothing unique about this kind of interaction. It's just another interaction. Well, let me ask this question. If the board were to proceed along this line of limiting reciprocal switching eligibility to to places where that shipper is already, uh, you know, being uh, having their cars taken to a yard where you already permit reciprocal switching. And we also proceeded on the so-called case-by-case basis. If you got to a point where you had enough shippers in Decatur asking for reciprocal switching that it threatened the capacity of this old yard, which only has four tracks in it. Uh, couldn't that, wouldn't that be something uh, to take into account uh, at, by the, for the board to take into account in deciding whether there is a ne too much of a negative impact for that next reciprocal switching request? You know, I, I, I know we're working with the hypothetical concept of, of, of allowing this, which was, you know, something that you had talked about with other right. panelists last, 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 oh, yesterday. Um, you know, I, I don't know what you would take into account. Um, maybe you would. I, I, you might could answer that better than me. Well, well, Chairman Oldman, if, Chairman Oldman, if, if yeah. I could just add in, you, you did hear something concerning yesterday, which is that shippers would like to put these in place proactively so that they actually may not be shipping anything for a period of time until everybody here has secured the right. And then how are you going to control on a case-by-case -case basis the implications when all 30 of them decide that they're gonna engage in reciprocal switching? So the, the, the feature of the proposal doesn't include any requirement that you uh, commit to shipping a, a significant amount or even any amount. So well, it seems 
challenging to to just assume that you're going to be able to uh, fix things either prospectively or retroactively on a case by case basis. Listen, I'm not making any assumptions, Ray. I'm trying to figure this out. Uh, would it be fair to say, Cindy, that all 16 people who have a reciprocal switching tariff indicator, they're not using those, those switches every day, all day, are they? I, I can't, I don't know. No, I, I mean, can't, if, I can't answer I mean, that question. You have, I mean, I've read, I've read your tariff. I haven't read every line, but I've looked at it. Uh, there are hundreds and hundreds of customers who have reciprocal switching tariffs throughout your network. Can't you say, based on your experience, that not all of them are using them every day, but they hold holding them in reserve of whether they need them? I I I don't I haven't looked at it, um, Mr. Chairman. I I I'd be I'd be guessing to answer it uh, answer that question with with facts, and I, I really don't want to give you an opinion. No. Uh, if you're asking me a direct question, I, I I don't know. Right, and in response to Ray's concern. If we're trying to formulate an approach here that takes into account the capacity of the switching yards, uh, I would assume that uh, all of the legal geniuses involved in this effort on the board side and on the stakeholder side could figure out how to accomplish that. Once we could figure out the logistics that might make the system work, which is what I'm trying to explore here. Uh, would it be also fair, Cindy, to say that of the 105 places where you now have reciprocal switching, you don't have every place having only four tracks to handle cars that are going back and forth. Yeah, that would be fair to say. All right. There may be some places where there's less, to be honest yeah, with you, but, but that's true. Some more, some less. But you do have throughout your network, particularly on the east third and a half of the country, although I think it's nationwide, that you have... Uh, trains interacting with each other with the other railroads all over the place so the idea of coordinating and handing off traffic is not unique to reciprocal switching it's a constant in in your business is it not well i i, I would tell you that that planning the the annual planning and even in the uh more closer to um what you see when the annual plan changes because it always does change in terms of volume there's a tremendous amount of work that goes into figuring out and, and talking to our customers is where the basis of that conversation occurs. What should we expect in the next year? And we allocate, you know, people, re, uh, locomotives and, you know, all, uh, any number of, of, of actions that we take um, to be able to move that. And so we try to create our annual plan. We, we, we have an idea of where things are going. And what we should expect and the unexpected types of shifts are things that are very troubling. And when I say that on a network level, do we interact with each other? Yes, but we have a plan as to how we're going to interact with each other. We know well, what kind of locomotive consists to have available. That was one of the points that I made. You know, you get enough volume coming through a location that you're not really expecting. You're going to need to allocate resources to that to actually pull that, that volume. So, so it's very structured in, in how we go about it. Again, trying to make sure that we optimize the whole to the very, very best we can. Yeah, uh, I, I understand that. But, you know, the notion that somehow has been assumed by people who have talked to us over the last two days, that these reciprocal switching orders are going to drop out of the sky without any notice. That, that's not how any system is going to work. A customer who wants reciprocal switching is going to have to file an application under whatever standards we would set if we adopt a rule. You're going to have a chance to respond. There's likely to be litigation over it, and there is ample time for the railroad that's involved, both railroads, to figure out how this will or will not be integrated into the system, and it could be part of your planning. Uh, so the chairman, notion that chairman, it's all going to be surprise activity. Uh, well, I don't know where that came from. Well, I, I think it's some of what Ray just said. Once that, and, and in my testimony that I that my that I started with, once it's open, it to your point, it may not be used, and then all of a sudden it may be. Well, so I so once you chairman, uh, chairman, I didn't chairman hear. Overman. You know, I, we we've dealt with a lot of straw men in this hearing. Uh, I didn't hear any shippers say, 
here's my plan. I want to hold it in my back pocket and then I'm going to spring it on my class one. I didn't hear anybody say that. So, so um, chairman, if, if, if I could, first of all, that, that don't exist. So chairman, I, just, just real quick, um, ACC did make that point, but let me make a different point about the cases that you're going to get. And this actually is our agreement with you, what you said earlier, what you actually think once you set the standards and there's a couple of cases, that will be it. So what will, what will unequivocally happen if you change the rule and create a new uh, non-fault based system is that there may be a few cases come in that flesh out the details around it. But after you've uh, three or four cases, five cases at the most, you're gonna have created a body of precedent that the railroads are gonna have to comply with. And from your perspective, I think it's actually your goal is for the cases to disappear and the railroads to actually voluntarily comply with the standards that you've announced. And so the idea that you can, you know, you'll still, you'll still be there uh, pre uh, preventing uh, harms uh, either from an individual case or the accumulation of dozens of cases is, is just, we're concerned that that, that cannot happen. I, we, I appreciate that, that some may think you can do that, but we have concerns that once a few cases have rolled through the pike, you'll have a new set of standards the railroads will have to comply with. Uh, Ray, you actually overstated and vastly misquoted what I and others have said. What I said is that I would hope that cases don't need to be brought because the balance of bargaining will have been modified and so that railroads and shippers will work things out themselves. And what I actually think should happen, and you know, I don't usually quote him, but I quoted Hunter Harrison in my talk last fall, is that the railroads who are being requested to provide reciprocal switching will up their game. So we won't have these interchanges and movements and we'll just get better where service problems exist that will help get them resolved. Uh, uh, so I, I don't anticipate and I never urged and I'm not sure what I'm urging because this is all still in the formulation notion that somehow if we adopt a rule and there are three or four cases that you say, then thousands of shippers will overnight get reciprocal switching tariffs because the railroads will be afraid to turn them down. No one has ever suggested any scenario like that. So I, I just think we should stick with the problem that's facing us and, and not spend too much of our time shooting down straw men. Uh, Cindy, were you aware, uh, you must've been aware uh, since it seemed like it was more systemic than just one shipper, the scenario that was described by the uh, uh, by Sandra Dearden from uh, Diversified. I was not aware of uh, what she, what she described uh, until I heard her say it. Uh, did, did do you see any opening there when your people come to a shipper and basically say to them, "We don't have capacity to serve you anymore, so we're going to raise your rates." to at least give that shipper the option of, an, of a switch with, in her case, with CN 10 miles away? Well, Mr. Chairman, I'm, I've, I've looked into it from an operating side since her, since her testimony. I listened very intensely to her to understand what was happening on the operating side. And so as I understood it, she described uh, a movement from West Virginia to Birmingham on CSX interchange to NS at Birmingham and then traffic going to Hattiesburg, which then was switched at Hattiesburg to a jointly served location 10 miles outside of Hattiesburg. And talking to the operating team, I can't find that, that, that scenario with propane moving down to that location. The closest thing I can find is some ethanol moving to Nicholson, Mississippi, which would go to Meridian, be switched at Meridian, and moved on a local that goes between Meridian and Hattiesburg. So I'm still researching that as to where the issues are with capacity, but talking to the team, we, we have had challenges in the Birmingham terminal. As I told you, when we were talking about um, what our service recovery plans were, we were seeing a lot of improvement in Birmingham and that whole side of our network is much more fluid. And really I'm not aware, my local team is not aware of any customer concerns down there. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm still researching that. And for, as far as the commercial impact, I obviously have had no time to uh -huh. dive into that. But I've right. heard everything she said and very, very, very much want to understand um, what's taking place. Well, I would, uh, 
I would say this is a good example of an issue that really is best resolved between your cus the customer and you, <coughs> not in a, a public hearing. She just raised it as, as an issue, and I actually may ask one of your other witnesses about it. But uh, it seems to, you know, Sandra Dearden is not some uh, new person. She's a very experienced logistics manager, and I have no reason to doubt what the scenario she suggested to us. So I think it would be a good idea for your team to research the question and get back to her and see if you can't solve that problem. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Yeah. So uh, I, I may well have some other questions on this. Um, well, just before we remove this map from the uh, screen, other than whether you have enough space on your four tracks in your old yard here, is there any, uh, there's no operating reason that you couldn't provide reciprocal switching to new core steel, which is just one of the shippers that we picked but random here. Is there? Same local, it looks like it's gonna go right past there and probably serves them now. Well, I think that um, you, you mentioned the, the the old yard being a constraint. And I think that, you know, the fluidity of our new yard is, is much more complete when we're able to manage our own trains and cars off our own trains to serve customers. You know, not nothing against CSX, but in, anytime there's a physical infrastructure challenge that they have to get to us, you know, sometimes that's not, interchange doesn't always occur on time or to us, to them. So it's an additional handling and an additional step. And I think anytime you have that, you, you, you introduce, um, uncertainty or, or, you know, uh, challenges on the network for one of those steps not to, not to take place. But so isn't it the case that you're picking up new core cars now and taking them to your yard? It's just, as you said, they go on one of three tracks, East, West, or CSX. But on the inbound side, when they come on NS trains, they come on NS trains, get incorporated based on our schedules. And there is a compressed time frame. I think UP talked a little bit about this try to make sure that we have the trains arrive in a way that they connect quickly to the locals. And it's a little bit, little bit more um, uh, time consuming when they're not integrated into that type of planning. So yeah, it's, it, 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 the, the challenge is any kind of congestion when you get a day behind with interchange. Well, yeah, I, I'm not assuming you're gonna get a day. Why do we assume you're gonna get a day behind if you serve this other customer? The idea of, of having interchange and being able to pull it and incorporate it into the existing local that's going to serve the customer, because a local serves each individual customer. That's the difference. Well, I only wish, uh, Cindy, that NS was operating now, as you have acknowledged it is not, on a basis where that kind of delay would be a departure. So... Uh, Anyway, let's let's move on there. Uh, I didn't mean to dominate the whole afternoon here. I don't know if other board members have questions on this issue or they want us to move on with your other witnesses. What's the pleasure of the board? I do have questions, but Ray, uh, is it your expectation? First of all, sorry, you're cold and I hope you get well. Um, uh, is it your expectation that the best time to discuss uh, the fault versus no fault concept would be after the economist presentation? Yes, I'd recommend that. So I'm, I'm sorry, could you say that again? I, I wanna get into the fault versus no fault concept. Yeah, yeah, okay. I'm sorry, go ahead. I got a quick question. Cindy, how, uh, you said on those four tracks, how many, how many cars do you switch uh, now? I have not checked on what, how many go in or out presently. I have experienced, as I described, uh, over subscription to those tracks in my past. Um, and it generally, you know, the, there's, there's all kinds of inputs into whether um, customers, you know, commodity inputs, um, whether, whether these customers are able to, are needed to move traffic. It'll, you know, it'll change with it. some cases, even exchange rates. Some cases, it's, it's uh, pricing for grain or pricing for scrap. So it, it can be very seasonal and it can change. Uh, fairly rapidly, but right now, this minute, uh, member Primus, I, I don't, I don't have those numbers. Okay, so, you, so but you say at some point you you, you get full yes. capacity. 
Yeah, uh, there's more, more cars that want to swap between us than we really have room for. Okay. But, and, and, but you guys plan that operationally that even though you don't know, or it can be seasonal or cyclical, it's not every other week or every first, uh, 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 you know, week of the month. So, so you do have to plan operationally for those, uh, those variables. There, there's some that you can plan for and some you can't plan for. Okay. But, and the ones that you can't plan for, uh, you're still able to carry those out though. It depends. And, and as I described in my, in my testimony earlier, sometimes that comes with effects of other customers. As I mentioned, our assignment that goes and pulls, delivers and pulls also works other customers. If for some reason there's more work to do to make that affect that interchange, we get delayed or late going to other customers that that local is meant to serve. And that can impact um, others beyond just the ones that are engaged in the reciprocal switching through the, new, the old yard. So it, we, we constantly have to adjust when the time comes. And sometimes it's easy to do and sometimes it's not. And it takes us a few days to work out of. Okay. Um, re real quick. So and one of the things that I think gets, I think it is lost is that, you know, when, when, the idea, I guess the idea that, that Marty's talking about that I think some of us are thinking about reciprocal switching is not so much as if you know, a shipper has the right to, reciprocal, to, to do the switch. I mean, it's not like, again, they can call CSX tomorrow and say, hey, I want you to switch my cars. I mean, they have to go into negotiations as to whether or not CSX is going to do that. And if they do do that, if, they is, if there is an agreement, then they have to come back to you and, and, and work out you know, that. So I, I, you know, I, I kind of take issue when everyone sort of says that all of a sudden, you know, everyone's just going to rush to the door and say, Hey, I want to switch and we're going to grant it. And all of a sudden it just has to happen. I think everyone has to understand it. Just like you said, there, there are operational issues that even every shipper has to consider when, when making a switch uh, same way that you do. It's not something where they can just turn around and say, okay, we're going to move this car on a, on a, on a different line and, and all of a sudden snap their fingers in it. So and I think, you know, one of the things that I said yesterday and it was a frustrating thing is that, you know, for us, it's, it's going to be helpful moving forward to sort of talk about these things in a way that, you know, how we solve them moving forward. I mean, the system is such right now, again, that we're in this position and having these conversations because it's not operating the way it should. And it has been that way for a long time. I mean, again, 11 years, this has been on the books. So this is not new. And, and so these operational challenges aren't new. And so for us, it's, it's, it's going to take everybody to come together to figure this out. And you know, again, I, I know that you're resistant to it and to the ideas, but at some point, we got to have that conversation as to how we're going to get beyond the service challenges that, that we're in and, and, and get utilizing your, your assistance and, and, and the others to get it done. I mean, the big thing we heard earlier with, with the, uh, the organization that, that, uh, uh, we're talking about the 25, 25% uh, or 24% uh, tariff, you know, she's saying that it's, it's all due to capacity. And so the question is, is, you know, you guys keep telling us over and over again, I want to grow. We want to grow. We want to grow. But how do you do that? How do you do that when you're, when you're getting ready to tax somebody an initial 25% for them not to grow, for them not to move their stuff. And so it, it's, it seems, you know, you know hypocritical, hypocritical at some point to say, okay, we don't want you guys on our network because we're at capacity, but you're telling us, hey, you know, we're going to be growing. So, you know, we've, we've got to have that. I just think that we're talking, sometimes it seems like we're talking uh, 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 around each other and, and, and we've got to sort of get to that point where, you know, we got to have this understanding of how we're going to, how we're going to fix this. So, and I'll, 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 stop until we finish the rest of the uh, presentation. Yeah, I want to pick up on something. Um, Cindy, thank you very much uh, for your comments. I think what you've brought out is the fact that um, just because a switch is theoretically possible doesn't mean uh, that in the real world it can necessarily be done in real time, uh, that you need to know when trains are coming, uh, you need to know how many trains might come in a week or a month so that they can, you can work that into uh, the operations of your switching yard. 
And so when the board is asked to determine whether a switch uh, is possible, is feasible, we should take into account not only whether it is physically feasible, but what the capacity of that switching facility is to handle the number of uh, cars and volume and timing uh, that the company wants, uh, that wants the switch. I, I would agree with that. And, and you know, you have to add some contingency into that as well, because things are not always perfect. Um, and, you know, Member Primus is, you know, talking about our service levels and he's exactly right. And as we recover, and that is our, my number one focus, you know, we do need to have Slack in any system that we have in order to be able to be consistently serving our customers. And um, some of the complexity with this is that there's a lot of unknown. There's a lot of variability. Even the Canadians that you heard talk about visibility and being able to see what's coming and in, in, the, in the inner switching locations, it's not that clear. So um, that is a big part of my concern and, and, the, and the consideration that I, I hope the board will take. Yeah. Well, thank you. And we appreciate your frankness about the challenges that uh, uh, your railroad is currently uh, working hard to overcome. So with that, Chairman, can we, um, we oh, okay to move it to, uh, oh, sorry, Michelle. That's okay, just, just one question. Um, Thank you, Cindy, for, your, for, for being here today um, and, and for your, your insight um, into, into this important issue. Um, with regard to shippers who may seek a switch where there is a no-fault situation uh, with the host railroad, how would, how would you describe the competing railroad would handle that switching request, uh, especially if it's made without advance notice? Well, I think it would depend. I mean, it's a... It's a Again, there's some physical constraints. There's some resource constraints um, that would have to be taken into consideration. And then, you know, how consistent is the move going to be? I mean, you know, we, we, we heard and, you know, I talked about it in my prepared remarks around we want this just in case we have a service issue so we can quickly flip to somebody else, you know, the a competing railroad. Um, if you're the competing railroad, you know, what you don't want is to be tipped over into a similar problem from a service perspective on your line because somebody is, is, is shifting stuff unexpectedly to you. So I think the, the visibility is probably the biggest issue and concern along with the ones that I, that I previously mentioned. Thank you. I just, I just want to say one thing, Cindy. I, I don't think you, know, you, you say there it's unexpected, but I, I, you know, a switch is not to me, unless you're going to explain how it's unexpected that you that they can just pull it out of a hat without anybody knowing, you know, in order for someone to get a switch, you have to another carrier has to agree to take that. They can't just say, okay, NS, you know, come take my my stuff off of CSX's line, and you have to say, okay, you have to go in and agree to that, and and say, yes, yeah, we're willing to serve you. So it's not necessarily like, oh, this is out of thin air. And again, you'd also don't have to take it. You don't have to. You don't have to take that. You know. You know that 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 uh, that uh, those product that product that that service. You could say, well, hey, we're full, and but so it's not a matter of saying you're getting slammed and saying all of a sudden someone says I call reciprocal switch and you have to take my freight, you have to take my service. I mean, I, I have not seen that, and and if you if it's if it is in, in in any place, please remind me and please show me where that is. But I think there's enough there that it's not like we're just throwing it on people or, or this concept is throwing it at people. It's offering the opportunity to have competition and that people can respond to that, that, that option for competition, not a demand or, or even a referendum or even a requirement that you have to take someone's uh, 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 goods just because they, they're, they're awarded. You, you said it yourself that you don't know how many people are actually taking advantage of it or if they're taking advantage of it at all. So, so people have that right now, you're, the tariff right now under you, but they're not exercising it. In, in your mind and in your world, just because they had it, they would be exercising it every day, all the time. And, 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 and without you guys knowing or just, you know, just coming forward and saying it. And I, I just want to make sure that we understand it. I mean, again, if I'm, if I'm speaking wrong, you let me know that. That that you know that it, I don't see any place else where they say as soon as reciprocal switching, if it were to happen, 
that all of a sudden that everybody can just sign up and make you take their their freight. Is that is that what is that what you're reading? If a facility is open to reciprocal switching, the decision by the customer to use carrier A or carrier B is completely up to them. If there's a carrier B, I mean, the carrier, they have to go and seek if, if there is competition. If, if a carrier B does come on the scene, there's no there's no guarantee that there's going to be a carrier B unless you're telling me that there has to be. May, we have to name a carrier B. Are you saying that? What I'm saying is of the 105 locations that um, Chairman Oberman laid out, there's 105 locations. And you've asked how many customers use that opportunity for reciprocal switching. And I, I don't have the answer, but let's say it's 5%. What if 20% decided to use it tomorrow? They have it there, it's available. It's already open, it's already agreed to, it's there. They don't have an agreement. They don't have an agreement to, with, with any other shipper yet, even if it's open tomorrow. There's no agreement to ship that for, for any for another carrier. It's open. Yeah, there may be. You may be sitting there and be that in, in, in that you know receiving end of reciprocal switching from CSX. But if they open up twenty, you've got to go into negotiations with those twenty and say yes, we we'll, we'll do that. It's not like all of a sudden you're you're mandated to take all twenty. And if it is, like I said, you show me where it says that. So, but, Member no, Primus, well, um, um, if, if I could just inject it, and I, I, I think I understand your point, but just I, I, I don't think that's an accurate description of the law. Right, right. Well, right, just companies. tell, tell, Ray, tell me where it says in, in what in, so, in 16 or now that says what? that on day that, that you right. have to, you have to. If yep, any, so, let, let me, let me give it, let me try, okay? So the railroads are obligated to comply with their tariffs, period. That's an obligation. So long as that tariff is out there, they, they have to comply. So if Norfolk Southern has a, a tariff in place that offers a customer the right to switch, and you'll see every tariff is specific to the customer and the interchange partner. If they have, a, uh, they have held out a right to the customer to do that switch, they are obligated by federal law to comply with that unless they change the tariff. And but not if, CSX, only are they if, if CSX is not, yes, CSX yes. Is not obligated, CSX, absolutely, not, they are. They have a common, yes, they are. They have a common care obligation to accept interchange and deliver it to the destination. It is well, not, you, you, and I, you, and I, you and I see, you and I see that differently. I don't see well, it. Let me, let me uh, same point. see if I can cut through some of this quickly so we can, we can move on. But your relationships at any railroad, so Cindy, your relationships with your NS customers, you have existing relationships, volumes that you uh, agree to pick up uh, from any particular plant, two cars a day, 20 cars a day, uh, service Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Uh, so your local trains are servicing whatever that traffic is now. So the only question is if on a given day, a shipper decides and you seem to assume they're going to decide without discussing it with you in the first place. You know what? Tomorrow, we're going to tell NS to take the 20 cars they usually pick up from us and send them over to CSX instead of sending them out on their own line. I mean, does, does any manufacturer work that way? And do we expect people to try to play games with this? The only reason from I hear from the shipper world is that they may utilize a reciprocal switching tariff, is that if your service has fallen down, and it's hard to imagine most of your customers not talking to you about it in advance. So there'll be plenty of advanced discussion about whether the customer may have to utilize its right to reciprocal switch once they had a tariff. This isn't gonna be sprung on anybody by surprise. I don't hear any company who operates that way, everybody has to plan in advance. Plus the fact, whatever the rights are, Ray, and I think you're right to some degree of it under the common carrier obligation, in the real world, the customer is not going to spring a shipment over to the Decatur old yard until it has talked to CSX to make sure it's gonna get decent service from CSX. Otherwise it'll stick with NS. So none of this is going to happen as a mystery. And this is what I say. I think we're shooting down a, a, a straw men. The system hasn't operated that way, to my knowledge, ever. 
where it's the problems are is where the class ones have fallen down, not when shippers have decided to surprise people just for the hell of making a surprise. So let, let's move on. We've got a lot more witnesses to hear this afternoon, Robert, unless you want to follow that up with something else. All right. Ray, why don't you get back to your presentation and Ian, if you want to, you can take the map down. We may have to put it back up, but let's, let's uh, stay in the real world, folks. Uh, pleasure. So uh, if I could turn it over to uh, Dr. Mark Israel of uh, Compass Lexicon. Thanks, Ray. Can everybody hear me okay? All right, great. Um, well, Ray said we're going to go to the real world. I'm an economist, so I'll do my best to stay in the real world. Um, <laughs> the uh, and you know, there's a danger I've learned when I testify of being an economist at five o'clock in the afternoon. So I will I will do my very best to 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 overcome that. So thanks to the chairman and to the board for for having me and hearing me. Um, there's a fair amount that I want to cover, um, and I'm going to try to do it in ten minutes. So I'm going to go fast. Um, I will say most of the concepts that I'll talk about have, have the concepts have been discussed. Um, so I'll focus on what I know, which is the, how I think about the economics behind those concepts and, and some points from the data. Uh, and I'll do my best to stay substantive to you know, give you all, uh, as much information as I can moving quickly. Um, so I'm going to focus on three main points today. Um, focused on the proposal for the expanded use of reciprocal switching. Um, the first one is that the proposal could implicate a very large amount of traffic. Now, I know we've heard a fair bit about that, and I know there's discussions about how to limit it. Um, so I will move through that quickly. But I think it's worth, uh, from NS's point of view, which is where I've done the calculations, um, seeing just how much traffic we're talking about if, if it was not substantially limited. Um, second is that um, subjecting any large amount of traffic to a mandated reciprocal switching uh, system creates at least two major harms that I want to talk about. And, and what's important to me is those are really harm. I think of those and I think they are harms to competition. So I know that there's this, we, we think of reciprocal switching as injecting competition and it sort of injects synthetic competition as we've called it in a micro sense on a given movement or for a given chipper. But I think the, the harms I wanna talk about are harms to the overall competitive railroad system. Uh, and then my third point will be that you could imagine potentially thinking about whether do we have to bear those harms if there was some wide industry competitive problem that needed solving. Um, but I, the, to me, the data just doesn't support this as an industry in which competition at the broad level is not functioning. Um, let me say that I, I recognize that there may be specific cases. We've talked about specific examples here, service situations, examples of, of problems, and, and I, there's STB policies that others know better than I do to deal with those. I want to focus on whether there appears to be a broad competitive problem that warrants a broad new regulatory policy. All right, so first, um, following up on what Cindy presented, Cindy presented the map from NS's point of view about the new um, inter or the new junctions that could be affected. I just wanna give, then that was based on work that I and my team did looking at NS stations, sole serve stations that are within 30 miles of uh, a junction with another class one railroad. That, so that, this was the 30 mile rule. Um, but just to give you an idea how big that 30 mile rule could be, could be how much traffic um, that those stations the set the full set of stations that would be affected by that would be 54% of the stations at which NS originated or terminated carload traffic in 2019. So it's over 900 stations. Um, that accounts for over 54, roughly 54% of NS's car originating or terminating carload traffic. It's 40% of NS's total railway, railway operating revenue in 2019. All right, if you just restrict that to regulated commodities, that would be just over a third of NS's originating or terminating carload traffic and 26% of NS's total operating revenue. So the first takeaway is it could be an, an enormous amount of traffic. If you take 30 miles down to 25 or 20, it's still an awful lot of traffic. Now I know there's been discussions today or today and yesterday about restricting it just to places where there's currently reciprocal switching. I have not had time to rerun numbers that way. Um, I, I mean, that's something we could do. Um, I guess I would just make two points. One is that I, you know, limits like that 
certainly will help with the harms that I'm talking about. If it's going to be implemented, you know, limiting it will help both with my economic points about harms and, and I assume NS and the railroads would say with the operational issues. The one thing I worry about as an economist in any regulatory case is that if you're going to limit it, I think it's important to be clear about the limits. The issue you run into in a lot of industries is there's limits at first, but then it grows and grows and grows, and that creates kind of regulatory creep, which which can be worse for investment incentives and so on because people don't know where the where the rule will stop. But but in generally, you know, limits obviously affect those numbers I just gave you and, and would help. Um, second, my second main point is that subjecting substantial traffic to reciprocal switching creates two harms, as at least two harms to me to a well-functioning competitive market, as I said. So the first one is um, it affects, greatly affects the ability to earn a competitive return and thus to raise capital. All right, and I wanna spend a minute on that because I, I think it's important to go through the economics of why that happens. And it's not just complaints from railroads that we aren't making enough money. It's a real economic issue, All right? So I think about it as there's a delicate balance. There's a kind of a scale as I think about in a regulated industry between maintaining comp competition so that it works and maintaining a competitive return on capital so that you can raise investment money. Right, and as I'll show below, uh, that balance in the railroad industry today is the, the scale is very much in balance. The railroad industry is earning its cost of capital basically, and and not much more. In the language of economists, it's er earning zero economic profit, just enough to cover its cost of capital. Okay, and and that maintaining the ability to price differentially, maintaining the range of rates that we see in the marketplace today, that's critical to maintaining that balance. Right, so the, it's, you can, the whole distribution matters for whether the industry is earning its competitive return on capital. If you have proposals that say, you know, we're, not, we're fine with the cheaper rates, but we're just gonna chop off the top, you're gonna chop off that return on capital and push the real or industry below a competitive return. All right, so that's what, when we talk about differential pricing, it sounds very abstract, but you just mean the distribution of prices matter and you can't just chop off the top and maintain a competitive return on capital that we see today. All right, or said differently the way I think about it, if given that we are in balance today, that, that we're right at the cost of capital and I'll show numbers. If you just drop another regulatory tool that as you guys have said, has the effect of shifting some more bargaining power to shippers and imposing new regulations, those scales are gonna be out of balance. They have to be if they're in balance today. That pushes the rate of return below the cost of capital. Right. And the effect of that is not just that the railroads complain about it or that Goldman Sachs doesn't like it. The effect of that is that regular investors like you and me and pension funds say, I can earn more money at this investing my money somewhere else besides rail. And so money will stop flowing into the industry. All right. So it's not it's, it's a question of, of whether investors are, in, are incentivized to put money into the industry. If they're not, that's harmful to everyone in the industry, railroads and shippers alike. Okay, the second main point that I would make is that um, and it's, it's this whole discussion that we just were having and I'll do it quickly because you heard all the operational issues and I'm not going to tell you I know about the operational issues. I'm just going to say that the reason these operational issues from this policy bother me as an economist is because they, they impose economic externalities on the system. Right? The problem is that under mandated switching, you're letting a shipper or a shipper and another railroad that it reaches a deal with decide what to do to the NS network. So a shipper could reach a deal with CSX, but now NS has to switch with it with, with CSX. That imposes obligations and you know the railroads and you guys can decide how big they are in different cases, but it, but it affects the overall network. And the problem is that that shipper and CSX don't care by their natural interests about the broader NS network. You're, I totally agree with you that they're not gonna do it if it hurts their own service, but they're not internalizing the effects on the broader NS network. Uh, so I get worried, the, a fun, probably the most fundamental threat to well-functioning economic markets is externalities where people are not internalizing things. I worry a lot about a policy that introduces externalities by allowing shippers and other railroads through each deals that affect the NS network. All right, so finally, um, it's a few minutes to run through some numbers uh, on a chart. Um, the, uh, I don't see any reason to, to suffer these, these, those two costs, the, the, the externalities and the reduced return on capital. 
And I say that for, for several reasons. One is, as I mentioned, the, um, the data you guys have seen, so I'll go through it quickly, just points to an industry that currently is not earning excessive returns on capital. Right, there's the paper that's been put in um, by professors Murphy and Zimievsky, who, who I know well and who have done reviewed that closely, says using the STB's revenue adequacy methods, the financial performance of the railroad industry is sort of in the bottom quartile if you looked at it in the S&P 500. Right, there's the board's own revenue adequacy numbers that you guys know better than I do. I, I think the right way to summarize them is to say the railroad industry as a whole bounces above and below its cost of capital. That cost of capital tends to be nine, 10%. And the railroad industry is kind of right there. And S in particular is below in 2020, was slightly above in 2019, was below in 2018. This is really an industry that is right at its cost of capital. It's in balance right now. That's good. But if you push it down, that means it, capital will not flow into the industry. And that's a problem. Um, you know, I, I think this all happens. It's not surprising that even though we have isolated problems that surely could be addressed, that we see pretty good competitive outcomes. Because industry-wide, unlike other industries I look at as an antitrust expert, there really are a lot of options for a lot of shippers. There's sometimes rail on rail competition, there's modal competition, there's product and geographic competition. Frankly, there's the constraints that are placed on it by the STB and rate cases. Different movements have differentiating, differing ability to take advantage of competition for sure, but that's the overall distribution that I said needs to be maintained. Overall, it's an industry where competition is functioning pretty well. Uh, and one, one other way you would see that is if you look at you know, your own annual rail rate study, Right. In real terms, done well, we have prices that have basically been flat since 2012 in real terms. So again, prices for the last 10 years or so are not growing faster than inflation, if anything, have fallen. So, so I'd like to take the final minute here um, or a minute and a half to talk about one, one study that's been talked about that claims to come to a, a different point of view, which is it was, was cited by the DOT and their supply chain assessment in February. This escalation consultant study that it says that it finds something different. It finds rail rates going up dramatically and much faster than, than trucking. Um, and so I just I want to make a few comments on that study because I know shippers referred to that study yesterday as well. Um, one thing to note is even that study agrees that the real in real terms, inflation adjusted terms, rail rates have not gone up since 2012. So what we're talking about is rate increases that happened between 2002 and 2012. On those, there's been lots and lots and lots of attention. And the place I would point for what caused those would be the STB sponsored Christensen study, which focused, was sort of commissioned exactly to think about what happened in the first 10 years of the 2000s or the first several years of the 2000s, right? The key takeaway from the Christensen study to me of all the things it said is that, that those price increases were not market power, right? Christensen was very rigorous to measure it's called the learner index, the economic index of market power, and found that that went down, not up. Prices increased, but not as fast as properly measured economic marginal costs. So the price increases have been studied and found not to be an exercise of market power. Uh, and then the final point I'll make, and Ray, maybe you can put up the slide I have. Um, that escalation consultant study um, it, what it did when it, 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 it claimed to show that rail rates went up much faster than trucking rates. But the problem and the last point that I'll make is that it didn't compare apples to apples. It compared a revenue per ton mile for railroads with a BLS producer price index for truck. Those were measured in very different ways. If you just use the data that's in the, serve, in the BTS data that the, that study used and you do apples to apples, you get this picture which is that 2002 rail and truck are right on top of each other in a revenue per ton mile sense, right? So trucking, I think we all think is competitive. When you do an apples to apples comparison, you do not see rail growing faster than truck, right? So that's really the end of my substantive comments. Just to conclude, I, I don't see a reason to adopt this policy given the, the balance that the industry is in and the harms that it would create in terms of harm to cost, you know, returns on capital and externalities. Uh, I would say that if it was going to be adopted, I would encourage what you're talking about, which is to do it judiciously, just in places where there's really no competition, where I would include product and geographic competition. 
in places where performance, you know, rates of return on cat are, are far above what you see in competitive settings. I would definitely look for ways to minimize costs and externalities, some of which you're talking about. And I would encourage the use, strongly encourage the use of something like eCPR, which is, and then David Sappington is going to talk more about that, but its purpose is to let railroads compete. So the one that can do a better job could carry the business, but price things in a way that doesn't destroy the return on capital. Uh, but I won't say much more about that because I know Dr. Sappington will. That's all uh, I have. Thank, thank, you, Mark. thank you for your um, uh, uh, Chairman, uh, would you like David to finish and then ask the two economists questions or, or go ahead and ask questions of Mark? Well, I have a couple of questions while the testimony is fresh for Dr. Israel and the others may too. I want to make sure I understand your reasoning, Dr. Israel. Uh, when you say the system is in balance, I thought I heard you say earlier that the relative, uh, the, the, in terms of competition and the relative bargaining power between the stakeholders is in balance. Is, is that what you're saying? I'm saying that the industry is just almost exactly earning a competitive rate of return on capital. So there are lots of forces. No, I, I, yeah, that, that, I that's what I mean by imbalance. So that would include relative bargaining power, the effects of regulation. Just when, when I evaluate whether an industry and a market is functioning well competitively, what that means to me is, is it earning a competitive return on capital? Not, not substantially. Uh, so all right, so I just, that's what I wanted to understand because you know we hear from shippers all the time that they do not have bargaining power with railroads where they're sole served. And you're saying that your measure of saying they do have competitive bargaining power is based on an industry-wide calculation that the railroads are just earning the cost of capital? Um, I would say it's slightly differently, although that's the bottom line. All right. Different, well, different, okay. different shippers have different amounts of bargaining power. Um, and therefore, that's, that's what we mean when we say differential pricing. There are different shippers who need rail more or less. Rail needs different shippers more or less. So there, are, there are certainly are differential prices across the distribution. Yeah. The only way I know to evaluate whether that is leading to systematic market power or not, especially when you also think about the existing regulations that deal with a lot of that. When you think about that full set of forces, the only way I know to ask, is this market functioning well or not, is to ask, is it able to earn right. excess return on capital? So, all right, but that, that, that's what I wanted to get at. That is your measure for the competition aspect of the industry being in balance that they're earning just at the level of what you say is their cost of capital. I, I, I just want to make it's sure not, I understand your reasoning. That's it's, all. it's what the STB says their cost of capital is. But um, but yeah, I mean, I think if you were to ask economists, what's the definition of an industry that exercises market power or an industry that is, that is competitive is, can are the participants in the industry earning more than greater than competitive returns? Right. If, that, if we push those down there, they will not be able to attract capital from investors. I, I, I understand. I'm really just trying to get the, make sure I understand your point. And that point rests on the accuracy of both how we determine revenue adequacy and whether we got the cost of capital right based on our determinations. Correct? Uh, I mean, the specific calculation, the best we can do is use the data. I mean, Murphy yeah. and Zemieski do it two different ways. You guys do it one way. Um, so it's, it's a sort of three different meth ways I've looked at across a variety of railroads. Yeah, it says across but, those data sources would say it's around 9, 10%, right. which is around right. the cost of capital. Well, you're assuming that, first of all, that our revenue adequacy determinations are based on accurate costing and so forth. You're relying on on how we've determined whether they're re revenue adequate. Um, yeah, that certainly is the starting point. I mean, I'm that that and and the Murphy and Zimieski, which do some adjustments to see how those matter and do it for each that's railroad. Right. But yes, I mean that's and, they're the, they're the basic methods for the cost of capital calculation. Yeah, and you also know that there is debate about whether the cost of capital really is nine or ten percent, even though that's what we've been using. 
Yeah, I mean, it's not dramatically off of that, I would think, because well, Matt I, Rose I still, uh, said the other the last year was seven percent, as I recall. Seven percent would be quite low among industries. Seven percent would also be a number that NS has hit in recent years, including in 2020. So I, 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 I don't. A... Just to be clear, though, if you were to make it seven instead of eight or nine or ten then what Murphy and Zimieski would find would be maybe the railroads would move up to the second quartile instead of the first. It, it still wouldn't be an industry that is earning un, unusual profits. Well, all I'm trying to get at, uh, I'm not, I don't know what the cost of capital is, to be honest with you. I know what we've determined in our decisions based on our approach, but I also recognize that there's debate and that a lot of the numbers that are used in all these calculations, particularly the ones that rest on IRCs, have a lot of arbitrariness to them. I just want to make sure I understand the basis of your testimony. That's all. I'm not trying to quarrel with it. I'm not trying yeah, to tell you. I know the cost of capital. I just want to know what assumptions you're relying on. So yeah, I, and I, I get that. Have, I just think it's important to note that across industries like this, you see numbers like seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. So we're not going to be drastically far off. Well, you say now seven, eight, nine, ten, but in your testimony you said nine or ten. So. Right, because that, that's what's reported, right? Yeah. So I, I agree that's the number that I would use, but yeah. if it's a point or two lower, it's not going to change. It's going to move you closer to the median than what Murphy and Zimieski found, not more than that. And when you say that the case has not been made that there's a problem to be solved here, if you accept, and I'm only asking you to except hypothetically, I'm not asking you to judge whether anything we've heard today was accurate, but if you accept the reports we heard today from just Indorama and Diversified, would that strike you as a qual qualitative basis for thinking that some action is needed here to authorize some kind of reciprocal switching? Um, I don't see it as a basis to authorize reciprocal switching because reciprocal switching, my, my concern from what I've heard listening in two days even more is that reciprocal switching adds externalities and complications and threatens the return on capital. So it, it strikes me as, as, a, as probably a bad way to deal with quality issues overall. Do you, do you, what I, I think that I very much believe their testimony and think that there, there very well could be a need for, in some cases, I'm not an expert on any of those cases, but a need to dig into them and think about whether some action is required in any of them. But uh, it, my sense from my time on this is that reciprocal switching is probably a bad way to solve a quality problem. All right, well, you know, we have other rules that provide for service relief and orders for one railroad to deliver cars to another railroad. Uh, that would also be an externality, wouldn't it? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it imposes an externality. I agree with that. And therefore, I think it's important to limit that. Well, if, we're, if we were considering, for example, a reciprocal switching rule that was put in place to allow shippers who have legitimate service difficulties, like the ones that were discussed today, whether we do it under rule A or rule B, Either way, it's the same kind of externality if it shifts traffic from one railroad to the other, right? It, or it gives the shipper the option to do that. I agree that if giving a shipper an option to choose reciprocal switching creates an externality problem. So therefore, my takeaway from that would be be limited in the use of that solution. Now, it may be that there's clear harm to competition where, and what I would define that as is a railroad is in some way undermining the ability of a shipper to use the options that it does have. Well, suppose maybe you feel like you need to step in and give that shipper more options. I understand that. I'm not saying it could never be a good solution. It's just, okay. it has costs. And so I would be quite judicious in its use and, and I wouldn't want to implement it as a broad reg new regulation to an industry that seems to me to be performing well. Well, <laughs> If you sat in our chair, I'm not sure you'd have the same seeming, you'd, it would seem the same way. Uh, the, um, I mean, I can say to that that I study lots and lots and lots of industries and there are, I mean, I understand there are customer complaints. Some of, some of them in industries that are extremely competitive. I, I, I very much as an economist think those should be taken seriously, totally. I just, I just don't think a broad new regulatory policy is the right way to solve service problems.
The only other thing that struck me as I was listening to you about regula regula regulations and externalities upsetting the balance that you say is there, uh, if taken to a logical extreme, we would eliminate virtually all of our regulatory uh, activity over the last 40 years, would we not? No, I disagree with that. Because the, as I said, the regulation is a part of what's in balance now. My, my, my point would be the, the um, railroads under the oversight of the STB with the, certainly the current existing oversight of the STB being one of the, op, one of the things that causes the industry to perform the way it does, that that current setup has in tribute to the participants led to rates of return that are right where I would want them to be as well as I can tell. So I wouldn't get rid of what you've done. I certainly wouldn't get rid of deregulation or what the STB has done since. I'm just saying an, a, a costly new policy at a broad scale like this doesn't appear justified to me. Uh, do I take that as an endorsement that everything we've done up to today is fine? You don't. Have to. <laughs> just, I, I, you can take it as an endorsement that the overall system appears to be working. Uh, obviously, we could quibble about individual cases. All right, thank you. Very, very helpful, Doctor Israel. I much appreciate it. Uh, does anybody else want to ask questions now, or wait for uh, Mr. Sappington? I'll wait for uh, for Sappington. All right. Ray, you want to ask him to? Uh, okay. Uh, thank you, Mark. Uh, Professor Sappington, the, the mic is yours. Great. Thank you, Ray. And good afternoon, everyone. And my name is David Sappington, and I'm the director of the Public Policy Research Center at the University of Florida. And I appreciate the privilege of addressing the board this afternoon on behalf of Norfolk Southern Railroad. I note at the outset that I have provided the board with some slides for, for reference. And for the reasons identified by my colleagues and others, I have strong reservations about implementing forced switching in the absence of anti-competitive behavior. However, I will not discuss the drawbacks to forced switching this afternoon. Instead, I have been asked to identify the access prices that should be implemented if forced switching is imposed, despite its drawbacks. I believe these access prices should reflect the principles that have been established in the extensive economic literature on this subject which dates back to at least the 1970s. And the slides I have provided for reference identify a few of the more widely cited studies in this extensive literature. These studies conclude that there is no simple access pricing rule that is ideal in all settings. Instead, the optimal access pricing rule varies with prevailing industry conditions. And these conditions include such things as the regulator's goals, the instruments available to achieve these goals and the cost of implementing each instrument, the information available to regulators, the industry cost structure, including the magnitude of infrastructure costs, industry investment needs, the nature and extent of actual and potential industry competition and the prevailing retail rate structure. An important additional finding in this literature is that when the retail price structure does not embody monopoly rents, access prices that reflect what's called the Efficient Component Pricing Rule, or ECPR, have considerable merit. In addition to having three key attributes that I will review momentarily, ECPR is relatively simple and intuitive. ECPR states that access prices should reflect a railroad's full cost of supplying access. And this full cost is the sum of the physical cost of supplying the access and the opportunity cost of supplying the access. The opportunity cost is the contribution to infrastructure costs a railroad forfeits due to force switching. As I mentioned, access prices that reflect the ECPR have three primary attributes. First, they promote revenue adequacy. Second, they encourage the supply of high quality switching services. And third, they ensure what's called competitive neutrality, which in turn ensures industry cost minimization. I will now briefly explain each of these three attributes before concluding. Access prices that reflect the ECPR promote revenue adequacy by ensuring that the contribution formally derived from a shipper in the form of revenue 
is replaced by access revenue from the railroad that now serves the shipper because of forced switching. Access prices that reflect the ECPR also encourage the provision of high quality switching services. And they do so by limiting the financial loss a railroad incurs when forced switching permits a competitor to secure the patronage of a former shipper. The diminished financial loss encourages the, encourages the railroad to facilitate switching by providing high quality switching services. Finally, access prices that reflect the ECPR also ensure competitive neutrality by effectively leveling the playing field. And they do so by requiring that the railroad that secures a shipper's patronage must deliver the prevailing contribution to overhead. And this is the case whether the winning railroad, the one that secures the shipper's patronage, whether the winning railroad is the incumbent railroad or the competing railroad. And by leveling the playing field in this manner, the ECPR ensures that a competing railroad can profitably secure a shipper's patronage if and only if it can serve the shipper at lower cost than the incumbent railroad. And the ECPR thereby ensures that industry transport costs are minimized. So these three attributes of ECPR, its relative simplicity and prevailing industry conditions underline my conclusion that if force switching is imposed in the railroad industry despite its drawbacks, the access prices that are established should ref reflect the ECPR. And this conclusion implies that access prices should reflect the full cost of supplying access, both the physical cost and the opportunity cost. And consequently, simple cost-based access prices that do not include any contribution to overhead are insufficient. Thank you. And I'll turn things back to Dr. Atkins now. Uh, um, thank you. <laughs> uh, Dr. Chairman Norman, uh, that, that concludes our remarks. We'd be pleased to uh, answer any uh, questions that you have about our presentation or Norfolk Southern's prior comments in this proceeding. I have a couple. Uh, and I'm sure other board members will. Uh, Professor Sappington, I have been studying these um, reciprocal switching tariffs that the railroads have now. And I'm really scratching my head about how they arrive at their switching fees. I wonder if you have looked at the current switching fees that railroads are actually using when, you know, what, uh, when the shipper has decided to use a competing railroad. I'm sorry, I cannot be of any help on that issue. I don't know how they set their tariffs. It, would you assume that they set their tariffs in order to accomplish sufficient component, component pricing for the very reasons you said, otherwise they're gonna, uh, you know, the cost shifting is gonna be damaging to, to their overall financial picture of revenue adequacy? Um, the, certainly both the terms of the access prices that they pay one another for transferring the traffic, as well as the associated prices charged to the shippers will affect revenue adequacy. So, but how much they're getting of the revenues needed to ensure revenue adequacy are coming from access revenues and how much are coming from shipper charges I don't have that information for you. Well, if we are trying to figure out what the pricing should be, would it be useful for us to be looking at what they actually do in the real world among themselves? Certainly, that information could be useful to see. Um, but again, it needs to be looked at in the context of um, what revenue is coming from access revenue and what revenue is coming from charges to the, to the shippers. Because I my again, I'm not an expert on these negotiations, but my guess is what happens is the two railroads get together and allocate the traffic to the railroad that can perform the service most efficiently at lowest cost. That will achieve some cost savings by making sure that least cost supplier supplies the service. And they somehow negotiate a, um, a division of the, those gains. And then how that feeds into the um, tariffs to the shippers will depend upon the things you were talking about with Dr. Israel and turning things like um, bargaining power. Well, uh, uh, can we assume that uh, 
you know, I'm looking at NS, it has 105 locations on its network where it permits hundreds and hundreds of shippers to switch to a competing railroad uh, that they set these fees so that they will contribute to their revenue adequacy. Would that be a fair assumption on our part? I, I don't think they would enter in, into a negotiation which deliberately reduces their profit. Yes, so I think your overall assessment is correct. All right. So, but, um, Chairman Oberman, I, I would have to add that you, you can't just assume if you took that fee and applied it to all the rest of their traffic, that they would be returned. They that that would even come close to uh, replicating ECPR because yeah. ECPR is a function of the lost contribution for each movement from each origin to each destination. It will be tailored to the specific customer in question. I will also remind you that these are reciprocal arrangements, so that they're oftentimes you see this in track trade arrangements as well, where the parties will agree to a low rate because it doesn't matter. They're sort of exchanging. Uh, 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 traffic between themselves, which is not a feature of your proposal. And I believe there's, you know, well-established ICC precedent that says you need to be very careful about using these uh, reciprocal switch fees to set a fee in a particular uh, occasion where you're compelling switches, switching. All I can tell you, Ray, is I'm making no assumption at all. I'm just looking for help. Um, yep. Well, I, I, I'd ask if, if Mark Rizzo had anything else to add, add there too, because I, I believe I, I correctly stated the ECPR, but it's it's not. Uh, you know, you've got two more genuine experts in front of you than I am. No, I agree on ECPR. The point I was going to make was the reciprocal point, where not to take us too much back to telecom, but there is a good example where you have a lot of big telecom providers who exchange traffic with each other, like when you're roaming on your phone, when that's voluntary and because they exchange voluntarily, those fees will often be quite low because it's fully reciprocal. Whereas when regulators, can Canada give us an example here, step in and require that, those fees become, they get charged at a level that is designed to recover the full cost of capital. Well, so, I, I can tell you, Dr. Israel, that I have looked at these tariffs and just based on the customers that are listed there, they aren't fully reciprocal. Some of them have far more customers that they allow to switch than the ones they receive. So I, I don't know what to make of it. I'm just trying to understand. Yeah. And, and actually, I was going to direct, uh, if Cindy, and Cindy may not be the person, uh, to Cindy, um, the question of, uh, if she knows how these uh, reciprocal switching fees were set by NS uh, to accomplish the goals that uh, Professor Sappington and Dr. Israel are telling us. I don't know, Cindy, do you have any insight into the, how those fees are set? I'm, I'm not familiar with that, uh, Chairman Overman. All right, uh, that must be somebody else at NS. And, and one of the things that puzzles me greatly is that within the same yard, uh, the fees vary widely, roughly between $250 and $500. That's pretty typical around the network. Not entirely, some are higher, 800. A few places are over 1,000. But it's very common if you go through all the railroads reciprocal switching tariffs that the fees vary between $200 and $500. And I just wondered if that is a range that we could look to for some guidance. I'm not talking about automatically imposing it or if it's... So so again, Made Chairman, I, it first, it shouldn't be terribly surprising because the opportunity cost of providing access is going to differ based on the movement in question. But I, but, but, you know, what we're, the ECP is designed to—it's very simple—is you you get the lost contribution from the movement where you're doing a forced switch. So it's not that you just try to figure out what the opportunity cost, the average opportunity cost is by looking at all other parts of the network. It would be a specific customer to a specific destination. The uh, the, the, the new entrant has to compensate the incumbent for the full opportunity cost of the switch. So that's that's kind of the, 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 the core of ECPR. Mm -hmm. And it has the benefit of making sure that you don't undermine differential pricing and the ability to earn a reasonable, a, a competitive return on the investment for the, for the entire network. And that's, I, I appreciate that ECPR is not well liked by the shipper community because they view it as, kind of defeating the purpose, they'd like a simple cost-based solution, but that doesn't protect the ability to earn a competitive return. Not only as Mark Israel mentioned that point, but the AAR's economist really hammered that home with his, uh, uh, what we call, sometimes call the rat tail map, which shows that 
you know, you, you can't set the price just to recover the full cost of the bottleneck portion. You have to be cognizant of the, the full opportunity cost of, of the switch. Well, let me ask this question. Maybe Ray, you can answer it. Uh, and then I'll stop and turn it over to other board members. And some of these reciprocal switching arrangements are the result of uh, conditions imposed in merger decisions, as you well know. Are those fees set by ECP? So that, that's a great, great question, uh, um, uh, Chairman. So in a merger context, the fees that the that the ST, the STB or the ICC will impose is is designed to treat an entirely different problem. So whether it's a trackage rights fee or a reciprocal switch, it's all about maintaining the status quo. It is not about providing the full opportunity cost in the trackage rights context. It is not about providing a market-based return on trackage rights. There's an entirely different purpose. And so if you had, if a hundred of those switch fees were set through mergers, that's because they were there to maintain some sort of competitive environment. Maybe it was a hyper competitive environment. So the fees had to be really low in order to maintain the status quo. Mergers has a different purpose, but if you move from that purpose to uh, imposing a regime where, as we've talked about, there's been, you know, under a different standard with very little fault on the part of the, of the customer of the railroad, now, um, both I think legal policy, I think public policy and economic policy says you need to be thinking about the full opportunity cost to the uh, incumbent from, from, from providing that switch. All I would say is you're making a very broad assumption when you say very little fault. Uh, I, don't, uh, I don't know if, how much fault is gonna play a role here. I'm not even sure how we would define fault. Uh, but you know uh, the the thinking and the, and the requests that we have gotten from shippers are to remedy problems, uh, and the so, conditions imposed in mergers are to prevent problems. So they have a a certain uh, uh, similarity to conceptually to me. Nobody is suggesting, I don't think, that we just throw the system open to be wide open. Um, in which case you might have to have a system that makes sure that people get their return on investment. Um, one way or another, it seems to me that the reason we're even here is because the shippers have been uh, suffering from what they regard as a lack of balance, which is causing them problems largely in recent years in service, somewhat in price. But let me uh, hand it off to, uh, unless you wanted to respond to that. I was gonna, so. No, actually, I think it feeds well into a, a line of questions that Patrick was going to ask that I deferred. So why don't I uh, let him, because I think he's, he wants to ask questions around this nomenclature that we've been using about fault-based versus non-fault-based. So he, I'll, I'll defer both, to Patrick. He's both our resident economist and best lawyer. So I'm going to turn it over to Patrick. <laughs> Go ahead, Patrick. You're muted. Yeah, you that neither is true. Um, so uh, I, I want to, you know, Ray, did I hear you correctly at the outset of your presentation that you viewed 1147 as superior to the proposal? Yeah. It, and, yes. And do you think that 1147 generally is a workable framework for the board? So I'm, 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 I just, hold on a second, I'm pulling it up. Yes. And so let me, if I might, uh, Patrick, because not everybody on, might be familiar with the history that led to 1147. Uh, so if, if I could just take a second to, to yeah, I, I know you are, but let me just for everyone's benefit. So um, after in the late 1990s, after the, the board was experiencing some very serious service problems associated with, you know, uh, implementation of various mergers, Linda Morgan held hearings to ask the question of how they might be able to use some of the tools that the board has available to it to better address service problems. And one of the primary inquiries from Linda Morgan was, is this mid-tech standard and the, and the requirement of showing of competitive abuses really appropriate when there's a, 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 when there's a demonstrated inadequacy of rail service? And what I think is lost and for, or forgotten in history is the entire industry uh, coalesced around agreement that the standard was in fact inappropriate in those circumstances. And so Linda Morgan proposed 
and adopted, well, it wasn't her, it was the board, but uh, proposed and adopted a, a rule that's set forth in your, in your, in your, uh, in your regulations at, at 49 CFR 111471. Let me just read it for you, uh, which is why I think it's, it's pretty powerful. The, uh, the SDB will prescribe alternative rail service, which includes a reciprocal switch under 111.02C, if it concludes that there's been a substantial material deterioration or other demonstrated inadequacy of rail service period full stop so it's right. it's 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 not about uh, mid tech you can get it's temporary it only stays in place for as long as you need it but if if there are serious demonstrated inadequacies of rail service the s the stb has provided a well, regulation to address I, it i want to explore i want to explore this more because i think it's it's a very interesting idea um you know a couple elements of it picking up on where professor zeppington left off you agree that under 1147 the board does not consider lost profits right so and that's where it comes into the fault versus not fault based system of this so we concede if under the current system if you engage in anti-competitive conduct which is pretty egregious you're going to, the board's going to step in and force a switch. And in those circumstances, it, it really isn't uh, appropriate to be asking for the full loss contribution of, of, of the switch. And the board has said, we won't do it. The same would apply in the circumstances here where you've got some sort of demonstrated deterioration in service. I, I don't think Norfolk Southern is advocating that they get, they get to keep the full loss contribution in those circumstances because you have a fault-based system that limits its application. Now, if you flip that to what we view, I know it's nomenclature, and, and Marty, I appreciate that you haven't decided what you're going to do, but if you look at the proposal from six years ago, it looks like a no-fault-based system. So prong two, you just get it. If there's no market dominance, prong one, benefits exceed the cost. There's no showing that you, you could provide reasonable rates, reasonable service, uh, and the board, you might still be stuck with a, a four switch. In those circumstances, Patrick, I think the uh, last well, opportunity cost is appropriate. <laughs> Here's what's important, and I think about the 1147 idea, um, based on the exact same statutory subsection that we're discussing here. Um, first, Ray, as you just articulated, shippers don't like the railroad's ideas for compensation because they include lost profits. This system doesn't include lost profits. Second is, I think we've heard a lot about the complexity of having to compare um, to you know, non-competitive shippers versus competitive shippers and having to identify that and having to identify specific groups. And then we heard the additional layer of complexity in terms of rate adjusted service levels. Would it be fair to say, Ray, that under 1147, you don't need to establish those comparison groups. You just need to establish a comparison to what you had before. So, you know, PICO case is the, I guess, I don't want to call it the seminal case, it might be the one of two cases where this was actually kind of brought to fruition, um, they just talked about how many boxcars they were getting, if I recall correctly, and mm -hmm. the board did an 1147 case. Okay, so that wouldn't you agree that that greatly simplifies the service showing if you don't have to establish anything that is because of the carrier's monopoly position? That's right. So, on that, and, and, and that's what the uh, uh, STB contemplated 20 years ago when it put this in place. Now, Patrick, as you, you talked about with Mike Rosenthal and the AR, if you want something more permanent, like an energy type, uh, uh, so now you have to actually proceed through the, uh, the, the competitive access rules, which requires more than a, show, a generalized service problem, because if you have a generalized problem like Snowmageddon in 2014, right, or so, something else, the last thing you want to do is open up the whole network to reciprocal switching. Because So what it requires there is more of a tailored showing that combines the lack of service to an exercise of market power. And well, um, so, so, so that's like, that's an, a whole nother avenue. But I, I just, I, it feels like 1147 is being overlooked. And, uh, and it also, people say it, that they, yeah, no, I, I appreciate that. And, and so, so I didn't mean to, truncate your point, but I, I wanted to, um, no, absolutely. is there's also no consideration of product or geographic competition under 1147 as well, which is another thing that shippers object to. Right, right. It's, it's a temporary solution for a temporary problem. So I, I've heard a lot, like if a customer is really suffering a, a demonstrated inadequacy of rail service, the idea is they can come and, and get this, 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 this temporary relief. And, and of course, you know, 
if they come to the board and they ask for it and the other carrier is suffering uh, some sort of similar circumstances, the boy might well say it's not appropriate in, in those circumstances. But it's, it's, and it's, and it's also lightning quick. It's 45 well, and I would also, days. I want, to I want to touch on that. I'm glad you mentioned that because, and I know, Karen, uh, you have uh, another line of inquiry, but um, it's my understanding that you, the board can order service under 1147 without having to spend the time to develop compensation. Um, by that, I mean, um, I think under the PICO, yes. service can start um, and the shipper can, can, you know, as I think we all know, compensation issues can take a lot of time. First of all, there's the time of railroad negotiation, which can take months. And then if the railroad negotiate, then all of a sudden we got all the the uh, evidence that we need to consider, which I think under precedent would be, I guess, what's called the Dardanel standard in this realm, um, which is a cost base, which is, you know, variable cost O&M and some portion of the uh, uh, capital cost. Uh, and but we don't have to decide all that. The shipper can get service immediately upon an order and we can take those months to decide compensation. Do you agree with that? Kind of framework for it. Yeah. Yes. The, yeah. The the it's. I mean, I we would obviously love compensation to be decided, you know, up up front, but it it does not contemplate that. It's a, it's it's uh, it's about speed. It's about it's understanding, but it's also about you know a well, demonstrated inadequacy of rail service too. So it's not, and it needs to be substantial. It needs to be measurable. You know, it can't just be a one time off. It has to have been over you know a, a, a identified period of time. So it's not just I miss a switch. But, right. But yeah, I think well, it, does, well, it doesn't. It doesn't just have to be substantial and measurable. Actually, it could. There could actually be another demonstrated inadequacy. Right. So if the shipper yes. was always getting bad service, they could also win. Right. If they said, "Hey, listen, I've been getting one day, day a week, but uh, switch and it's missed eighty percent of the time. I can't grow my business." They could also win, even though they've always been getting that. Um, yes. And 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 Patrick, I would say that. I mean, I know this line is not landing well and not being that. This is why the railroads view this as just about rates, because uh, when this proposal was put in place six years ago, nobody was talking about service. Uh, when, you know, if you look at the rulemaking in this case, everyone's talking about compressing rates. Now, I appreciate that the concerns have changed a little bit. Marty's been very articulate. So has uh, a member Primus and so has, you know, uh, mem member Hudlin and everybody about being really concerned about service. But there are tools that the board well, put in place uh, exactly I, to address those concerns. I'll conclude by saying, you know, you've heard me the last couple of days talk about administrative complexity. And, you know, anytime there are these principles in place, you know, I do wonder whether or not shippers, it's, you know, it's tough to bring a case no matter what. And, and I, I do, there are a few elements of the 1147 rules that I think if you take a look at them, I wonder whether or not the board could do better in fleshing them out. You know, those I've looked at the 628 rules are, Quite short, and listen. There, there's there's merit to there. There are arguments in favor of of providing certainty. And there's argument in favor of doing a case by case. Um, I, I wonder whether or not there can be creative ideas around three elements. First is what are some categories of actions that could be substantial, measurable deteriorations or other demonstrated inadequacies? You know, so, you know, uh, so that. Uh, so the, that's one. Second is there's this whole notion of, well, how long is it, right? Someone to come in, especially if they're not in a good competitive situation to bring a, guess, a case against a railroad. I hear from shippers that they're not really eager to do that. Um, and so I, I wonder whether or not we could provide a little bit more certainty to people about how long it could go. Because right now, as I understand 1147, it sort of implies that it's longer than the emergency rules, which is 270-ish, I think. And, but it's until the railroad's ready. Well, what does it mean for the railroad to be ready? Right, so I wonder if we can do something better on that to provide more certainty, and then, um, you know, well, I, I I think that those would go along. And the third is, I think that the shipper has to come with an an alternative carrier in hand. And you know, this is I've heard that this sort of gets in a weird thing where you know the alternative carrier doesn't know, you know, what the fee is going to be, right? For all the reasons we've mentioned, and all, all these types of things, and doesn't know whether the shipper is going to prevail, and then the alternative carrier doesn't know whether or not there's going to be another effort by the railroad. You know what I mean? There, there, there are sorts of reasons why shippers might identify that they can't get the alternative carrier at the front end. I do wonder whether or not we can think about that or any other way to speed the proceeding because of the timing issue that I think Mr. Moreno, um, you know, articulated about, you know, hey, if someone's coming in with a service inadequacy or demonstrable deterioration, you know, they can't, people can't wait months when their plants are about to shut down 
or you know their business is falling apart. So I really think that we need to think about every, if, if it's if it's the alternative carrier problem, that's something. But if there are other ways besides definitional on and definitional and in, in time uh, uh, you could get it for. There are other ways to speed it. Creative ideas are very much welcome. So, Patrick, well, I will tell you, we'll take those all to heart. I can represent on behalf of Norfolk Southern that, you know, they're always looking for ways to improve the tools that the board has, so long as it, you know, it's a balanced approach. I think the one, the things you've articulated are, are certainly worthy of consideration. This this provision hasn't been reexamined in 20 years. Um, my impression, I wasn't there at the time. I think I was actually in law school. But uh, the, the my impression is is that there was a remarkable degree of of collaboration and agreement that 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 led to the, the this set of rules. And so I think you could probably see that happen again. I'll just like make one last point is the board has been very effective recently in using policy statements as is necessary to help guide uh, the, the party. So it might not even be necessary for you to do a big formal rulemaking. You could instead, you know, work with the stakeholders and develop a non-binding statement of of how, you know, how long might it be? You may not want a firm rule, but you may give additional guidance. What you know? What is what? What categories of action? If that might be even more effective right. than what you're proposing. And, but and I know, I know, and I know is, under. Um, and I, I don't want to take any more Karen's time, but the, uh, you know, I, I know that you did. The railroads didn't love everything about the demerge policy statement, but I think under Chairman Begman's leadership, we demonstrated that we can get that done in you know a year's time or so. And you can haven't I, seen people come back that didn't get litigated. I'll oh, go ahead, Mark. Can I say something real quick, just to support this? I mean, my focus really is on investment incentives. And one thing I like about what you guys are saying is it's a very different story for investment incentives because it says if you fix it, it's temporary, you get the business back. So you have an incentive to invest to solve the problem as opposed to a permanent solution or, or kind of a solution where if we invest in more capacity, you know, somebody else could end up using it. So I, I like the story for the investment incentives that it creates. I appreciate it. Thank you guys both. Patrick, were you done? I'm good for now. Yeah, Karen. I uh, actually, Patrick's dialogue answered my question. <laughs> I wanted to. Uh, I had a follow up to the discussion you were having, Ray, with Patrick. I um, I uh, am con concerned about this idea that this whole area of reciprocal switching can have nothing to do with rates. The statute talks about competition and I don't know how you can separate cost from the product if you're talking about competition. So it may be that it isn't the wisest policy, I'm not agreeing or disagreeing, to suggest that the rule should be used solely for rates, but to suggest that rates and product are not inter, inherently interrelated when you're talking about the concept of competition. I don't know how you can get there. And it leads me to wanna to ask you to go back to the example from Diversified that we heard earlier today. How would you characterize that under 1147 if the railroad, as it did, comes to the shipper and says, we don't have the capacity to provide service for all of our customers on this line so we're going to raise the rates high enough to deter some customers from using us at all. Is that a service problem or a rate problem? So uh, I'm not sure I view it as a problem, but I appreciate that you would. it would be something you'd want to look into. But it's definitely a rate related, right? So it's not uh, s s service in terms of they're getting poor service. It's a you have constrained capacity. Uh, supply and demand in any market will tr will try to adjust to send signals so that people make responsible decisions about how much they use that particular resource, whether it's rail or fuel, you know, gas prices or whatever. You you try to send signals into the market so that uh, the, the 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 users of that scarce commodity appropriately make appropriate decisions about how much they're going to use it. That's to me. I mean, this is just terminology, Chairman. That's not demarketing. That's what markets do. And the alternative would be permits. So if, if it could only handle so much traffic, do you really want the railroads picking winners and losers and saying, we're going to put permits in place that says you can ship for 20 and you can ship uh, you know, less? So, so, so I think the, the idea of letting prices adjust based on capacity is something you should actually be promoting, not, not discouraging. But however, you, you made a different point earlier too, which is, 
well, what if they could get a switch to another carrier and get get through the congestion in an alternative way, right? I think I think that was a point that you were emphasizing. And I just, I wanna come back to the existing set of rules. So if you look at the energy case, if somebody, is, if, 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 a, if a railroad is abusing its market power to deprive a, uh, a customer of a more, fit, more efficient alternative route, that can be grounds for a reciprocal switch under your current mid-tech standards. So I don't think you need to change the standards. Uh, and, 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 and I think the railroads likely know that if, if you can get there, if they've got a congestion problem, what they're looking to do is get some of it off that congestion. They'll switch it off with another, with another railroad. That's it. They, they have every incentive to do that. Well, the problem with their response, Ray, is that you're talking about a situation which is not the one that was presented to us, as I understand it. The uh, Norfolk Southern route didn't suddenly become subject to an increase in demand, nor did the route itself lose capacity. Norfolk Southern, as well as most of the other class one's employment practices rendered it unable to have enough crews to provide the service it had been providing. Now, that seems to me to have little to do with competition and more to do with a, what we don't have to get off on in this, uh, in this hearing, uh, the, the impact of Wall Street. So, um, you know, it's not a congestion problem. And uh, there, whether it's, and I don't know that it's an, an anti-competitive problem, but, and I would say it's a problem. You said you don't want to concede it's a problem and you've got a client, so I'm not asking you to concede it. But I heard it as a problem <laughs> of a shipper, a longtime shipper, who all of a sudden had a 24.5% rate increase. And candidly, to Norfolk Southern's credit, they said, you know, we don't have enough crews to serve everybody, so we got to price some people out of the market. That's what we heard. Now, uh, so I, I is just that a, is that I, a price Norman, problem? I, my, my question to you is under 1147. Let's assume those are the facts that they're proven for hypothetically. Is that an 1147 problem, or is that just a rate no. problem? That's, if 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 that if you believe that rate is unreasonably high, then you bring a rate case and you get it suppressed back down. So that, or if you think. Um, that rate is, is, it has not been, even I'm sorry, so I, just, I was going to say. Well, even if the railroad admits that the reason for the rate is because it's unable to provide the service, that's the problem uh, it, it's, with it's, this discussion. So if, if they, if they actually refuse to provide the service, then that would be grounds for, for a, a, a switch. So if somebody said, you know, we still want service and, 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 and nobody took up the offer and everyone stayed on the traffic. You, that might be if they can show a demonstrated inadequacy of service. Yes, but it's not a rate uh, remedy. If they are disappointed with the rates, they have to bring a rate case and, and show market dominance, show it's in excess of 180 percent. All the all the safeguards Congress has put in place have to be uh, uh, reviewed to make sure that they're entitled to relief from the rate. Right. Well, <laughs> You know, I think we're going around in circles here. You're presenting a hypothetical that isn't going to happen. Presumably, Norfolk Southern is going to continue raising the prices until it pushes enough people off of the system that it has, that its limited crews can, can provide service. They're not oh, foolish so enough to come in and say, we're going to stop serving you altogether. Uh, but that seems to me a distortion in the system. And it may, I suppose, become anti-competitive if, in fact, they're so served and they won't give them a switch, then they... Right then the tactic becomes abusive. And it seems to me, if we accept at face value what this witness said, it becomes abusive without that rate exceeding what a person might win in a rate case, uh, arguably. Uh, could become an unreasonable practice, I suppose, under 10702, I think it is. Uh, although you would probably be the first to come in and argue that you can't challenge a rate as an unreasonable practice. Uh, I, I probably so would be, yes. I think this is not so simply analyzed is all I'm suggesting based on what we hear is going on. And, and I don't mean to single out Norfolk Southern. There are crew shortages greatly undermining service and carloads and so forth all over the network, as far as I can tell. And we hear a lot about it. Uh, Karen has her hand up. 
I want to go back to uh, the discussion that Dr. Israel had about access fees. And the thing that is bothering me is that in the context of the service deficiencies network wide and affecting all railroads, uh, that seems to be uh, motivating the shippers to ask for this rule. Uh, why should, under those circumstances, uh, the, the railroad seeking the switch be required to pay opportunity costs, uh, and particularly in a situation where the railroad is trying to ration customers by raising its rates. Uh, that just sounds, maybe I'm just describing, you know, market abuse, but um, I, you know, this is where, where they're seeking a switch because of service uh, or because they don't want to pay for the service at outrageous rates. I don't understand why the access fee should include compensation for opportunity costs. I think that was directed at me, although others might want to weigh in. Um, I mean, the fundamental reason I want to, that I think it needs to include opportunity costs is because we need to preserve the ability to earn a return on capital, which is just but, happening now. Dr. Israel, if I could jump in, I apologize for interrupting you. No, go ahead. Um, but I think what the scenario that um, Karen is describing is it, if there was fault. Um, and so yeah. I'm sure that under like say 1147, and I'm not sure the position is if there's fault, there should be opportunity costs. I think- I, yeah, so I agree with that. I mean, you were probably getting there, and if I if I cut you no, off, I agree with that. So let me take it in part. If there's fault, if there's a harm to competition, if there's clear fault, then somebody subverted competition. They shouldn't. They've now harmed competition. They shouldn't get an opportunity cost benefit for that. We, we want to restore competition so that this this synthetic competition other economists talks about because makes sense because that's the only option we have to try to restore competition. If we're not in that world though, then. We have, to, this is what Ray said, we have rate cases, we have a set of rate laws to control unreasonable rates. And as I said, those have led us to a position where the return on capital seems reasonable. I, I, what I've heard in this that was informative to me, because I hadn't thought about it much, was let's suppose that we want to, to, now we're saying there's fault law, there's rate cases, but now we've got a service problem. It's not a fault service problem, it's just a service problem, and we want to deal with it in some other way. My view is reciprocal switching is a bad way because it imposes service issues of its own, but if you implement it, ECPR works in that case, right? Because you're not trying to suppress the rate with ECPR. You're trying to make sure you preserve the return on capital. But the two railroads are free to go compete on service quality. And if one of them can provide better service quality, they can win that business, even though they have to pay an ECPR price. And I just want to make an, another observation on, on this, though, which is why I think the 1147 framework merits consideration by shippers, which is, you know, I heard Dr. Israel, you described, well, if there's fault, a harm to competition. 47, you don't have to compare competitively situated shippers versus non-competitively. Remember, we were hearing from the, the railroads yesterday, yesterday about how, well, you know, if a, even if a shipper is getting bad service, you have to prove that that service is somehow worse than the competitively situated shippers. That, and that's evidence of anti-competitive conduct. Under 1147, that shipper doesn't have to prove that. They just have to prove that it's worse than they had substantially measurably, or it's inadequate for some other reason, which could include comparison to competitive shippers, but it doesn't necessarily have to. And there's nothing in the text of the preamble, or certainly obviously nothing in the text of the regulation that would suggest that. So even though what Dr. Israel is describing about fault-based harm to competition, I would actually say that 1147 sort of straddles somewhere in the middle and maybe actually closer to something that's more favorable to shippers. Not to say that shippers would agree that it's better than the proposal for them. I'm just saying why I think it perhaps merits consideration because the compensation issue has already been worked out seemingly in their favor, which is not to include opportunity costs. Yeah, it seems to me the statute there that I don't, oh, there's no up better, but it's saying if just inadequate service is being provided and proven that doesn't sort of meet the standards of real service, that's comp the competitive system to me as an economist has failed there. And the other thing that I think I liked what Ray said is if it's a system-wide problem, so everybody is suffering, then this obviously wouldn't be a solution, right? So it deals with the, the idea that it, there, there, if there's a system-wide problem, that shouldn't be 
that shouldn't lead to a you know punishment or whatever on one carrier. I appreciate that. Thank and, you, uh, Member Hudlin. If, if, well, if I could come uh, back to you, just I just want to have, go ahead. Oh, Rick. I'm sorry. Go I just ahead. wanted one last thing. Um, so I just want to emphasize too that that a particular example where you think the rate might be too high. And there should be a forum for the customer to bring that kind of dispute to a quick and uh, resolution. And I just would encourage, I know you weren't there when we, when we submitted the proposal, we'd love a chance to come in and, and talk about it on an ex party basis if that's appropriate, but there's this voluntary arbitration proposal that the, has been submitted and it's, it's designed exactly to quickly resolve that type of commercial dispute and it's in front of a neutral arbitrator. So if the railroads can't convince the arbitrator that that's a reasonable rate that they've just that they've imposed the arbitrator will put a, an alternative in place the, the the railroad and the customer will be able to return doing what they should be doing right which is working collaboratively to build business i really feel like that arbitrary uh, voluntary arbitration process has a lot of merit that might it, it might address might prevent that type of activity from happening if you thought it was inappropriate but more importantly gives a quick forum for somebody to resolve that dispute. One more question on it. You know, I, I have been thinking quite a bit about the coalition association's comment about timing um, and we want a workable system. And one of the things that occurs to me in the design of 1147, Ray, I think as you know, it was issued with 1146. And um, I believe, and, and 1146 is the emergency process. But I mean, you look at that process, and, and what the, the minimum amount of time is, you know, weeks, you know, a month or so, right? And so, you know, I don't really regard a process that takes that long, especially when you only get 270 days, is really suitable for an emergency. And I think out of um, Chairman Begaman's uh, regulatory reform task force, there were ideas that shippers brought to bear about reforming the emergency service rules. And that standard is very, very similar if not the you know as the um, 1147 standard, but it's much it's truncated in time. I sort of my question to you is raising the 1147 idea is whether or not NS would also see merit to reforming simultaneously reforming the emergency service rules to provide an even quicker, much more temporary avenue of relief to mitigate Mr. Moreno's I think interesting point about timing. Sure. So I will start by saying, I mean, there's only so so fast an agency can be expected to deliver relief to anybody. It's it's there 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 just is delay. There are certain due process rights that the railroads you have to respect to the railroads. And I just would make this point, Patrick, is you can't sacrifice speed uh, or sacrifice like accuracy and making sure you don't cause problems in favor of speed. So I'm sure Norfolk Southern would be happy to sit down and 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 collaborate on other reforms. But, you, you know, these emergency service orders, they can cause more harm than they do good. And so it's important that you at least have enough time to understand what it is you're being asked to do. Um, uh, so, and so, like, you know, doing things too quickly, I, 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 would, I would be worried. I know it's a balance and I know everyone wants relief instantaneously. I would just ask you to think about the fact that you have to have enough information, enough time to, to, to think about it, enough time for the railroads to present it but it still can be done quickly. And as I said, 45 days is, is, is blistering fast for uh, a relief, which, you know, as you mentioned, is not limited to that time frame. It could, it, it's limited until the railroad can demonstrate that they've got their act together and they can, and they can, they, they've solved the service. And to be fair, and when I talk about 1146, I'm also building in time to, you know, I think in my head, I'm building in time to draft the actual complaint and then also for the board to issue a decision. And that's how you get the time. And it's, it's very difficult. Yes, I, I get it emergency when you build in those two things plus reply and rebuttal and that sort of thing. I hear you though on 1147, it is pretty quick for something that doesn't have, it can be seen as very quick for something that doesn't have um, a, an end date, right? If, you know, if a railroad just hasn't shown the board that it's, it's capable of providing good service, it could go on indefinitely really, um, under at least under the regs. Um, but I would still note, I mentioned the alternative carrier, I would still note um, any other barriers and that and that um, CFR, if there are creative ideas, along with de defining the the service degradation component as well as the uh, what a railroad needs to show, I think both all three of those are uh, uh, worthy of exploration. Understood, uh, Chairman Oberman. Uh, you know what? I'm, I'm the hour is late, and I think we've uh, pursued this pretty thoroughly. This aspect of it, very interesting discussion. 
Um, so are you, is your team done on behalf of uh, Norfolk? We are, we are done. Um, thank you, Chairman. We appreciate the opportunity to present our views. Thanks All right. Very much. So it is now 625. Uh, we've got a lot of people to cover. Do we think we can do this rapidly? Does anybody on the board need a break? I think that one of my... Court reporter needs a break. Oh, good idea. Why don't we take a 10 minute break and, and while we're out there, we'll try to figure out what we're gonna, how we're gonna finish this off. Um, so it is six, so we will reconvene at uh, 6.35. Karen, Karen, you'll want to mute yourself.
All right, good evening. We are back in session. And uh, can everybody uh, hear me? Uh, I want, so I want to uh, make just a brief announcement about how we're gonna proceed here. We are going to have a hard stop at 7.30 Eastern, which if the board members don't ask any questions, uh, will allow both CN and CSX just about their allotted time. Uh, I am going to encourage all the witnesses to a, not repeat things that are in your written submissions, and B, if there are subjects which have already been pretty thoroughly covered by the other railroads, to perhaps uh, limit yourselves. I do not want to cut anybody off, but I'm giving sort of a suggestion. If we really can't finish, we would, if, if we can, and the Zoom operator is available, we'll reconvene tomorrow morning briefly but nobody really wants to do that. So we're gonna to try to make this happen by 7.30. Uh, without any further delay then, uh, Canadian National, you are up. Uh, there are Thank you. five witnesses. Matt, you're the person. Yeah. Yeah, th thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I just need a couple of seconds. Uh, I appreciate what you just said. We, we will keep to that schedule. One thing I will say up front is that CN is committed to you know, doing ex parte meetings with the board about this so that hopefully the board won't lose the opportunity to ask any questions it has. Uh, and with that, I will hand things over to, to Mr. Riley. All right, thank you. All right, uh, good evening now. I was gonna say good afternoon, but I'll say good evening. Good evening, Chairman Oberman uh, and board members. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today. My name is Rob Riley, and I have held the position of Executive Vice President and Chief Operating Officer at CN since June of 2019. In that role, I'm responsible for CN's operations in Canada and the U.S. with responsibility for the company's transportation, engineering, mechanical network operations, and safety functions. I previously served for 30 years in a variety of roles with the Atchison, Topeka, and the Santa Fe and BNSF Railways, including Vice President in Operations, and began my railroading career in 1989. Here to explain why CN is concerned about the potential impact of 2016 forced access proposal on CN's operations in the US. In addition, some commenters have asserted that such forced access could be implemented without negative consequences for operations and network fluidity in the US because Canada has regulated inner switching. I would like to address that misperception as well. First, let me start with the many ways we foster resilient railroad network and support the overall supply chain. CN railroaders work each and every day to provide safe and reliable service for our customers. A critical part of my job at CN is managing our daily operations, including recovery efforts from unexpected disasters that strike our network and disrupt our operations. When disaster strikes, our employees work tirelessly to limit the effects on those disruptions when they occur and restore rail transportation for our customers. Most recently in November and December of 2021, CN railroaders showed resilience to recover from catastrophic rains in British Columbia. The torrential storms caused significant highway track and bridge washouts from the combined impact of snow melt and precipitation runoff. CN worked around the clock to return our tracks to service, restoring more than 50 outages that had portions of our main line out of service for approximately three weeks between November 13th and December 4th. And we added a permanent bridge on January 12th. This was followed by extreme cold temperatures in Western Canada for more than 80% of the days from the end of December to February 25th. Such temperatures triggered what we call tier two operating freight rail operating restrictions, which apply when the temperature drops to minus 24 and colder, oftentimes dealing with temperatures that reach the minus 40 degree range. Our recovery from these incidents is a testament to the grit of CN railroaders. And over the past two years during the pandemic, while others worked remotely, our railroaders showed up each and every day to keep the supply chains moving in North America. CN makes significant investments to meet customer, customer demand and for growth. Burnt will discuss some of those investments in more detail and discuss the 2016 forced access proposal, how it could disincentivize future investments. 
Those investments are in addition to CN's hiring new employees in the U.S. This year alone, we'll hire a couple hundred conductors, mechanical and engineering employees to help support our operation. I particularly wanted to share some of the investments CN has made to grow our intermodal service offerings. CN moves both international containers moving through the ports in the U.S. at New Orleans and Mobile, Alabama, and in Canada, as well as domestic containers that take long haul trucks off the highways. Intermodal traffic is time sensitive and our intermodal customers in particular are looking for fast, reliable, efficient transit times and cycles to return containers. It is understandable why intermodal customers, including UPS and Hub Group have opposed the 2016 forced access proposal. CN has invested to support our intermodal customers and our customers have responded. From 2010 to 2020, CN developed the fastest growing intermodal network in North America. CN added intermodal capacity in Chicago, Detroit, and Memphis to accommodate growing customer demand. We have invested approximately $60 million in facility upgrades and equipment over the past couple of years at Detroit, Chicago, and Memphis alone. CN's effort to grow intermodal traffic has prepared CN to help alleviate supply chain congestion. This is especially important during the supply chain crisis over the last two years, as ocean shipping and port congestion has reduced shipping capacity as vessels have been waiting to dock and unload. CN has added intermodal offerings designed to help our customers during the current supply chain disruption of the last two years. And as an example, CN started a new priority intermodal train service between the Port of Prince Rupert and Chicago. This is a weekly service and it has reduced average transit time from Shanghai to Chicago from approximately 13 days to 17 days. Another supply chain disruption is the increased amount of time containers have awaited pickup by beneficial cargo owners at inland terminals. The numbers tell a story. In 2020, 4% of containers in CN Terminal in Chicago sat for seven plus days awaiting pickup, while 20% of the containers sat for more than seven days awaiting pickup in 2021. CN has also taken concrete steps to help alleviate supply chain congestion. CN moved a fully grounded international container operation to increase terminal capacity in Chicago and Memphis. CN offered the use of CNTL owned chassis to provide additional capacity for last mile delivery if available and customers had constrained truck capacity. CN leased additional offsite storage locations in Chicago in addition to its existing offsite storage locations in Chicago and Memphis. CN has incentivized beneficial cargo owners to pick up their containers. We introduced over the past couple of years for international containers to be picked up during off peak hours in Chicago, Detroit, and Memphis. CN has also incentivized customers to pick up containers during long weekends. CN's efforts had helped reduce congestion in the supply chain, as well as take trucks off the highway. For example, both CN and CSX worked together to take thousands of trucks off the highway and moves between the ports in New York, New Jersey, and Philadelphia and Eastern Canada. Now a few comments on the 2016 force switching proposal. I understand that under the 2016 force switching proposal, new switches of traffic, which currently move in single line service, could be required between railroads in response to complaints filed with the STB and that the shipper would no longer have to show an abuse of market power. From an operating perspective, requiring a railroad to perform a new force switch with another railroad raises numerous potential adverse effects. Adding an interchange would typically add between one to two days of transit time as compared to single line service where, the current, where there's currently not an interchange. More problematic, however, those four switch locations could be inconsistent with CN service design. Our service design department carefully plans our operations and takes account numerous factors, including train schedules, whether manifest unit, intermodal or automotive, crew change locations, locomotive power plans, car fleet, cycle times, balancing car fleet and locomotives, siding locations for train meets on our mostly single track network in the United States and yard facilities with available capacity to process the cars. Given these realities, adding new four switches will tend to increase transit time and dwell on the handoff between the railroads. This will tend to increase cycle times for equipment as cars go offline, and we would have little visibility into the return of those cars from offline. 
This in turn will require more cars and locomotives to move product, which could increase congestion on the freight rail network and further deteriorate fluidity. Additionally, force switching would reduce our ability to anticipate traffic flows, which is particularly challenging when considering network planning. Effective planning is key to our ability to provide a reliable service product to our customers and forecasts of anticipated demand are key to planning. Force switching reduces visibility of what is coming onto our system or leaving our system and the locations where that may occur as shippers seek board ordered forced access. Force switching could require CN to hand over traffic at locations that are not designed for such operations and that are not the most efficient location for a, for a handoff to occur. And the force switch traffic could appear on CN's network without visibility that would hinder the ability for advanced planning and dedication of appropriate resources. While the shipper who is seeking the force switch from the board may believe it is benefited by the force switch, that force switch could harm the rail network as a whole and all customers that depend on the network. The 2016 force switch proposal could have a significant impact on CN's network in the United States. AAR estimated in 2013 that there are as many as 1,500 interchange locations in the U.S. potentially impacted by the 2016 proposal. AAR's map yesterday showed U.S. junctions potentially affected under the 2016 proposal, assuming a 30-mile distance threshold. CN's network could experience adverse operating impact of force switching across our entire network if the board adopts the 2016 proposal. This is why CN is concerned about the proposal. The proposal could create new forced access and the accompanying operational challenges associated with it. Increased switching will lead to reduced efficiency overall and will hinder our ability to plan and execute on our plans. That has impacts on the network operations and as Byrne will discuss, this, this discourages the incentive for CN to invest in the parts of our US network that could be implicated by force switching proposal. Finally, on the can Canadian regulated inner switching, Matt Warren will describe Canadian regulated inner switching and I will offer an operational perspective. I'm only addressing regulated inner switching, not long haul inner switching, which has not been used since it was added in 2019. First, there are differences in the size and scope of the networks in Canada and the United States. The US rail system connects and crosses in large urban areas and secondary locations with many interchange points and as many as 15 interchange locations, according to AAR, that could be potentially impacted by the 2016 proposal. By contrast, the Canadian rail system is much more linear. Because inner switching has been part of the Canadian statute for more than a century, the Canadian rail networks and shippers have developed over decades against the backdrop of where regulated inner switching could occur. This is in addition to the differences in geography, population density, rail infrastructure, traffic mix, and makeup. Second, inner switching in Canada can lead to or exacerbate operating issues. And those operating issues have required CN to impose embargoes at interchanges in Canada for congestion. Both CN and CP referred in their comments to the winter of 2018 when Vancouver experienced significant congestion related challenges. CN experienced an increase in rail cars online during a time in winter when capacity was reduced for same safe operations due to cold temperatures. At our Thornton Yard near Vancouver, CN experienced an 18% increase in the number of cars carried by CN for inner switching with BNSF. To manage the congestion and operational challenges with the cars coming online suddenly, CN deployed 18% more locomotives and 16% more crew as compared to the prior year. Even with these measures in place, CN had to embargo traffic due to the congestion. Based on our experience in Canada, it is impossible to predict the type of operational challenges that could result from new regulated force switching under the 2016 proposal. In conclusion, our ability to plan and manage depends on having information about expected traffic flows. But as I have discussed, that is a real problem when it comes to the 2016 proposal. Force switching would add complexity and slower transit times, which will ultimately make it harder to offer competitive service compared to truck. And with that, I will pass it on to Bernd. Bernd. Thank you very much, Rob. Good evening. Uh, my name is Bernd Bayer. I'm the treasurer at CN Rail. 
and I'm pleased to have the opportunity to address the board today. An area of debate within this proceeding is the potential impact of the 2016 force switching proposal on railroads investment incentives. I'm here to explain the importance of CN investments to drive service and growth and my perspective, <clears throat> excuse me, that the 2016 proposal would tend to decrease incentives to invest in CN's network in the areas that could be exposed to forced access. I will also share my perspective on the importance of market-based access rates if the board changes its regulation to remove the requirement for a shipper seeking forced access to show a railroad's abuse of market power. CN's recent experience underscores the importance of continuous investment. I was last in Washington when I testified in person before the board on December 12, 2019 at the revenue um, adequacy hearing, and a lot has, has changed in our lives and at the railroads since that time. Unprecedented uncertainty occurred from the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, which was just in its beginning at the time. Little did we know that volumes would drop precipitously in 2020 in a matter of weeks as customers closed their facilities and went into lockdown in the USA, Canada, and around the globe. Uh, Rob Riley gave examples of other, cha other changes challenges in the last year that have confronted CN in recovering from wildfires, hurricanes, and floods. In addition to persevering through these shocks, Rob also shared some of the ways in which CN has helped our customers through pandemic disruptions because CN is a supply chain enabler. The past two years illustrate the need to encourage continued private investment in the network for growth. As the board knows, unlike many other transportation modes, a freight railroads in the United States like CN, builds, maintains, and expands its private network at its own cost. Because of the capital intensive nature of the freight uh, railroad industry, it is especially important that investments are expected to derive a proper return. Building and maintaining such a private network is expensive and requires continuous capital investment to sustain service to rail customers and compete with alternative transportation modes such as trucking companies that utilize a federally funded highway system as their network. CN invests significantly in maintaining and growing our approximately 18.9 thousand mile network in the United States and Canada. Our ability to make smart long-term investments in our network to help our customers grow is vital to our ability to provide good service for our customers. CN invests substantial amounts in its network each year and needs to be able to earn a reasonable return on that investment. CN had record investment levels in recent years in its network. In 2022, CN plans to invest approximately 17% of its revenues in its capital programs. Even though, or even though we forecast uh, a 35% reduction in the grain crop in Canada this year. CN's planned investments in 2022 follows multiple years of record investments in our network. CN invested approximately 2.9 billion, and that's Canadian, in our capital program in 2021, 2.9 billion in 2020, 3.9 billion in 2019, with more than 40% of that in the United States, 3.5 billion in 2018, and 2.7 billion in 2017. CN's investments maintain and rebuild our existing network, increase capacity, improve flu fluidity, increase asset utilization, reduce car cycles, and build, build resiliency. CN's investments are good for safety and good for rail customers. CN's concern about the 2016 proposal stems, stems from its potential for adverse impact on strategic growth investments. Four switches in the United States would increase uncertainty about future returns from investments in areas potentially subject to force switching. AAR, AAR's witnesses yesterday showed a map of the junction points that may be used by, uh, by potentially affected traffic within a 30 mile radius of an interchange. That maps include dozens of locations on our network, including in Illinois, Wisconsin, Michigan, Minnesota, Iowa, Tennessee, Louisiana, Mississippi, and Alabama. Such proposal make it, will make it more difficult for particular proposed projects to meet CN's criteria for future investment. This is especially true for projects that benefit a particular region, a specific commodity or customer facility. If CN could be ordered to hand traffic to a competing railroad 
without any showing of anti-competitive conduct, CN's investment in our infrastructure could be used for the benefit of a competing railroad who would reap the benefit of CN's investment without having to risk its own capital. A look uh, at an example of CN's investment in our United States network illustrates the challenge. CN is the sole direct railroad provider for frac sand mines on its rail lines in Wisconsin. And CN heavily invested in this network to provide rail service to those mines. CN reconstructed long inactive track at its Barron subdivision and rehabilitated other track on its Whitehall subdivision to accommodate CN rail service from Wisconsin to Western Canada for frac sand producers to meet uh, projected uh, customer demand. The frac sand market, however, has encountered structural challenges from shale oil volatility and decisions by frac sand users to source sand locally, contributing to unforeseen risks and lessen the value of CN's previous investment. Turning to how CN makes its investment decision, first let me remind the board that CN has a duty to its owners. And we must keep that duty in mind when making decisions about capital. It's important that we allocate wisely and fund projects that we expect to create value. Shareholders would not accept a company that invests in projects that don't meet their minimum risk-adjusted uh, return requirements. In other words, our expected return needs to be greater than the cost of capital. When considering specific projects, we very carefully assess expected returns, so the most likely outcome, as well as the risk of achieving that outcome. In assessing expected returns, we have to consider traffic forecast, and it can be difficult to predict, to predict future resulting traffic flows, especially given the operating challenges Bob described, Rob described. And we consider factors that could lead to uncertainty regarding expected returns, including the availability of regulated inter-switching in Canada. And conversely, we would look at factors that could mitigate uncertainty, such as contractual provisions stipulating minimum volume commitments from our customers. All else being equal, an investment with higher risk needs to generate a higher return. For example, the frac sand investment in Wisconsin I mentioned involved a branch line transporting only a single commodity. That investment required a higher return compared to an investment in a high density main line, which carries a variety of commodities and thereby diversifies risk. But the 2016 forced access proposal would inject new risk into these decisions. It will increase the risk that we will lose the long haul movement as a result of regulatory intervention, which will raise the bar in terms of required returns. It will also introduce more variability around expected returns, which could also lead to particular projects not meeting hurdle rates. Ultimately, it will make it harder for certain investments to be justifiable. Some suggested that forced switching will necessarily increase investment because competition always spurs investment. Frankly, this proposition doesn't account for the realities that CN faces when making decisions and is counterintuitive to the investment decisions made in the industry. Whether in the US or Canada, we would not make an investment if there is a significant risk that the additional traffic we would expect to move as a result of the investment would benefit a competing railroad. Let me conclude with a comment on the cost-based compensation proposals, which we believe are not appropriate for force switching. As previously mentioned, in CN's experience in Canada, when a railroad knows that a customer can seek to force a cost-based regulated interswitch, it is more difficult to justify infrastructure investment in the network within the regulated interswitching zone. Rob Riley described the adverse impacts to transit time and network fluidity of such force switching that harms the broader net rail network and customers that rely on it, which would tend to make rail less competitive vis-a-vis -vis truck, especially for time-sensitive shipments, such as those by intermodal customers. This is why, from CN's perspective, should the board decide to proceed here, the market-based rate must be a critical feature of any compensation for force switching that is not premised on an abuse of market power by a railroad. Thank you. And with that, I'll turn it over to Andreas. Thank you. Uh, let me uh, let me just inter interject here in the interest of watching the clock. There's only two minutes left on CN's time that was asked for. Uh, I see that CSX only has one witness. 
we are 30 minutes away from our hard stop. So Ray and Matt, I don't know if you are, want to work this out and let CN use up some of CSX's time. Uh, we really would like to avoid coming back tomorrow, but I don't want to take up any more time saying that. Perhaps you two guys can talk about it. Uh, we, 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 we have been texting back and forth, Mr. Chairman. I, I think CN can wrap up very quickly and okay. in, in five minutes. Okay, very good. Thank you. Thank you. So in the interest of time, I will defer to uh, Catherine and Matt. However, um, we did submit a written material and a presentation that uh, provides an overview of what's happened with uh, mobile competition and the state of uh, the state of freight uh, transportation in the U.S. That, that kind of indicates the degree to which um, there is a lot of competition going on um, pretty much across the board. And it's definitely part of the, it should be part of the consideration when you're looking at uh, the reciprocal switching. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, I, I mean, I, we did submit these exhibits in the record and, and it might be most efficient if, if we could simply enter that into the record and you know, obviously make, make Mr. Apley available for an ex party meeting if the board has questions about his, his analysis. I think that's fine and, and we have it in writing and uh, the staff and the board members can review it you know, in a timely fashion. Thank you. Okay, I, and I, I'm going to apologize in advance for, for speaking quickly uh, in, in light of the late hour. Um, just th three points that I wanted to make in response to what we've heard over the last um, couple of days. Um, first, it, it has been somewhat surprising to me as somebody who's been involved with this you know, proceeding from, from the beginning over the last 11 years to hear so much emphasis in the last couple of days on the idea that the force switching proposal might be a really good way to deal with recent service problems on certain class one railroads. Um, I don't think there's anything in the record that supports the idea that force switching could make service better on a network wide basis. That was not, that was not a purpose of the rule that was listed in the 2016 NPRM. Um, there's obviously been a lot in the record about service, but it's been largely from railroads and others who are concerned about the rule saying that you know, we think that doing things that add additional, you know, you know, add additional actions to the system, add additional switches in the system are going to have service effects and responses from proponents of the rule saying it's not going to be that bad. You know, as Mr. Moreno put yesterday, the railroads are being apocalyptic about this. You don't have any reliable evidence out there that you know, a force switching regime in which essentially shippers are gonna have the ability in many instances to second guess a railroad's operating decisions is something that could make um, service better for everybody. It, it is certainly true and I'm not gonna repeat, um, I think was a very useful colloquy between member Fuchs and Mr. Atkins about 1147. And the board already has developed regulations that are specifically targeted to situations where a shipper has specific service problems and believes that you know, reciprocal switching would be, a, would be a good alternative to fix those service problems. So, so I, I think that that's something the board really needs to look at. And it's not really been something that's been discussed in the 7-Eleven record, because I think until very recently, this has not been a proceeding that's been focused on ways to, to improve rail service. Uh, the second thing that I'd like to point out, just you know, well, one quick correction, um, Indorama um, testified earlier, uh, Indorama is a valued CN customer. However, they're a CN customer only in Montreal. So I think the record indicated that they might be a class one railroad that Indorama was having issues with, but uh, CN doesn't serve Indorama in the United States. I'd also like to uh, just quickly respond to the presentation that Professor Nolan made. Um, you know, I, you know, as I understand it, you know, Professor Nolan presented, a, he, has, he presented a regression analysis based on data that I think he indicated was actually done by one of his students. Uh, and the idea was to show that extended inner switching had a beneficial uh, effect on grain car cycle times. And, and the way this was done was to take a period of time uh, when extended inner switching was in effect and then compare it to the, the period of time you know, after extended inner, inner switching expired. Uh, the one thing I'd like to point out is that you know, the only way such a comparison works is if the two time periods you're comparing are actually comparable. And here we know that's not the case because the cutoff point was September 2017. And if you go back and look at the record 
And if, if you're if you listen to CN's podcast, CN has a Grain Insights podcast that it co communicates to its grain customers. And if you listen to those podcasts from late 2017, it'll tell you that there were actually a number of service challenges that CN experienced at that time. There were multiple derailments on one day in Alberta um, due to high winds knocking trains off the tracks. There was a, there were mudslides in October. There, you know, there, there's there and and at the same time there was a 20% year over year increase in grain demand. So you're not, if you're not comparing apples to apples, that the comparison is not gonna be very meaningful. So I, you know, I know I'm going very quickly. Um, I, I think the last thing I'd say is that I do think that a lot of the policy goals that the board has expressed in this hearing and expressed recently are really good and valuable. Uh, you get you know, encouraging railroads to, get, railroads to compete better with trucks and get trucks off the road is, is good and valuable. Um, but that's not something that is going to be served well by this by this force switching proposal. And so I so I and you know it's not really anything that was uh, from the beginning you know a purpose of this rule. So I think as the board is is looking for ways to encourage railroads to be able to compete better for business that's currently moving by trucks, the way to do that is by is to encourage railroads to make the network more efficient, uh, not not less efficient. And and, and with that, um, I will turn it over to Kathy for some final remarks. Thank you so much, Matt. Good evening, and thank you so much to the board. I'm Kathy Ganey. I'm CN's Deputy General Counsel. I've been with CN for five years. Thank you to you and your staff for your time this week at the hearing and for bringing stakeholders together to engage on these important questions. CN is pleased to participate and offer our perspective. And I had just a few things that I wanted to mention before we close out. First, in light of the discussion over the last two days regarding the extent of competition in the rail industry, CN recommends that the board would update its competition study. During the hearing, we've heard questions regarding the extent of competition in the rail industry, including the extent to which the number of sole served rail customers in the United States has changed over time. I can tell you that CN competes vigorously for customers against rail, truck, and water alternatives on our network but we understand the importance of empirical evidence. A little over a decade ago, the board commissioned an independent study to look at the state of competition in the rail industry. And in both the initial report in 2008 and its update in 2010, the study did not find any evidence of widespread abuse of market power by the railroads. It appears that there may be questions about whether things have changed since 2010. To the extent there are such questions, CN encourages the board to seek the answer through updated analysis and not anecdotal evidence. CN therefore respectfully suggests that the board consider updating its competition studies. Second, CN encourages the board to finalize the voluntary alternative dispute resolution proposal. CN is a strong proponent of alternative methods of dispute resolution. The level of freight rates and whether they are too high is another reason that has been given to encourage the board to expand the availability of forced reciprocal switching under the 2016 proposal. Finalizing the voluntary ADR proposal would address any concerns about rates directly rather than indirectly through a forced access regime that could lead to unintended consequences such as network deteriorating network fluidity and decreasing incentives to invest. Finally, in light of the testimony over the last two days, CN would agrees with the suggestion that stakeholders should explore whether there is an alternative to the 2016 proposal that could avoid the adverse consequences of that proposal. CN appreciates Union Pacific's invitation for a conversation and the suggestion from others at the hearing regarding topics for additional dialogue. CN today shared examples of the potential harms to the rail network and its customers who rely on it, that could result from the adoption of the 2016 rule as proposed. CN was proud to work with stakeholders in the voluntary alternative dispute resolution process. And CN would be interested in participating in such stakeholder conversations that could include larger and smaller railroads, shippers and shipper associations. From CN's perspective, the goal of such a conversation would be to collaborate to address the concerns that prompted the 2016 proposal while avoiding its negative consequences for network operations and investment incentives. We support the proposal that stakeholder groups could collaborate to try to find common ground. We welcome your questions in this abbreviated time period. And I wanted to just mention as well, in light of the conversation that member Fuchs and Ray Atkins had earlier that CN of course would be happy to engage in any efforts to flesh out examples of service challenges under 49 CFR 1147. And so with that CN panel is concluded.
Thank you, uh, Kathy. Uh, very concise. Uh, I'm going to assume that members have no questions, but maybe we should check. Does anybody have a question? All right. Why don't we move on to CSX and then Ray, if you and Sean finish before 7.30, there might be time for a few questions, but if not, we'll proceed. We'll do our best. All right. You're on. Great, uh, Sean thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you today. Uh, my name's Sean Pelkey and I'm CSX's CFO. I've been here in the finance department since 2005, and what I want to do today is take you inside the business to help you better understand the motivations behind our financial decisions and underscore how reciprocal switching could dramatically impact the incentives that are currently working to help drive our commitment to growth. CSX has previously explained to the board why it believes the STB's proposal would reduce incentives for future capital investments, but shipper interests are arguing just the opposite. Let me assure you that regardless of the outcome, CSX will continue to invest appropriately to maintain the safety and reliability of our network. However, using practical examples, I wanna make sure you fully understand CSX's commitment to growth and how the proposed regulatory changes would work against that goal by creating disincentives to invest and grow the business. I wanna start first by focusing on the opportunities to grow the freight rail business. My slide is not advancing. There we go. Uh, the dashed gray line here represents growth in the US economy since 1990. And as you can see by the blue line, the solid blue line, rail merchandise volumes have been relatively flat over that time period, heavily impacted by the Great Recession in 08 and 09. During that time, CSX been, has been competing with Norfolk Southern and other railroads in the East fiercely, trading share back and forth as market forces work to encourage competition. Meanwhile, as the gold line illustrates, the industry has successfully converted a significant amount of freight from truck to intermodal, far outpacing GDP. Despite this growth of intermodal business in the rail industry and in aggregate, trucks continue to move far more business, far more freight than the railroads. While we greatly appreciate our truck partners and we work with them daily, I think all of us can agree that the public would be better served with fewer, not more trucks on our highways. As you may know, rail is three to four times more fuel efficient than truck, and CSX has been an industry leader, say, helping our customers avoid 11 million tons of CO2 emissions just last year. That's a great stat, but we need to step back and think about what's possible. The table on the left shows that trucks haul over 1 trillion ton miles of freight for shipments over 500 miles. Imagine all of that moved via rail. It would result in tens of millions of truckloads off the highway each year. It would result in a savings of 5.6 billion gallons of fuel or 62 million tons of CO2 emissions. That's a billion trees. The board's reciprocal switching proposal will distract us from our ultimate goal, a goal it seems the board shares, which is to expand rail share of the freight transportation by, pie. So why haven't we been able to close the gap and already win more share from truck? If we go back to 2005 when I joined CSX, we've made incredible improvements in safety, service, and efficiency. We're more reliable, and we've been able to invest more in the business. You may not know that that has not always been the case. In fact, we had no free cash flow when I joined the company. We could barely cover the cost of much lower capital investment. CSX is in a much different place today. While we're a regulated industry, we're also a public company. Our investors measure our performance versus the cost of capital, as you know. For most of the last 100 years, railroad returns on capital were far below the cost of capital. And the only way to fix that is to grow profitably or to drive efficiency gains. Generally speaking, companies don't pour more growth capital on when their returns are low. They begin by getting rid of lower return segments and driving efficiency gains across the rest. And in our industry, safety and service are prerequisites for growth. So for most of the last few decades, CSX focused on reducing excess capacity, rationalizing underutilized track, and driving efficiency gains. During this time, our combined merchandise and intermodal volumes were largely flat, but we've now set the stage and we're fully focused on growing the business. We're changing the narrative. In the face of supply chain challenges that emerged in the second half of last year, CSX responded 
We accelerated investments, added overflow container yards, transloading sites, and we worked with Eastern ports to utilize inland rail yards and reduce congestion. We're also winning new business development projects. The green dots, we can advance the slide. The green dots here represent 92 projects put in service in 2021 and over $100 million of annual revenue opportunity. There's five locations on the map you see there uh, where we've announced large industrial development projects recently that will drive future growth to rail. These will create nearly 20,000 jobs and a common theme across many of these opportunities is sustainability. These locations are prime examples of customers working with us and making long-term investments to locate on rail. Their evidence our strategy is to capitalize on the efficiency and reliability of our service to move more freight. And while actions are clearly more important than words, the narrative I'm outlining is one we're also emphasizing over and over with our investors. All these quotes are from our CEO, Jim Foote. And as you can see, he's made it clear that our goal is to move more freight. The railroads have been criticized over the last few years for an overemphasis on lowering the operating ratio. And while the OR is a good proxy to measure efficiency, it should be abundantly clear that we're not interested in shrinking the business just to minimize our operating ratio. If there's one central message I'd like the members to take away today, it's that CSX is focused on growth. And we're putting our money where our mouth is. When we began to implement scheduled railroading, our long-term bonus was based on operating ratio and return on assets. Strategy was control costs, take waste out, and improve asset utilization. But as we've evolved, our CSX and the, with the support of the board of directors has helped sharpen our focus to growth. Our executive compensation has changed, removing OR from the equation, and instead rewarding growth both in operating income and cash earnings. They, these measures incentivize profitable top line gains and investments that exceed the cost of capital. This signals a dramatic change in, in, uh, th from the company that CSX has entered into a pro-growth phase. And as a company, we're all aligned. Last year, we acquired Quality Carriers, the country's leading liquid chemical bulk trucking company. We're working to convert over-the-road chemicals freight to rail, driving environmental benefits, taking trucks off the highway, and allowing drivers to get home to their families. We're also seeking board approval to acquire Pan Am Railroad, which is a dramatic shift from the decades of rail line rationalization. As you've already heard, that acquisition is fundamentally all about investment and growth. We're also adding resources, having hired 1,500 conductors in the last 15, 14 months, in addition to about 1,000 hires across maintenance of way, intermodal, customer service, mechanical, and other functions. We're investing more in growth capital and a total of $2 billion of capital spending this year, including siding extensions, cutting edge Howard Street tunnel renovation in Baltimore, investments in advanced technology and capital for industrial and customer development projects. And as you've just heard, we've aligned our pay incentives to this strategy. Turning to the reciprocal switch proposal, I'm very concerned that despite the best of intentions, it would force us to turn in a completely different direction. If there's a second takeaway, it's the risk that this proposal would discourage precisely the kind of growth investments that benefit all stakeholders, including shippers and carriers. And so to dive further into this question of incentives, I wanna use a simple example that's quite common for us in our quest to win share. As you know, we evaluate projects looking at their rate of return versus the cost of capital. And if the return's attractive, we invest. I'm gonna illustrate a hypothetical industrial development initiative that's typical of those we evaluate regularly. In this example, you'll see not only how CSX has significantly improved profitability levels, support and encourage future investment, but also how the board's proposal on reciprocal switching, if adopted, would disrupt those incentives. So the premise is this. A shipper is interested in service from CSX and would like to convert its business to rail. The shipper is willing to make some investments, but has asked CSX to commit $10 million towards upgrades that will enable us to serve their location. In exchange, the customer is willing to commit to 3,000 carloads per year at a rate of 2,500 per carload. The business is guaranteed for the three years, and let's assume the customer is willing to pay the shortfall if for some reason they fall below 3,000 carloads. Did we lose the slides? Apologies. So 
I'll keep going. Um, basically, what it's going to result in is seven and a half million dollars of revenue across the first three years. And if this proposal came to us in 2016, um, when our transit times were slower, we would assume that a typical operating ratio on the move would be about 75%. That's $2 million of operating income and a little over a million dollars in cash flow. Three years times 1.4 million isn't enough to recover a $10 million investment. So, uh, but we're building, building this new infrastructure and making the investment with the expectation that we should be able to retain the business. Since we'll have exclusive rail access and the customer will also have made investments, we'd anticipate a strong chance of renewing the contract. Let's assume a 75% probability. In the right-hand column, you can see that using the same revenue and operating ratio, but probability weighting the cash flow, the expected value is about a million dollars per year in after-tax cash flows. That results in a 3% rate of return, and there's no way we'd be able to make this investment. But if we change just one variable in this scenario, the outcome is quite different. Our operations today are significantly more efficient. We have reduced handlings, which results in less dwell and faster tran transit times. We've also improved reliability and efficiency gains. And so the rate we charge the customer doesn't change. The volume doesn't change. The probability we renew the contract doesn't change. The only difference is that our cost structure is lower and the operating ratio is now 60%. This results in more operating income and cash flow and a 14% expected return. CSX can now make the investment with the customer to drive growth to the railroad and away from the highways. And let me go to the next slide and use the exact same example. The fundamental parameters of the investment decision are the same. Customers asking for $10 million and is generating $7.5 million a year in revenue. The operating ratio is still 60% in the first three years and the resulting financials are the same. But let's assume this location now meets the criteria for reciprocal switch. The assumptions we'd make beyond the initial three-year contract would change significantly. As you've heard over the course of the last few days, we all agree that mandated reciprocal switching is likely to result in lower rates. For some, it may be the primary focus. And as a result, it could also result in CSX becoming the short haul switch carrier starting in year four. As we approach the analysis, rather than assuming a 75% probability we retain the business with the same level of profitability, we'd now have to take into account the probability that rates would go down or that we'd be relegated to the short haul. We'd still assume a 75% chance this business stays on rail rather than truck. And since we have confidence in our ability to serve the customer, let's assume we'd put a 50% probability on retaining the business at lower rates and just a 25% probability that we lose the business to another carrier through reciprocal switching. Lower rates mean less profit. Ignoring the negative impacts of inefficient movements on our business, let's assume for simplicity that the costs don't change. Since the rate is reduced, the operating ratio goes up and the operating income goes down. If we end up being the switch carrier, the rate is much lower and we have fewer miles to spread our fixed costs, resulting in an even higher operating ratio and much lower operating income. If we probability weight these outcomes, the return is only 5%, which is below the cost of capital. And even with our improved efficiency and profitability, we would not be able to make this investment. There's been a lot of rhetoric over the last two days, but what I just walked through is how we at the railroad actually make capital budgeting decisions. Leaving the rhetoric aside, I can tell you very simply that the board's proposal, if adopted, will impact the math we do when exploring investment opportunities that support growth. The more uncertainty there is, the more difficult it is to justify growth investments. The board has a choice. It can have a broad vision, promoting genuine competition, particularly allowing us to take trucks off the nation's highways with all the public benefits that follow. It can do this by creating a regulatory environment that protects the right to the long haul and a lawful amount of differential pricing while encouraging growth investments. Or the board can have a narrow view of competition, forcing synthetic competition through reciprocal switching, compressing railroad rates and returns, meaning it would be more difficult to increase overall market share and we'd expect the current rail piece of the pie to keep shrinking. Attempting to solve the current service issues at the railroads through a permanent reciprocal switching proposal is a dangerous solution to a temporary problem we're working vigorously to solve. The proposal injects uncertainty and operational complexity 
And it's going to cause us to be very hesitant to invest for growth across the network. Market-based incentives driving investment decisions are in place and they're working. We're adding new customer locations, expanding our network, investing in advanced technology and thinking innovatively. We're excited for what the future holds and I want to express my appreciation for the opportunity to appear today and tell our story. Sean, I congratulate you on your conciseness. I tried. Well done. Um, Chairman, Thank you. Chairman Oman, I have like two minutes worth of events. I think I can be done by 7.30. Go for it. So, um, so it's, been, it's been a long day and my voice is not holding up well, so I'm just going to hit the highlights and call it a day. Um, CSX is respectfully asking the board to abandon the six-year-old proposal and instead focus on two other alternatives that have a much higher prospect of delivering meaningful relief. And the, the, the reasons are pretty succinct. The first is this proposal would restructure the freight rail industry and it could have serious economic consequences. I appreciate the whether it would or not is, a, is an area of debate, but you've certainly heard a lot of testimony to that point. Second, uh, respectfully, we, 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 we have concerns about your ability to control the potential impacts of that proposal through a case-by-case -case adjudication. The third reason is the, the proposal is, is fairly incomplete. Uh, and it's not just minor details, but rather really massive major issues, such as the lack of any serious access pricing proposal that makes it virtually impossible to assess the, the, the impact on the industry. And there's another example, too, I'd like to mention, because nobody has in two days, which is amazing. Um, the statute actually contemplates labor protection for employees who lose their jobs as a result of a forced switch. But there's no indication of how that will be done. Is it New York dock type protections? Does it happen only when the STB orders relief? Or what if a carrier voluntarily agrees to force switch because they believe they're required to by law? None of those issues are being addressed in the 2016 proposal. Um, the, th the fourth reason, and this one I really just defer to our, our papers, but we obviously have raised some questions regarding the, leg leg the legality and your legal authority. I would just emphasize that co federal courts have become increasingly skeptical of uh, attempts by regulators to take obscure provisions of law and radically transform their industry whether it's EPA's failed effort to regulate greenhouse gas or FDA's failed effort to regulate cigarettes, the courts demand more evidence, the more profound the change. Um, the, but let me turn to the last reason, which is really, it gets to the heart of uh, CSX's concern, which is we really feel there are better ways to address rates and service. For rates, you've got a voluntary arbitration process that uh, is innovative, and we think uh, uh, offers an opportunity for customers and railroads to resolve their disputes, disputes quickly, confidentially, and uh, succinctly. And then, of course, we've talked about Section 1147 as an alternative path to resolving service issues. And I actually think it's encouraging. Uh, Patrick and I were talking about some issues previously, but I just remind the board that four years ago in 2017, you actually pro you 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 were, you asked uh, stakeholders to 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 get together and talk to your staff about how those could be improved. I know CSX participated in that. In the docket, you have favorable letters from people like ACC and the Fertilizer Institute saying that this was a really uh, useful uh, path for you to pursue. And I think there's a lot of material that your staff gathered that you could mine to improve that process. But in the very end of the day. We really don't think you should gamble with the American Freight Rail Network with such a, a flawed 2006 proposal that offers no analysis of how this change will impact investment decisions, operating fluidity, and differential pricing. You have all shared your vision and desire to encourage growth, to encourage capital investments, to encourage more jobs, and to encourage trucks being taken off the highways. Those are outstanding goals for this agency. But we are concerned the 2016 proposal would drive the industry in the opposite direction. And we think this is why a broad coalition of stakeholders have, ur have urged caution from over 120 members of Congress to important intermodal customers, to regional passenger companies, and to railroad labor. So again, on behalf of CSX, we are, we're, we're pleased to be the last speakers. We appreciate the time and your patience and your willingness to go till 730. And we'd ask, we'd answer any questions in the... Uh, 10 seconds we have allotted left. Thank you very much, Chairman Oberman. Ray, thank you. Very excellent presentation. Uh, do, uh, is it the uh, pleasure of the board that we should adjourn this hearing? Or does anybody think we need to come back tomorrow for questions? Because we are at the 731 actually.
I don't hear any board member disagreeing with the idea that we should declare these, the public hearing aspect of this procedure concluded. Obviously there is going to be an opportunity for ex parte communications. Uh, it won't be uh, unlimited. As I said at the beginning, it is my intent to move forward on this proposal one way or the other or some modification thereof and act on it. So uh, without uh, any indication of what that will be, because I have no idea, uh, this meeting, is, this public hearing aspect is adjourned. And I, I do wanna, by the way, thank everybody for their participation and the hard work they put in to, to address us. I don't wanna overlook that. And of course, staff, IT people did a fantastic job. So thank you all. And, and Marty, uh, and, and special records oh. there, Carmen Smith, uh, our uh, fabulous court reporter, and, and thanks to yeah. CSX, and CSX for testifying into the night. Yep. All right, everybody. Be well. Take care. Ray, take a lozenge. And uh, we'll see you all soon. Great job, Marty. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.